That's this camera here. Okay, I'm just going to set, set the other one up and then I'll come and look at it. I'm waiting for him to turn the lights down so that I can white balance it. Oh, okay. Well, we could not be... You should see...
beautiful up there. Gosh, I've got to go back and get her. And <laughs> so you can get there and hop on the train. So it's not. Last year, this whole morning dragged on, and everybody was like chomping at the bit to start hacking. Yeah, I know, that's what I figured. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you all for coming. We're actually going to be uh, just starting in just a second. Let me just ask you all to thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Caprio, uh, I'm with uh, Startup Bus. And my name is Alice, I'm with the New York Technology Council. And we'd like to welcome you to our fourth annual uh, Space Apps NYC Hackathon and inaugural conference and festival. Uh, so you all know we're, we're running a bit late, uh, so we're gonna forego some of the uh, talk about us being the organizers and all that stuff. We're gonna immediately go to Deborah Diaz and Ellen Stofan, the chief technology officer and chief scientist of NASA. Uh, unfortunately, Ellen has to leave. Uh, so we're going to let them do their uh, kind of opening ribbon-cutting remarks first, and then we will continue from there. Back to you. I'm going to start with Ellen first, since okay. she's our colleague that does have to leave. So I'm Ellen Stofan. I'm the chief scientist of NASA. I'm actually a planetary scientist. I study volcanoes around the solar system. But as chief scientist of NASA, I get to sort of dabble in all the cool science that we do at NASA, from uh, all the work that we do with our six astronauts every day up on the International Space Station, learning about the effects of microgravity on human health. It turns out a lot of the things that happen to you up there, bone density loss, muscle wasting, are things that happen to us as we age here on Earth. So that when we're developing uh, ways for the astronauts to mitigate those effects, we're actually learning things that can help us here on Earth. We have our own study of our favorite planet, the Earth. Um, obviously, the Earth is changing. Climate change is a huge concern for the future. So how can we take all that NASA data that we gather? We have 19 satellites right now in orbit around the Earth, measuring everything we can measure, trying to document what's happening on our changing planet. Huge amounts of data, all publicly available on the Internet. We're on a journey to Mars, that work we're doing on the International Space Station to get astronauts ready to go to Mars. Uh, we're developing a new rocket called the Space Launch System. We need all kinds of technology to figure out from how do we 3D print new parts for a mission to Mars, how do we get the robotic tools we need to go to Mars, all these things we're doing. Okay, all those things I just talked about, we're just NASA. We're working with all the space agencies of the world, but even that, frankly, I don't think is good enough. And that's why we're here this weekend, and that's why we're so excited to be here. We're so grateful for Microsoft hosting us here today because we need to harness the power of everybody to help NASA. We need you all to become, for this weekend, our, our people, our, our citizen science, our crowdsource to take our data and get it into the hands of everybody. Make our data more useful. Help us on the journey to Mars. Help us utilize uh, what the astronauts are doing to help people here on Earth. Help us figure out cool things, like how would we use lava tubes maybe to have astronauts live on Mars to protect them from the radiation that comes into the surface on Mars? How can we take our Earth science data and help do clean water mapping or help do crop alerts to make our data more useful for farmers? It's time to take that NASA data out of the hands of the scientific community, and I'm a scientist, so I'm saying this with all good intentions, out of the hands of the scientific community and put that data in the hands of everybody for the betterment of people here on Earth. So everything that you guys are doing here today, which we really call citizen science, how do we take everybody and get them involved in what they do and help us move together, not just as the US, but as we know from our 136 cities around the globe participating today, how do we harness the power of the whole globe to help move us forward? And you guys are a critical part of that. We're stronger together than we are individually, and we need everybody on board, and I'm so glad no offense, guys, but I'm so glad to see so many women here today because if we don't harness, <laughs> if we don't harness the power of everybody, how are we going to get people down onto the surface of Mars? How are we going to solve climate change? How are we going to tackle these really tough problems that we have in front of us if only 50% of the population is helping? So anyway, I'm so glad to hear you all get, you see you guys here today. You're going to do great things this weekend, and we're going to come out of this with some amazing new apps. So thank you. And I'm 
sorry, I have to run. So thank you so much, Ellen. And now we're going to ask one of our astronauts, Katie Coleman. We're going to do a little swapping of places. <laughs> So thank you so much. I'm thrilled and would like to welcome all of you to our International Space Apps Challenge 2015. Since 2012, Space Apps has become the world's largest hackathon, engaging thousands of citizens around the globe, working with NASA in designing innovative solutions to challenges across the globe to work using our open source data. We've grown from 25 locations in our first year to over 136 global locations. Woohoo! That's huge. That's huge. And we have over 10,000 participants and another 1,000 virtual. So just imagine across the entire globe, this activity is going on for the next 76 hours. So during that period, uh, people will create new solutions to address a broad range of 35 challenges, such as designing wearable technologies for astronauts building our own drones, turning many of NASA's breathtaking imagery into art, or mapping clean water. There's a wide variety of activities that you can work on. Over the, those 35 challenges are aligned along uh, NASA's mission, and those themes are Earth, outer space, humans, and robotics. The challenges will tap the creativity of people from around the world to solve problems together. NASA is thrilled to have global teams of technologists, scientists, designers, different genders, entrepreneurs, designers. It, everybody is welcome to participate. Um, in years past, we've had a number of families participate as well, a lot of youth activities at many of the locations. Um, uh, this year, we've actually created a women in data boot camp that happened yesterday. Uh, and that was to lower the barrier of entry to newcomers to the hackathon experience. And many of them are in the audience today. <coughs> After the Space Apps Weekend, we'll debut a new program to help support women in the data science field. It's going to be called Data Not Core. And I look forward to providing more information about this program over the next few weeks. We have some new products developed with the hackathon community in mind. Uh, we've really tried to improve uh, what's been done in the, the prior three years. We've provided 16,000 new data sets and over 40 APIs. This helps developers avoid large downloads in varying API formats. The APIs increase the discoverability and the searchability. We heard you loud and clear last year that you needed a developer's toolkit and are now providing API management of developer keys, rate limiting, and caching, and it's now all available through data.nasa.gov. We have a number of very talented folks here in New York for questions, and we also have uh, expertise that we can develop through a Google Hangout or online. Uh, and we have our chief scientists, who you just heard from. Uh, we have our astronauts, who you'll hear from shortly. Uh, other technical staff, such as Jason Dooley, who did a lot of the work on the APIs. Uh, uh, Dan Hammer uh, is reachable as well, Beth Beck and Gladys Henderson. Uh, we also have uh, several other folks uh, working with us uh, with the press. Uh, most of all, what I do want to th thank is our hosts, the sponsors, and mostly all of you for volunteering over a weekend for this hackathon. I look forward to seeing what innovative solutions you're going to create. It's just been amazing the kind of work that's been done through citizen science, and I really am excited about this year. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to our glorious astronaut, Katie Coleman. I don't know about glorious. <laughs> I you know, I'll, I'll pick it up from where Deborah left off, talking about all the amazing results that have already come from hackathons like this, from people saying, well, you know, I have this idea, and I may not be able to do everything myself, but joining together with a team and making something happen. And, and the value of looking at things from a different way. We had a uh, challenge to invent a new way to do spacesuit gloves where we needed a certain dexterity, and, and the ones we have are really bulky. And I think that the person who actually won was a costume designer. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, there's, there's a lot of different viewpoints to bring. And 
you know, as an astronaut, I'm kind of down in the down in the trenches, and you know, doing the work that a lot of other people are designing, and then other people are taking that data that we collect on our missions or satellites or telescopes that we enable to space. Be other people are taking that data and doing something with it, and that is you. And what I'd like, so I like to emphasize what it's like to really be in the trenches and to be one of those people because that's what you are today. You know, you're on a team. Not yet, but you will be, right? Uh, you're on a mission. Certainly, you're on a mission. We have 35 challenges. They're challenging. And they're not there because we wanted to make stuff up. It's because we, as, as uh, Ellen was saying, we can't do this alone as NASA. And so I challenge you, when you're picking your teams, when you're doing your projects, really try to let people surprise you. I mean, we don't get to pick our space flight teams. And actually, for my, uh, to, uh, something I'm really excited about today is Ron Guerin will be here today. I think he's been here before in New York. It's actually my first uh, Space Apps Challenge. But Ron and I flew in space together on uh, Expedition 27. And there's just something special about that that you can never take away. So we're always glad to see each other. And it'll be neat to have us here. Um, we'll try to work in a phone call with our Italian crewmate, Paolo. We'll see. Anyways, um, but we don't get to pick those things. And you know, I, I don't know that Ron and I thought, you know, we're really going to be glad we spent a few months together in a small place. And so, but, it, but there's a bond that develops, but also, you know, basically, you really can't know people, and, and you have to let them surprise you. And people look at me, and several people have stopped me, and they want to take pictures and things like that, because I have this uniform. I have this label. And it says to you, she has that job. She must be somebody. But realize that in this room, Everybody is somebody. There are lots of somebodies. Which one of you may be one of the ones to walk on Mars or to develop the software or the hardware that helps us have the environmental control system that would enable us to actually take an important step on the way to Mars? I mean, there's a reason we're not on Mars yet, and that's because we have a lot of work to do, and it's not done yet, and they're actually they're incremental steps that are logical. Um, a good environmental system that doesn't break all the time on the space station, ours breaks quite a bit. It's not because people were not talented designers. It's because we're learning about the microgravity environment. And we need to learn those things before we're ready to go further. I mean, there's Earth, there's low Earth orbit, there's the moon, asteroids, and then Mars is, you know, in the next building. It's really far away. So there's things that we need, things that we need to develop. And when you're looking around and you're choosing these teams, I'll just give you a, I'll give you a team choosing uh, experience from my own background, which is when I was a freshman or sophomore in college at MIT. I was a chemistry major. Big lab course, 12 to 5, Monday through Thursday, Friday's optional. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> and 12 of us, you knew you needed a really good lab partner. And there was this one woman in the group, and tall, blonde, beautiful, kind of California-like, and I just thought, nah, you know, <laughs> nah. And apparently she looked over at me and she thought, you know, nobody that cute could do chemistry. <laughs> so we were not lab partners with each other, although we basically gravitated towards each other very soon and worked together for the next three years. She's a MacArthur Fellow. She's a world-famous, amazing chemistry professor at the University of Wisconsin. And I have a pretty cool day job. And we, we were wrong. You really, it's, I think it's actually one of the most important things you can do here today is you know, look for the people that don't, are, you know, are kind of standing there, but don't know how to say, I think maybe I should be on your team. They're, they're out there, they're here. It's gonna be a really exciting day. I think on the schedule, we had a thing that said there would be autographs um, at 11. And in, in past times, it's just turned out to be inconvenient for you to be standing in lines when you should be teaming and working and all those kinds of things. I am gonna be here all weekend until the prizes are given out. I am judging, just so you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm here all weekend. I am going to be going around to all the different groups. I will sign anything. I will take any pictures. So we're just going to do it that way without having it be some formal kind of thing. And uh, there's lots of time to make it happen. I'm really excited about being here today. I'm going to learn lots and lots of things. And I'm very excited about what you are bringing to NASA. And I thank you.
Well, yeah, thank you, Katie. We're so grateful to have you here. I'd like to now welcome our Microsoft, uh, represents our, our intergalactic sponsor, Microsoft, uh, Matt Thompson. Uh, come on up to the stage. And Teresa, you come up too. I'd like to, I'd like to also introduce everybody to, to Teresa. Come on up. <laughs> Teresa has worked with us from the beginning uh, to get us here in the space, and she's done such a fantastic job, so I just want to say a thank you to her real quick. Um, so yeah, if you guys uh, just want to. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand. So I am an evangelist for Microsoft. I run the, the evangelism organization across the US. I'm only going to take a couple of minutes. But I can't sit. So scientists can sit and talk. Like, I have to walk and talk. Otherwise, I just, it doesn't work. So the first thing I want to say is welcome. Welcome. Hey, good morning. So yeah, so, so we, run, we run about 50 hackathons a year. Um, I was at UCLA last weekend, Poly Pavilion, 10 national banners hanging over my head, talking to students about why hack. And I can tell you the very first thing is you need energy. You guys know that. So I know you guys, this is the lull before the storm. You guys will be fully energized because uh, there's a lot of work left to do, right? Um, but so I'm just going to take one minute to talk about why we do this. I'm not talking about Microsoft. I'm talking about you. So the thing that's interesting is I have a background in computer science. I actually wrote the first C++ compiler for Sun Microsystems 20 years ago. One of the interesting things was that we had two builds a day, okay? We did a build during lunch. We did a build at night. You left for lunch, came back an hour and a half later, and the system might be built for you to test. And if somebody broke the build, then you spent part of your afternoon fixing it. Then we did a system build at night. That's how fast software moved 20 years ago. Like, you couldn't hold a hackathon if that was the case, right? And many, I talked to, I talked to students, I gave, gave the story to the, the students at UCLA, and they were like, uh, really? That's how the world worked? God, how did you survive, right? So the thing is that hackathons have emerged as a way of sharing, building on the shoulders of others, democratization of data, and a deep desire to make the world a better place. That's why you guys are all here. You guys know that. That's why we're here too. So we sponsor these things across the country, not just for NASA, but a lot of student ones. We did our first middle school hackathon earlier this year. Happened to be at my kid's school, so I personally motivated to do that. Um, but having, you know, having 12-year-olds hack with real data was amazing, the kind of things they came up with, the views of the world that they, they came forward with. So we're here because we fundamentally believe in that hacker ethos. I hope it's why you're here as well. The fact that you guys have some amazing people to work with already is fantastic. I just want to point out anybody wearing the Space Cat shirt works on my team, and they're here to help as well. We brought some of our, our best technologists along here as well. So please, if you, have, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we've got a number of things here for you to help make this fun. So we have a space photo booth. Go try check that out. We also have a very interesting game that one of our evangelists built that is, is it's fun to play, but what we really want to do is show you what computer vision could be like. So it's using a Kinect to, to model things. So really would like you guys to go check that out. If you're interested in computer vision, it's a great thing to go check out. Um, in the hack space, we have a bunch of loaner devices. If you're interested in testing out on different devices, whether it be mobile devices, tablets, et cetera, come check that out as well. And then the last one, which I want to make sure I get right, we're tweeting today, and it's, it's what is it? Well, the hashtag is build the future. Yep. Um, follow um, MSSP startup. That's right. And also, was it M Microsoft NY? Microsoft NY. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So the last thing I just wanted to say then, um, I, I live in Silicon Valley. I came out here yesterday just for this. I'm getting back on a plane going home tonight. Um, I actually get an opportunity to work with a lot of startups in, in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we got to do just, uh, just a couple weeks ago was give Elon Musk a, an award. Not through my Microsoft work, but through a nonprofit that I work with. And one of the things that he did is he got up and spoke very eloquently for about 25 minutes on a bunch of different ideas. But I just want to leave you with a quote. And it was a very simple quote. It was, we have to get off the damn planet. <laughs> Literally how he finished his talk. So even if you don't agree with the fact that he thinks we do have to get off the planet, what this is about is the ability for us to do so. And what NASA's come forward and said is that it's up to us as citizen scientists to be part of that solution. I hope you help solve some of those problems this weekend. Thank you guys very much. All right, I'll make this quick because I know that everyone's really dying to hack. Um, I'm told I have three minutes. I want to compress it to one. Um, by day, I lead what we do with startups in New York, 
um, which means I have the great privilege of finding the magic that everybody makes. It's the best job, and to be here, um, it's such an honor to see the magic that you make. Now, by night, undercover, I'm also a mom, and my kids are coming this afternoon, and I can't wait to have them see uh, what you're all doing. Um, right now, though, um, I have an, a call to action for all of you, and this is like the final uh, little bit of my minute. Um, the, the Skype in the classroom people actually asked me to come up. They were dying to get involved in space apps as well. Um, they are all about connecting people from across the planet so they can do things and think things and see things they otherwise couldn't. Um, it also means that they are very intent on helping to pay it forward. So um, they have a program that is um, launching in September um, called Uplift with Skype in the classroom. Sorry that I was supposed to, the slide's supposed to, no, whatever, technical problems. Um, I want to use my last 30 seconds for this call to action. What they're doing is organizing fabulous people like you to do Skype sessions with students to show, like, tell them what you do and you know, help them understand um, the really, really important work that you do. So it's, it's actually a very crisp and clean kind of time commitment. It's like two a month for 20 minutes. Um, we were at TED a few weeks ago and a whole bunch of TED speakers signed up and we can't think of who better and who more inspirational than people in this room who are making amazing stuff. So the call to action is this. Pull out your phone, I know you have one, and text um, Skype ITC to 41411, okay? So 41411, if you wanna be a Skype guest speaker to sign up for the program, I'll say it again, 41411, and put in the words Skype ITC in the classroom, Skype in the classroom. And they'll shoot you over a form so you can sign up, but really think about doing it. What I understand is that it's certainly amazing for the students, but it's as amazing for you. It's really um, helps us remember why we do this. So that's it, have an awesome day, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And uh, by the way, I also wanna mention, um, Skype very graciously will be paying for dinner tonight, so they're our dinner sponsor, so <laughs> please remember, <laughs> when, you're, when you're having delicious, delicious uh, burger bar hamburgers tonight, you can thank Skype for that. Uh, so the next thing I would like to do is uh, actually welcome uh, the rest of our fantastic sponsors up to the, uh, up to the stage to just have a few words. Uh, we'll start with interstellar sponsor IBM. Uh, come right up to the stage. Uh, Bruce Weed from IBM will be giving a few remarks. Hello everybody. I'd like to welcome you here today and thank you all for coming. We're excited to be here. This is what we're all about. I'm responsible for New York City business development for developers and entrepreneurs. So this is what I focus on, working with guys like you to take code and develop it and hopefully launch your own company. Very important today what we're trying to do, right? We're really trying to figure out how do we innovate. Innovation is the key to today's success. In order to help you innovate better, what we've done is we've provided some tools for you to be able to do that. One of the tools that you can leverage is a tool called Bluemix. Bluemix is our cloud platform for development. We offer many t different types of data services and things that you can access. As an example, just to put it in perspective, you could take some of our Internet of Things, work with that particular data service, and work to focus on the robotics and the sensors, collecting sensor data in and analyzing that. Now, to make it even easier for you, we have actually have a white paper that's available online. It's a PDF file. And it actually breaks down each of the NASA challenges and then focuses within those challenges what are the different types of services you could use to solve that challenge. So how do you get access to this information? You go to ibm.biz forward slash space apps 215. So if you have your cell phones, you can take them out, go to that website, and you will find that PDF file that you can access. In addition to that, we will be giving away top three prizes to the teams that really innovate using Bluemix. Those prizes will be awarded on April 15th. An easy day to remember, that's, that's tax day, right? All your taxes have to be in if you're earning income. 
But really, I just want to encourage you guys, you know, look around. If you need help, we've got folks like Frank in the back of the room. He has a shirt on that says, commit, deploy, scale, and repeat. Uh, we also have a guy that's walking around. He looks like a mad scientist type of dude. He's wearing a white lab coat with white glasses. You've probably seen him. If you haven't, you will see him today. And we also have the mission control room downstairs on the fifth floor. Please ask for help. One of the things I've noticed when working with entrepreneurs, sometimes they want to do it all themselves. They're like, well, you know, I'll figure it out. Ask for help, right? Don't be one of these, and I'll, I'll pick on guys for a minute, right? Guys will sit there, they'll be driving along, and they won't ask for directions, right? Women have no problem doing that. Ask for directions. If you don't know where you're going, you need help, yell. And that's really it. I just want you guys to have fun, encourage you, be creative, be thoughtful, and work together as teams. This is really a, a great event, and I thank NASA for taking the leadership and really driving this event and sponsoring it. Good luck, everybody. And next, we have interstellar sponsor, Socrata. Hello, everyone. My name, hi. My name is Christian Hugerhide. I'm with Socrata, and we have been working with NASA to relaunch data.nasa.gov, which is NASA's publicly available growing catalog of APIs and data sets and visualizations, so I encourage everyone to use it this weekend. And I just want to say two quick things. Number one is there's a bunch of Socrata folks here, like myself, and a couple people up here and downstairs on the fifth floor. We're going to be walking around observing what you guys are doing and hopefully helping you with the site and assisting you on the APIs, but we are going to be awarding something called the Open Data Award tomorrow. The only requirement is that you have to use data from data.nasa.gov. So I encourage everyone to check out the site and to use it, and you'll be eligible for the award. The second thing is, um, many of us have been to a lot of hackathons before, and you know that this is true. It's very easy to get lost in your computer screen, and very easy to get lost in what you're building with your own team, and that's about it. But I just want to encourage everyone to look up from your computer screen and to say hi to the people around you, to make some new friends and make connections from everyone here because there's a lot of really cool people and you'll have a lot more fun. So thank you all and thanks to the NASA and Space Apps Challenge teams. That's all I have. Thank you, Christian. Next up, we have Supernova sponsor, Touch Lab, uh, CEO Kevin Galligan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I think my title changes periodically, presidency, CEO, person. Uh, I got in late from speaking in Montreal last night, so I just wrote my notes. I'll be really fast. Uh, yeah, Touch Lab, we make Android apps. Um, I don't really have much to say other than uh, I think this is a great event. It's really inspiring to, um, I think, new programmers to get into doing software development. For people who have been doing it for years, like myself, I've been programming since I was seven. Um, it's like a reminder of why we like to do it. So I think it's fantastic. Um, let's see. I think it's our third year and we don't really have an API. We just sponsor to like, you know, say, hey, this is great and I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's really progressed a lot. I want to have everyone like clap for the team putting it together. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and just guess. Uh, there are a lot of hackathons out there. I mean, like too many now, but this is one where you actually get to produce something that's useful, potentially, so I think that's awesome. Uh, if you do anything mobile related, I'll be wandering around periodically, so pull me aside, um, you know, especially Android. And if uh, you are or eventually become an Android developer, we're always hiring, so get in touch. That's it. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I'll pass it off to you. Next up, we have Supernova sponsor Twilio. Uh, evangelist Ricky Robinette. What's up, Space Apps? I'm going to plug in real quick. So, I don't know, Mike, you got some good banter? So, uh, I'm going to give Startup Bus a quick plug if, uh, if that's going to happen. So, uh, Kevin Galligan, Startup Bus member, Ricky Robinette, Startup Bus member, myself, Startup Bus member, Alice Ng, co organizer of Space Apps NYC, Startup Bus member. Uh, Startup Bus uh, is a wonderful organization. We are a 1,000 member alumni. Uh, group worldwide. Uh, we take a road trip from origin cities across uh, countries and in 72 hours create startups. Uh, so from start to finish, uh, a complete startup from scratch. Um, I probably should be on the actual camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Hello. Um, yes, and uh, we've been going now for five years. This year we'll actually be in Nashville. Uh, actually, Rick, you're, you're the national director of Startup Bus. My goodness. <laughs> How's that for banter? Um, so yeah, uh, Startup Bus has provided a lot of great support for this organization, uh, for the Space Apps NYC over the years. Uh, New York Tech Council has been a fantastic partner as well. Um, what else can I say? How are we doing? You all good? Yeah, I'm good. All right, we're good to go. Uh, Tulio. And thanks for the plug, Mike. Uh, one last Startup Bus thing before I go. Uh, this year's Startup Bus is invite only, so you have to get a member of the community to vouch for you to be able to ride. Uh, but we thought that everyone at Space Apps is obviously awesome, um, so you automatically get an invite to ride Startup Bus if you come find me. So uh, come find me. That's the end of my Startup Bus plug. Twilio, uh, I am Ricky Robinette from Twilio. Twilio makes it easy for developers to write code that sends and receives text messages and makes and receives phone calls. Uh, I'm just gonna show you how it works real quick. Uh, this is an audience participation uh, part of the show. So if you can all get out your cell phones and turn the ringer all the way up. I know this is not something you normally hear in a presentation. Uh, and, and please, at the end of this presentation, turn them all the way down. Uh, but for now, turn them all the way up. Once you've done that, send a text message with any content you want to 718-215-0843. That is 718-215-0843. Anything you want to 718-215-0843. Zero eight four three, uh, and the code that is going to handle the response you get is this code right here. It is just a handful of lines. I am just giving you my contact info, and I am sending you the uh, the NASA pick of the day uh, because that's pretty awesome. Uh, but not only can you respond to inbound messages in Twilio, uh, you can also do things outbound without people uh, triggering it. So what I'm gonna do now is call everyone in the room that texted in, uh, and I'm gonna play the Brooklyn Nets chant because if you can't tell, I live in Brooklyn. Woo! Oh, what's up, Brooklyn? Uh, so we should start hearing phones ring right now. Feel free to put them on speaker. Uh, this is what Twilio does. If you wanna see how I built this, there is an API demo going on uh, right after all this wraps up downstairs. Uh, we're gonna live code this entire app together in 10 minutes, so thanks a lot. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Okay, thank you, Ricky. Okay, uh, next Supernova sponsor, Intel Mashery. Hey, hello, Space Apps. Uh, my name is Y Lun. And all right, we're back. Hi. So my name is Y Lun. I work for Intel. Um, I'm a technical evangelist. So uh, what I do is I go to a lot of hackathons like this one, and you know, I work with students and people in the industry to build awesome projects that solves world problems. Um, what we've brought here this weekend is the Intel Edison. It's a little hardware platform that you guys can use to uh, build your projects with. Um, we also have a ton of sensors for like temperature, light, we have servos, we have LCDs. So any sort of um, projects that you have in mind, uh, come to us and we'll help you build it. Um, so what can you do with the Intel Edison, right? You can build wearables, wearable technology, so space club. Uh, robotics. Um, so this has a lot of PWM outputs, so you can control a set of motors, like this little rover here that uh, a project team has built. You can build chickens. Actually, that's a chicken farm. Um, so it monitors their temperature and optimizes um, the environment for chickens. And you can also make cheese with the Intel Edison. So like food is a, a problem, like feeding people is a good problem to solve. So think about that, and that might be a project you can build this weekend. There's also a uh, Best Use of Intel Technology Award. So um, if you build something awesome with our platform, then uh, you could win something. You can come talk to me about it. 
And thanks. So uh, if you want the hardware platform, um, come talk to me uh, during the workshop, and I'll be giving those out during then. Thank you. Next up, Supernova sponsored Double Dutch, Casper Jepsen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here from uh, Double Dutch, and we're a small startup out in California. We do event apps, and we did the app for this one. So I would love for everyone to uh, really get into the activity feed this weekend, post everything you're doing, post questions for other people. It's a great way to get in contact with the other people who are doing the hackathon. Um, like I said, we're a startup, so we basically do a full year hackathon. Every single day is a burnout hackathon. We try to not burn ourselves fully out, but it's about that, getting passionate about technology, and that's one of the reasons we're really excited to be here. I'm really excited to meet all of you. And also, we're of course also hiring, so anyone who wants to do Android, iOS apps, or for web stack, come talk to us. Thanks. Next up, Supernova sponsor SparkPost with Benjamin Dean. Hi, I'm Benjamin Dean. I'm the principal developer advocate with Message Systems. Uh, actually, SparkPost is our product. So 15 years of experience, sending over 12 billion emails a day. That's what Message Systems has done for Twitter, LinkedIn, Groupon, all the rest of the big companies out there. Uh, next week, we're gonna be launching GA version of SparkPost. So it's been in private beta. We're gonna get it to all of you guys. What it does is make, make it so easy to send email at any scale, either transactional or bulk, transactional or bulk email. Uh, and we wanna be able to let you guys put that kind of power in your app because ultimately email is king. Uh, you, can't get, you can't get a Twitter handle without it. You can't get a Facebook account without an email. Twitter is, or, or email is still the way to go for any kind of communication forward. Uh, we've got a lot of use cases. If you guys wanna take a peek at it, Adrian Howard's gonna be up there with me and we'll be able to help you guys out. We'll be scoring around the crowd and uh, Love to be able to see you guys have some fun. It's so awesome to watch all these people who are so excited. Where's Tiffany at? I know she's here. Where is Tiffany at? She was here at like five in the morning. She was, th th this girl is dedicated. She is totally awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And next we have About.com, Supernova sponsor, represented by our superstar space hacker, Winner two years in a row of Space Apps NYC, Jonathan Roberts. Hi guys, it's great to see so many people here. Um, Space Apps is an amazing event. Uh, it was actually my first ever hackathon uh, and the reason that I'm at About. Um, I met Mike at Space Apps a couple of years ago and that is one of the reasons that About.com now has a thriving data science team. So, and we also hire a bunch of physicists uh, we now have a whole bunch of PhD uh, astrophysicists working at about.com on media problems. Um, surprisingly, not as bizarre as you would expect. Um, but just to say, yeah, meet people here, have a good time, but also note that a lot of people here are looking for people with your skill sets. Use this as a good way to get to know other people and just try new things, right? Try new skills you wouldn't normally try in your job. Try to learn new things and you'll find people who will teach you, help you, um, show you how to do things you've never seen before. Uh, and then they might help you find an entirely new job in the city. This is a very special group of people, the kind of people who come out on the weekend to give up a weekend to hack on projects for NASA with no monetary prize at the end of the day. It's a very interesting group of people. So it is absolutely worth sitting down, looking around you, talking to the people around you and getting to know them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, okay, so we only have a few more um, quick remarks that we're gonna do. Um, Alice just coming up to the stage behind me now. Um, one thing I do wanna say real quick is, uh, again, I'm gonna reiterate, our intergalactic sponsor, Microsoft, has some amazing stuff uh, here to check out on the floor. After we wrap this up, we're gonna give you guys some free time just to kind of wander around the floor and check stuff out. So check out their photo booth, check out their um, space game display, uh, check out their device lab if there's something, you know, maybe get inspired to use one of their uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, and also they wanted us to mention that um, they are awarding best Microsoft hack. Um, if you recall, we sent out that notification in the API guide. Actually, all of our sponsors 
are listed on there. Um, so uh, they just wanted to let you all know that there will be something uh, added on to those that win the, uh, the best Microsoft hack. You know, we don't like to say prizes here because we're not about competition, you know, here at the app, or, uh, here at the Space Apps Challenge. Um, you know, we're here to, to, to do social good and, and solve problems for, to improve life on Earth and in space. But there is something cool that you will get. <laughs> okay, uh, so. So there are a few things that you should know for this weekend. Um, one of them is that you should have received a pink wristband or a VIP badge. Um, you'll need to keep that on you for the entire weekend. It gives you access to both the hacking floor and the public floor. Um, it also gives you access to the overnight space, uh, which we will share with you a little bit later. Um, lunch will be served around 12.30. Um, make sure you have your wristband. Probably closer to 1 p.m. actually. Or 3 so, uh, so API demos are gonna happen starting around noon. So you basically have not from now until 11.45, um, you know, you get the exhibits all to yourself before we open up to the public. So check stuff out now. Um, you're, uh, like Alice said, you're able to move freely bef between the two floors, but we really, you know, you're here to, to do the hackathon. We're here to work with NASA. Um, so if we just, we just ask you to spend the majority of your time, you know, working on a hack, working on a challenge. But if there's a talk that you really, really want to see, it's okay to come up here to, to, to see it. Um, we don't want people using the live stream. So like, please don't use the live, like, don't view the live stream to use your bandwidth. Uh, here, because you're, you're here. <laughs> so, you know, just come, come on upstairs and check it out. Um, but, you know, check your mobile app, check the schedule. If, it's, if you see a talk that you really want to see, you can mark it on there in Double Dutch. Um, and... Uh, Mike and I will be here for the entire festival. If you need help, come find us. You should also Red know Jean Brooks. She's our amazing operations director. If you have any questions, please find her as well. Jean, uh, Jean, we love you. Gene has done a, a fantastic amount of work for us, and we, we really appreciate it. Um, and also, I'm going to give a shout out to our live stream team: uh, Sean Persevilla, <laughs> Nikki Brovold, Jolie McPhee, <laughs> Jolie McPhee with the Internet Society of New York. Fantastic job these guys did. They did a great job at the boot camp yesterday. If you guys didn't see that, check it out afterwards. Uh, amazing inspirational speakers all across the board all day yesterday for, from Civic Hall. Um, okay, so so lunch lunch will be around one ish. Use that time uh, when, when you're at lunch, like gra grabbing food and stuff. If you haven't met anyone yet, um, what we'll do is in the open hack area downstairs, we'll designate each of the corners as like a mingle corner. So if, if you don't have a challenge, if you don't have a team, um, we'll, s we'll just say go to the robotics corner and meet people that want are interested in robotics. Then you guys can talk about what challenges you, know, you might want to, to partake in. Uh, so we'll do that for you know, one of the each of the corners of the room. Um, and you know, just feel free, everyone here is really great. Um, everyone's gonna be really friendly. Just introduce yourself, say hi, like, oh yeah, I think robots are awesome. And if you're um, feeling extra shy, come find one of us and we'll find you a screen. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you for coming and uh, we're excited to be, to have you all here and let's get started. We'll be, uh, we'll be switching back for the folks watching at home on the live stream. We will be back on uh, about 12.15 uh, for the public festival portion uh, beginning. Thanks very much.
This is a microphone check. One, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hold on. Check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Check one, two. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Do you know if anyone else is coming? Well, me? Yeah.
International Space Act Challenge for the second year in a row. Um, we expect this year, uh, well actually we know this year will be bigger and better than ever uh, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and none is more exciting than the group of people to my left uh, you're about to hear from shortly. Um, without their belief in the event and their support and expertise, uh, it's hard to say uh, what the event would be. It certainly wouldn't be at the scope it is today. Um, and that is with over 10,000 people participating this weekend, I believe, uh, at over 130 locations around the world, uh, as well as people uh, participating remotely as well. And they're all doing so in the name of uh, innovation and helping solve humanity's challenges uh, both on this earth and off of it. So please allow me to introduce our first speaker. She is New York City's first CTO in its history, and she leads a citywide effort to make New York City the most tech-friendly and innovation-driven city in the world, Minerva Tantoka. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Minerva Tantoko, and on behalf of New York City and Mayor Bill de Blasio, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome the Space Apps Challenge and Space Apps Challenge New York to, um, to New York City. So thank you so much for being here for the second year in a row. Uh, New York City is really the home of innovation. It's the font of incredible diversity and creativity in all five boroughs here. And we're incredibly thrilled to be the fastest growing tech hub in, in the country. Um, we're number two uh, in the country right now, but uh, we're New York, we want to be number one, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's so exciting to be here and, and be part of this incredible uh, hackathon, this global hackathon, and, and we completely agree about the importance of technology, not only to New York City's government, but technology to New York City's future. And we think that technology has incredible power to help solve some of the world's biggest problems. So um, well, I look forward to seeing some of the solutions that come up um, out of this competition. And we're incredibly thrilled to have you all here. We hope that you all have a great time here in New York City as well. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, be part of these opening ceremonies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, uh, we have NASA's Chief Technology Officer for IT. Uh, very exciting. Uh, in her current role, she collaborates with scientists and engineers to create innovative tools for the agency. And previously, she led the NASA Open Innovation Program during the time this very event was created. So without her, who knows uh, if we're gathered here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Diaz. Thank you. Since 2012, the Space Apps has become the biggest hackathon worldwide. Um, right now, we, uh, as we have talked about, we're in, uh, we started out in 25 locations uh, back in 2012. Now we're in 136 locations around the world. We have over 10,000 people who are attending and over 1,000 virtually. Over a 48-hour period, people will create new solutions to address a broad range of 35 challenges such as designing wearable technology for astronauts, building your own drone, turning many of NASA's breathtaking images into art for mapping clean water. The focus challenges are aligned with NASA's mission. They are along the following themes, Earth, outer space, humans, and robotics. The challenges will tap the creativity of people from around the world to solve problems together. NASA is thrilled to have a global team of technologists, scientists, designers, families, entrepreneurs, and others who work together to develop the answers to some of life's most pressing problems, both on Earth and in space. This year, we created a Women in Data Boot Camp to lower the barrier of entry to newcomers to that hackathon experience. After Space Apps Weekend, we'll debut a new program to help support women in the data science fields. That will be called Data Not Poor. I look forward to providing more information in the future about this program. We have some new products developed with you in mind for this year's Space Apps Challenge. 
We've provided over 16,000 new data sets and 40 new APIs. This helps the developers avoid large downloads and varying API formats. It increases the discoverability and the searchability. We heard you very loud and clear last year requesting a developer's toolkit and are now providing API management of developer keys, rate limiting, and caching. But what it's really about is all of you. It's that crowd, um, crowdsourcing, it's the citizen science, it's that innovation and creativity that at a hackathon everyone brings to the table. NASA doesn't have all the answers, and it's really with all of your help that we will resolve these very, very difficult challenges, whether that's global climate change, going to Mars, or looking for other planets. I thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, we have NASA's current Open, open Innovation Manager, Beth Beck. Her current role is to identify and adopt breakthrough uh, innovations and cutting edge data tech solutions uh, through open government, digital strategy, and mass collaboration. So naturally, the International Space Apps Challenge is uh, near and dear to her heart, I guess you could say. Uh, please welcome Beth Beck. Well, it's good to be here. Um, we're so thrilled to be in New York, for one thing, because this is this incubator innovation incubator. Um, a lot of what we're doing this year is because we came to New York in the fall to learn more about how women in the data science, the data making, the data tech community were doing here. So we wanted to learn more about what was working well, how could we be more part of it, how could we make our data more accessible and more usable. Um, because we want to change the ratio, to borrow a, a really nice term, we want to change to have more women engaged with data and make this a, a safe data space to engage. So uh, open data, let me talk about it just a second. We are mandated by the federal government, and by our, the White House and our OMB, to make our data available. Now, NASA is an open data agency. We always have been. You know, we've been founded on the principles that our research and development should be made available to the public. We change textbooks with our discoveries, so that's what we do. There, what's new is making what was once human readable, machine readable, and making it accessible for developers to do more with. I look, I look at the difference between when we went to the moon, we, you know, we had our cameras, we came back and we did the Polaroid, or you know, we developed our imagery, and then when, once we had digital cameras, we had to convert all of that. Well, that's where we are with this new machine readable, because we have human readable, you can look at the image, but now we have to make it more. So. The Space Apps Challenge is actually one of our programs to take that open data and give it away to the public and let the public, citizens around the world, come and make something from our data. So for us, it's this really incredible opportunity to give you the data comes from our programs. So we go out and we make these discoveries. This is the output, our data is the output of the discoveries and the programs we have to give it to you and have you discover something new from it and even show us something we didn't even know was there awesome. So that's why we're here, and to have 136 locations this year in 62 countries taking part in this over a weekend, I mean, this is your time. This is, the, all the citizens are here, it's your time that you're giving to us because you care about our data. I mean, it's such an honor to have that, that relationship. So we want to make this the best thing possible. We want to have more women be part of it. The other, the challenge that we have, that we are working on, is to give more legs to the innovations that are created here. So we recognize that a lot of work goes into these creations. There are so many of them. It's overwhelming for us to even process all the ideas that come back, but we're working on it. So that's the thing this next year, we're working on putting some platforms in place to let us not only give legs for innovation in the local communities, we're creating some of those opportunities and toolkits, but also to infuse those ideas that the citizens create back into NASA. That's almost the harder part of what we're doing. But there's a lot of curation that needs to come back in, and we are working on that too. So we're glad to be here. We're looking forward to however many hundreds, and maybe a thousand or more of innovations come out of this weekend. And then we'll be spending the next month looking at the judging process. Once we get all of these in, then the NASA team gets to download, you know, down select all of these wonderful ideas and come up with the 25 that will go into our global judging process.
So we'll be super busy in the next um, month looking at the wonderful ideas and innovations that this organization around um, the world are doing. One other thing, thank you to Space Apps New York because we would not be having the Space Apps Challenge if it weren't for our local organizers. We offer the data, you guys make the, the activities and the events happen. You know, it's the arms and legs around the world that are taking our data and doing something with it. You know, we're not successful without these local organizations. So thank you to New York. For listening to this. Thank you, Beth. Up next, uh, from our gracious host at Microsoft, uh, we have Matt Thompson. Matt is the general manager of developer and platform evangelism, and his team, him and his team are responsible for uh, its communities of developers, startups, and IT pros uh, around the entire US. Very happy to have him here. Please welcome Matt Thompson. So first, uh, I just want to say a couple of things about why we do this. Um, uh, the formation, the, the, the process of, of creative innovation is something that is kind of near and dear to Microsoft. The team that I run our job is actually to enable hacking across the United States. I was at UCLA last weekend working with about 1,100 of my favorite students. They all became my best friends over the weekend, um, doing very, going through a very similar process, this, this process of ideation and innovation. Um, we're here specifically today opening up our office and, and, and letting all these great hackers come in because we fundamentally believe in that process. Whether it's aimed at space, whether it's aimed at agriculture, whether it's aimed at atmosphere, um, whether it's aimed at, at natural science or applied science, it's this kind of process that has really um, enabled innovation to grow. And, and I'll just I'll harken back to a couple of comments made earlier about New York. Um, I'm from Silicon Valley. I flew out last night, I'm flying back tonight. Um, we look at New York as not just the second largest ecosystem for innovation in the United States, not only the fastest growing innovation because ecosystem in the United States, but also the most interesting. The, the aggregation of technology, yes, you can clap, that's right. The aggregation of technology, um, data science, um, the economics that just sit inside the city, as well as the, the wide diversity that you have here provides an amazing, amazingly fertile ground for innovation to happen here. Uh, we see it every day. We work with startups in the city every single day. And the startups that we see coming out of New York City, the innovation we see coming out of NYU, the innovation we see in the schools here, beyond anything we see anywhere else in the country. And so that's why I'm here. I wanted to experience that. And I'll just share, in talking with some of the teams already this morning, there was just one team that just grabbed me. I, I happen to be kind of a person who gets excited about drones. I happen to have three at home. I fly them legally, I'll say that. Um, but interestingly enough, there was, there was a team downstairs hacking on how you would fly a drone in a, in alien atmosphere. Problem I never thought about, right? Just three people got together this morning and said, how would we solve for that? Amazing stuff. So um, I'm also going to spend just a minute talking about what this, this innovation ecosystem is really all about and what's at the core of this. Um, I've been in software for over 20 years. One of the things that I told the hackers this morning when they were in the same room was that it used to take a long time to create software. It used to take a longer time to create hardware. Today, we can, we can move through those cycles within, literally for software within minutes and with hardware within hours. We have 3D printing partners here today that are actually printing new types of materials for people to play with on the spot and thinking about what that would be like in space. The opportunity to drive new innovation through these kinds of things is amazing. And so when we look at the kind of creation that we're seeing here, it's about getting as many people involved with as many different kinds of thinking. And that's where this innovation is going to come from. So I'm just going to stop there. I'm going to say, we're here. We've opened up our, our building. We've brought all our technology evangelists and our deep technologists here because this is a process that we believe is going on across the country. It really represents the future of the country. I'll finish with the same quote I finished this morning. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Elon Musk a little bit. Um, the quote that he gave at a, recent, at a recent function in Silicon Valley was, we have to get off the damn planet. Um, and I will just say, it's not as if we need to have to get off the planet so much as we should be able to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Up next, we have Sandy Carter of IBM. Sandy serves as general manager of ecosystem development and social business evangelism. Uh, she's responsible for IBM's worldwide relationships with independent software vendors, uh, which comprises about a third of IBM's revenue, approximately, which by my calculations is pretty good. 
Uh, she's a recognized leader in social business and an award-winning author of several books. Please welcome Sandy Carter. Well, um, good afternoon to everybody and good morning and good evening to some folks I know that are watching this live streaming. Um, as Mike said, I have, I think, the coolest job at IBM because much like what you've just heard, my job is to, around the globe, really help to stimulate innovation and entrepreneurship. And I did want to thank both Deborah and Beth for yesterday. I got to participate in the Women of Data and really help to stimulate here in New York more women who are developing technology as well. IBM commitment to this really goes back to NASA's inception. So IBM was an initial partner with NASA many years ago and helping to really foster breakthrough innovation that has changed the world, including ascending a man and now women to, uh, into space and to the moon as well. Now, our sponsorship of this challenge really involves three elements, and we're really excited about all three. And the first is around the technology platform. So we've offered up our award-winning IBM Cloud platform, which is called Bluemix. And this enables these developers from around the world to innovate on all those great different challenges that Deborah talked about in hours and days where it would have taken them weeks before. In addition, we have what I would call a platform that enables that disparate use of data. So we like to think of all that great data that NASA has offered up as the oil. And as you know, oil is, I'm a Texan, so oil is great, but you have to refine it for the value. And our refinery is analytics. So part of what we're offering up today as well to a lot of the developers around the world in 70 cities that IBM is helping to uh, support our analytics to refine the data that we have out there. Now we're also bringing to bear some of the differentiated technology as well. So here in New York City is the home of Watson. Do you remember Watson played in Jeopardy? It's around cognitive computing and really world class technology for machine learning. So we have a team downstairs investigating the use of Watson in space and on Earth. We also have teams leveraging on top of Bluemix Internet of Things which we saw some really powerful ones yesterday at the Women of Data Challenge that can really move forward. And then mobile. Um, this morning we heard in from our teams from Africa, uh, Turkey, Tokyo, that are leveraging mobile to do amazing and incredible things, both around helping us save water, conserve water here on Earth, to manage asteroids in space. So the second thing that we are committed to NASA on on these space app challenges is technical support and talent. So we really believe that this is the generation of the cloud. 85% of development today is done in the cloud. And so in New York City, which is our hub, which is where I live and work, but also in 70 other locations, we have the best the brightest technologists from IBM that IBM has to bring to the table. And we're doing that in person, we're doing that virtually, and we're really in there shoulder to shoulder with the developers, helping them to innovate and helping them to really bridge this new culture of cloud innovation. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is, culture eats strategy for lunch. So as companies are going forward with cloud, they're thinking about their strategy and not so much the cultural differentiation that these developers have to have. So, you know, both Deb and Beth talked about the new APIs and the sharing of data. That's new culture to do that crowdsourcing. So we're helping them not just on the technology, but also to embrace that new culture. And then the third thing that we're offering into the challenge is much like NASA has rewards, we also know that entrepreneurs need rewards as well. So we are offering 33 different awards that are $120,000 worth of free IBM Cloud services, but as well, business mentoring. So yesterday we had a young IoT company that has a great technology, and what we're gonna do here in New York is to help them figure out their business model and all the things that go around that as well. So three of those rewards will be done right here in New York City. Now this uh, collaboration with NASA um, is really our commitment to New York City. So I know that we were on stage here in October announcing digital.nyc, 
It's really a virtual collaborative ecosystem for here for New York. You should really go check it out, as well as our commitment to things like Girls Who Code. And I'll just close on this because I was so in awe of what Beth and Deborah did yesterday with women of data. If you think about it, only 6% of VCs are women. Now, women-owned companies are 40% more profitable, but they're 25% less likely to get funding. And we're going to change that, and we're going to change that first here in New York City. And we're going to lead the way for New York City around that area. So we are honored and proud both to be part of the New York City ecosystem, and we're really honored and proud that NASA allowed us to assist in what I believe is a world-changing hackathon. So thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Christian Hugerhide from Socrata. Uh, where at Socrata, he helps public sector organizations improve transparency, transparency, excuse me, and data-driven decision making. Uh, please welcome Christian, everybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Hugerhide. I'm a data solutions architect with Socrata. And our mission is to make publicly available data uh, more useful to more people. So the reason I'm here, the reason I really am excited to be here and honored to be here is because yesterday I was at this Women in Data boot camp that we held um, just down the road. And I sat with a young woman who was trying to figure out the APIs and the data that you know, we collectively were making available for them to hack on and explore during the weekend. And this young woman looked actually kind of confused and she was having a bit of a difficult time at first to figure out how these APIs worked and what to do with the data. So I sat down with her and we were playing with it and we made one single API call, an API call which calls a database, pulls data up and shows it on the screen in her case. And when the data appeared on the screen, she smiled. This was the first time she'd ever seen that happen. And she said, I can do this. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is totally why I'm here. She can do this and lots of other people here who haven't done it before can do this collectively. We're all here because we believe in what we're doing. So Socrata, we're involved because we are helping NASA to relaunch data.nasa.gov, which is NASA's publicly available uh, listing of data sets and APIs and visualizations, which I encourage everyone here to use, and certainly the community downstairs hacking away already. Um, I'm just going to close and say that I want us to remember that this weekend should not be an end in and of itself. It's not activity for the sake of activity. It's not a hackathon just because we wanted to hold one big international event and, and that's it, it ends. This is supposed to be the beginning. This is where we start and kickstart greater projects and greater innovation. So if you see someone who's hacking downstairs, give them a pat on the back or give them some encouragement because this is the beginning of something greater. Thank you all, thanks to the Space Lab team and to NASA for hosting us. And good luck to everyone involved and to those of you who are encouraging it. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, uh, very happy to introduce um, our last speaker, a NASA astronaut who has um, flown in space three separate times, most recently spending six months in the International Space Station. Uh, please welcome Katie Coleman. So I know we're about today, but we're also about the future. And I was also at the uh, data boot camp. And you know, part of the reason it's just so important to do something like this, I mean, we did that yesterday because we think it's going to reap benefits for the next hackathon. I mean, it already did for this one in that the front row was filled with some girls from that data boot camp. Um, we ran around at the end of the day and, and they talked about their aha moments. This was about 75 uh, girls that were registered and some really astounding coaches and, and folks that said things. And, you know, even though I know we're about today, but this is, it's, it's all about tomorrow, really. Some of the quotes, I didn't know what I could bring to the table, but now I do. Um, always check that you bring your AC adapters, okay? Um, <laughs> Um, I'm completely changed from this morning till now. This is someone under the age of 16 that said this. Uh, I'm completely changed from this morning till now. We're the future in this room. We can do some really great things with data. 
I mean, it's what it's really what we're here for. And, you know, kind of a, a, on the lighter side, everything I saw was interesting and I wanted to try it. I mean, I brought a 14 year old here of mine um, for just that reason. There's a lot of very large problems here on the earth, off the earth um, that all of us would like to solve. And actually, whether we like to solve them or not, all of them belong to all of us. And we need the whole planet to be doing that. And today, I think we have a pretty good proportion. I mean, Beth mentioned you know, how many countries and 10,000 10, people all around the globe. The way I like to think of it is um, being kind of a, a person who goes on long business trips, some of them six months, <laughs> uh, is that you, know, you still want to be present and you want to be part of solutions in the places that you care about. And, uh, and, and feel connected in that way. And I've always been a commuter my whole married life of, of 20 something years. And my husband and I always kind of take comfort in the fact that when we look out, we see the same moon. And in this case, there are 10,000 people around the world uh, looking at the same 36 challenges and focusing on what we can do today that will create ripples tomorrow. And, it, I, and it's really been inspiring for me to be with the other folks here on the, on the panel, the, the companies that have contributed, being here in the Microsoft space, it's really exciting, the, the Bluemix environment that we all worked in yesterday, and all the other sponsors who got up here, not so much to advertise their stuff, but to make sure that these people knew about the tools that were theirs to use. Because, and, and actually just and some of the people that are leading everybody around were, I was worried about some of the girls from yesterday. Well, what if they're not on a team? I mean, what if the ones that are like this, how are they gonna get picked on a team? And, and I was told by someone who runs things here, we know that, we've run hackathons, we see them and we take care of them and they will be on teams. So this is, there's some real, people's lives are gonna change here today for a variety of reasons, whether it's because what they feel enabled to do or because of what they do for us at NASA or because of the, the resources that they understand are available for when they're gonna, uh, when they leave here and they go on and they do other things. So I'm very happy to be a part of this. I am actually not the only one in the space family that is here. I am joined today by Ron Guerin, who was in space with me on Expedition 27. Uh, Ron's in the front row there, and Ron. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, so why don't you guys come up here, and also Richard Garriott, come on up. I um, wanted to just make sure you, uh, and who knows what other astronauts will come up here. And, you know, something I talked about yesterday uh, a lot to the girls um, was the power of the costume. And, you know, and the fact that, and, and even here this morning, you know, people want to take a picture of the astronaut because they see a costume, and suddenly they think they know who this is. And yet, who are the other astronauts? Who are the other pioneers that are in the audience? And, and, and it becomes very clear that you don't even, by catching the blue jumpsuit, catch all of the astronauts. So I will let, and Richard Garrett is also a, a member of our astronaut family, also with us on the space station, not physically with Ron and I, but uh, up there for a few weeks as part of his mission and a pioneer in data games and all those things. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and then we'll all take questions. And uh, Ron and Richard and I will fight over the living in space, which we all very much miss questions. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Katie. Um, so I've been involved with the International Space Labs Challenge since it started in 2012. Um, but really, NASA's hackathon started 35 years ago, right? So who knows what happened this day in 35 years ago? Anybody? Apollo 13 launched, right? So Apollo 13 really was NASA's first hackathon. So we had an unexpected group of people come together to, to solve an unexpected challenge. They had a very short time frame to do it, and uh, they had to really think outside the box. Uh, and in this particular case, lives were at stake. And um, I think, if, you know, I just wrote this book called The Orbital Perspective, and one of the points of it is if you zoom out and look at things in big picture and look at things over a long time frame, what we realize is that we are fighting for our survival. Uh, things that we're doing now, the problems that we're solving now, uh, will have, a, no matter how small they are, will have a profound positive effect uh, on the trajectory of our global society. And so when we look at things from that long time frame point of view, uh, I see a lot of similarities between what we're doing uh, in the International Space Ups Challenge and what, what was going on in Apollo 13, where we, yeah, we have a little bit more time to, to, to solve the problems, but maybe not. When, better food. And better food. <laughs> I don't know, I haven't, I haven't eaten yet. Is there good food here? <laughs> well, all of it's better than our space food, okay? Yeah. 
So we were together in space for two months, and this is what I had to put up with, <laughs> which I loved. So, um, so I, you know, I just wanted to, to close with thank you all for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. You really do prove that you don't have to be in orbit to have the orbital perspective. And, and I think there's tremendous power in connecting the formal sector to the informal sector uh, to be able to um, really co collectively pool our, our creative genius and solve, solve a lot of these problems. And I think a lot of the problems facing our planet have technical solutions, and I think we're going to arrive at some of those this weekend. So that's a really exciting thing to be a part of. So thanks, Richard. And um, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, my first time to be at the uh, Space Apps Challenge. I'm Richard Garrett again. Uh, I flew uh, on a Russian Soyuz to live on board the space station for about two weeks in October of 2008. Uh, my journey was a little different than the traditional methods. Uh, my father was a NASA astronaut. He flew on Skylab and the space shuttle. Uh, that is what, what probably inspired me to take space a little more seriously than most kids. Uh, but I was told at a young age, uh, that because I needed glasses, that I was ineligible at the time to be a NASA astronaut. So at the age of 13, I, I devoted myself to flying privately. And uh, uh, also probably inspired by NASA, I got into a very STEM-oriented career. Uh, I make video games for a living, is how I've earned my keep. Uh, also inspired by my mother, who is an artist, so uh, computer games, the quintessential high-tech art. Uh, and the, my success in video games is what allowed me to help build commercial space companies and organizations like the XPRIZE and a company called Space Adventures, which has flown all seven private citizens who have ever flown in space have flown with uh, my company. Uh, including myself. Uh, but on space apps in particular, you know, on my own flight, I was looking for productive things to do to contribute and also look for commercial applications that might pay for future trips to space uh, during my time. It's interesting to note how that relates very much to what's happening here today. Uh, for example, I wanted to data mine out of the Skylab photographic archive to reshoot photographs that my father had taken 35 years previously, and I wanted to show how the Earth had changed in one generation of spaceflight. And uh, NASA was on board with that. Uh, the Nature Conservancy volunteered a scientist to help us do that data mining. And then we had the problem of how do I put something like a thousand photographic targets into a method that I can sit at the window and, and know where to look, where to shoot, and what camera lenses to use. And it turns out that the, the, the the standard method for Earth observations by astronauts at that time was largely a piece of paper with a printout of what the view out the window might look like, which you couldn't orient or uh, tell if it was going to be on the port or the starboard or exactly what time it might come by. Uh, and so I helped develop a piece of software called Windows on Earth, which had all those photographic targets in it set next to the window, had a scrolling view that was identical to what you saw at the window. Uh, it was actually so powerful that my crewmates, who outranked me on board, uh, would push me out of the way and use my tools to shoot their shots. <laughs> and, uh, and now, actually, that tool is the standard application for crew Earth observations. And so that's an example of, again, how you know, doing these relatively simple software applications can really make profound differences in how we live and work in space and how that data is utilized back here on the Earth. So I'm very proud, proud to be here, too. Thanks. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, we're a little behind schedule, but we have about five or so minutes um, to open the floor to any questions. If anyone, any of our media friends have any questions, feel free. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, we'll have someone with a microphone come over so our live stream friends can uh, hear everything. Hi, guys. I'm uh, Kaylee Rogers. I'm with Motherboard Advice. Uh, I was just curious about some of the past years, some of the innovations and, and technologies and ideas that have, that have come up with. Have any of them had practical applications for NASA or, or any of your experiments? Oh. Oh, no. So let me just kind of preface it. it um, to do the reality check. We have lawyers at NASA, and we have citizens who create so create uh, really wonderful, incredible ideas, and sometimes the two don't mix. And so what we're trying to do, there are a lot of great ideas. There, like last year, I'll speak for last year, it was my first year to really be involved in space apps, but we had 
leave me alone challenge. And so we had tons of, I'll call them adorable, people hate that word, but to me, they're adorable apps that you could take a picture of the leaf and it would tell you the quality of, of the air. And so that was the challenge. And we had lots of different ways that people did it, like the size of the leaf, the color of the leaf, whether the cleave, and, and these are all different citizen solutions to it. So we had so many of them, and uh, several of them made it into the global challenge, a uh, global um, prize category. But what we had, the conversation we're having now, so this is this, it takes us a while to do the infusion of technology back into NASA. So the, the conversation we're having is, there are so many layers of that, that solution. How do we take all of those layers and bring them back in and have a, an, earth, an, an earth leaf app? So the other the challenge we also had is the coding is all different. So it's not like you can say, I'm going to scoop up all this code, and now we have a NASA app. Um, so, so that's the one thing. And then also, just to be clear, that it's all open source. So SpaceX is open source. This is another thing I'm, we always tell our lawyers, remind them. You, you, all of you out there in the world making these solutions, you own those solutions, but so does everyone else. So NASA can use it, you can use it, someone else can use it, it's open source. It's how you build on it, how you do those things. So you're not working for NASA, you're working for yourselves and we're giving you that data. What we wanna do on top of that is that some of those, we want your ideas to infuse back. So there are a lot of those, there are a lot of really great solutions that came in. One though, I will say from the year before, it's called T10, so since we have three astronauts here, space flyers, space pioneers. So what they did was they wanted to have a little timer that whenever, so the astronauts could say, I have specific um, images that I want to take, and you get this little timer that goes, beep, time to go run over to the portal, look down, take your picture. So that was a really clever one that they did. Now, getting that into mission control and having them use it is a totally different story. Great idea. So we have a lot of work to do to infuse that innovation. But there, I wish I could, there's so many to talk about. Yes. Well, first of all, for the like legal limitations, I think that we've been fairly groundbreaking at NASA in terms of prizes and challenges and, and ways to bring that outside community to us to help us. And for, I think, one of the first challenges, uh, there was something that was done that we ended up really wanting, and we actually just didn't have a procurement method to get it, right? And so we have addressed that. In this case, uh, Dan Lucky in our, in our tech transfer. But these are things that we're aware of and, and we're, um, you know, working on. Um, there was a reason I grabbed the mic from you, and now I forget. Oh, so in terms of getting things on board the station, so whether it's an app, whether it's an experiment, or just a better way of doing business, um, for a long time we've been busy building that space station. In fact, Ron here did quite a bit of building, installing the Japanese module and, and other things. And But now that it's built, it is open for business, and it is more open for business than people understand, and that's actually one of my purposes in being here, is to help you realize that it's an amazing platform for microgravity research. There are really good experiments that need to be done there. It is slow and painful through NASA sometimes, and we have employed a partner. Their name is CASIS. It's the Center for uh, ex uh, Experiments in Space, Science in Space, the Advancement of Science in Space. And this is so that everyone doesn't have to reinvent the wheel of having, whether it's software or hardware, have it be, uh, you know, figure out how to interface with NASA and do those safety checks and fill out that paperwork and all that kind of stuff. So the CASIS, which is C-A-S-I-S, -S, is our Center for Advancement of Science in Space, and they are trying to do things like that, and they're doing some really innovative educational efforts as well. Yeah, and let, let me just add, because this is a really important question. It's probably the, the most important question we can ask is what are we doing with everything that happens at the Space Up Challenge? And you heard about one side of it is what is NASA doing? And, and NASA is doing a lot of, of um, development that stems that, that has its start at Space Up's Challenge. But there's a couple other pieces of this. There's also, you know, what, so there's, there's apps and there's, there's uh, products that are produced that crewmates on the space station will use, and there's apps and products that crewmates on Spaceship Earth will use as well. And so um, there is a great number of projects that are going to make the world a better place that have stemmed from the International Space Apps Challenge, and I could talk about a few of those. But really, I, what I personally think is the most important product is the connections themselves, is the, pro the collaborative process itself. And I'll just, uh, if I could just take a couple of 
couple seconds to tell you the story of the first International Space Apps Challenge. I was at the San Francisco um, location, a tech shop there in San Francisco, and there was a project called the Pineapple Project. And what it was trying to do was use soil data, sat you know, satellite data, uh, weather data, soil data, uh, topography, elevation, and be able to have an app that farmers could use to know what type of crop to plant, when to plant it, how much to plant. Uh, and this is a critical tool for especially subsistence farmers. And so there were teams around the world. There was a team in San Francisco, a team in Tokyo, a team in Sao Paulo, and in Nairobi, um, on and on. And they would hand off, they would come together, uh, they would um, assign roles or assume roles and responsibilities. They would have quick Google Plus Hangouts or Skype calls to, to get together, see how everybody's doing. They'd go off and, and um, and do do their pieces of the puzzle and br bring them back together. Just watching that collaborative process was was absolutely incredible. And when the whole thing was over, uh, and they did, they won the award for the most disruptive. Um, there was not a, and even though there was not a product that came out of that space apps challenge, that the pineapple project has continued through. And I don't know if it's still here at this time, but it's continued through every space apps challenge. Um, for the last few years, it was picked up by an accelerator. Uh, it was picked up by a nonprofit or organization that, that's running with it. And when it was all said and done, and everybody was, you know, taking their picture with the pineapple and patting each other on the back, you know, virtually over the internet, they realized that nobody knew what anybody's profession was. That they just came together. They knew what they only knew what they were working on the pineapple project. And um, this was really interesting, which is that roles are assumed or roles are assigned not based on, on ex even experience or, or stature or, or what their job title is, it's based on their motivation and their passion and what they want to do. And that's, that has proven to be a really, really effective tool of innovation. And the connections that we're making through not only countries and cultures, but di di different disciplines that would never be made before uh, or never be made otherwise, uh, are, I think is a really incredible process. So. Probably a long answer, but I think it's important. Um, I don't work for NASA. I wish I did. I wish I was an astronaut. Um, but I worked for IBM. And one of the reasons that this great effort that NASA has, the sharing of their data is pretty amazing and their APIs. And so the reason that we're going to select 33 most innovative solutions is that so that we can help those folks become entrepreneurs and start businesses around their applications. So there will be great benefits for NASA, but I think for the world overall, we already found one yesterday in New York City that we're going to help around their business model. So the I think the reach of what NASA has done here is not just for space and not just for NASA. It truly is going to help change the world in many different areas, and it's going to kickstart so many entrepreneurs and being a Shark Tank nation and helping these women entrepreneurs is a pretty amazing thing. I feel like I didn't properly answer this. I'm going to two more seconds. Really and truthfully, our gift is the data and our gift is the innovation, the innovative process. And we want, it's, everyone wants NASA to use their solution, but we really want you to use the solution and you to create your company and you to go make gazillion dollars and then remember us <laughs> someday, you know. Uh, but that's really what this is about. And we do the legs of the innovation. We are trying to do more than host a weekend event. So we are really working for that infusion back into NASA and also the incubation acceleration at the local level. Super important to us. This is the fourth year. We're learning every year and we know there's so many, you know, thousands of solutions. We wish we could take them all, but we want you to take them all and we want to give you those tools so that you can go be successful. Then we're super thrilled that our data, seeds of NASA data, created this incredible harvest all around the planet. That's what, you know, and we'd love for everything to work, but we are thrilled that some of these things are working. Everyone, I wanted to actually share one story too. <laughs> so, so back in 2012, uh, the first year, the same, same year Ron was saying for the, the Pineapple Project. So here in New York City, uh, we had a lone uh, team member, one person started working on a project. Now to echo something Richard had said earlier, um, prior to this point, meteorologists all over the world had to use hand-drawn symbols on maps to, uh, 
to basically define cloud formations and different kinds of fronts and all sorts of other meteorological symbols. This woman, working by herself, spends an entire weekend creating a font library. Now, it doesn't seem like a big thing, but that changed everything. Like, the UK Met Office teamed with her, and now the meteorological, uh, meteorological office in the UK now is using this uh, project, which one person managed to change the world. You know, meteorologists all over the world can use this, this library now. It makes their lives easier. So even something as simple as that, one person working on a problem that just no one else has the time and resources to solve, is exactly why we're here. Hi, uh, I was curious as to what software languages and development tools you use on the Mars rover when similar projects that store. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it works. laughs> Dennis knows. <laughs> Do I, I don't know what they use on the rover, but I'm sure we can get you that information because people at NASA know that. Just <laughs> Not us. <laughs> uh, they, and they're the human spaceflight people, so right. just so you know, the rover people are the rover people. You know, you've got your own program, so the program, and that is actually software, sharing of software is another thing we need to tackle. So we are doing open software projects and the open source code at NASA, and working with the lawyers to make that available is always really fun. So what we're, there is a, for every different program in the tradition of NASA, you have your program money, your program people, your technical people all talk to each other. And they create what they need to do, what they need to do. And then side by side, we have all these programs. What we're doing in this the sharing economy that we're all in, and the new culture, is we're hoping as we go forward to have the shared software libraries within NASA and also the open. I mean, we can't share all of our software, but the ones that we can have, out, so we have a closed and an open. But even among NASA, um, software developers, we should be able to say, I'll take part B and part A of yours and part C and I'll write part Z, and we've saved the government money. So uh, this is this new, we're, we're all figuring out how to do this, and so it, we don't have the solution, but the solution is that we're talking and that we're having a conversation. And whatever we will make open and, uh, and share, we absolutely will. Great. Um, okay. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, but if anyone has any more questions, please come to me afterward and we'll help get you whatever info you need. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers again. Um, yes. And thank you all for coming. And everyone on the live stream, stay tuned. There's a lot of awesome stuff all weekend long. Thanks, guys.
yoga for unmanly people, no So we do do it, it's a little challenging to stretch without gravity. And in fact, when I first asked the question, spring stretching is really important and I'm not the most flexible person, um, they said, well, you know, it's not certified to stretch on the racks because they're not, we haven't analyzed those loads. And I figured they're analyzed for pretty big loads, both. So the secret is I did actually stretch in space. Um, but I think it's a very, you know, we actually have a lot of really interesting muscul muscular skeletal stuff that goes on up there. And I think that yoga it could be a really important part or especially noticing a lot of kind of back and neck kind of interesting things. We get taller, shorter, not just by going up, but then we exercise and we're in a harness and we're smushed down. So we're actually kind of doing that accordion thing every day. And so we're actually searching for ways to do better core exercise up there, maybe next year's challenge. <laughs> Somebody else? Yes. How much decompression time do you need when you return to Earth? And you could ask Ron, Karen, Nat, and uh, Richard as well. It's been four years now. I'm still working on it, but I think that there's the end is in sight. No, well, but seriously, you know, I think it's an experience that it takes a long time to come back from, and in some ways you never... I was up there for six, year, six months. Okay. Yeah, I was up there for six months. We sort of have a, a myth of the six-month mission in that you actually leave your home seven weeks before the six months starts. That would be adding two months in, in my sort of family clock anyway. Um, and then there's a lot, uh, there's about a month of, uh, you know, there's certainly more than a month of serious rehab when you get back and a lot of data takes and experiments. Okay, so now we're actually gonna start. Okay, so we're back, we're back on YouTube, right? Yep, okay. So, hi, my name is, uh, this comes up. my name is Gabe Perez-Giz. Um, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I'll be uh, emceeing the rest of the show today and we're gonna begin with a keynote address by Katie Coleman who I think you've already heard about uh, a lot during the press conference. She's flown uh, millions of orbital miles and thousands of hours on the ISS and on the space shuttle. Uh, she plays the flute in an astronaut band, all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, a, lot of other, a lot of which you can ask her about during the Q&A, but without further ado, Katie Coleman. Thank you. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about life on the space station partly because I wish I was still there. Uh, I was up there in, in 2010, 2011. Um, the last part of my mission, Ron Guerin, who's also running around here um, today, he was uh, on the same crew, so you'll see uh, his name on my patch as well, or my name on his patch, as he likes to say. And this was our home, and I just want to show you enough of what it was like up there to have you thinking, because you're problem-solving fascinating people to have you understand a little bit about our world so that you can help us with it and so it can make you think about life here on Earth as well. Uh, next, Kate. Uh, the space station is actually very big. You shouldn't feel small for us. It's sorry for us that, we s that we're in a really tiny little place because it's huge. It's like eight train cars all put together without the seats. It's just some of them are up or down or sideways. And it's a wonderful place. The whole no gravity thing the best part is that you fly from place to place, and I loved that. Next. I launched from uh, Baikonur in a Russian Soyuz in December of 2010. Next. We docked with the International Space Station. That is our Soyuz. It's about the size of two VW Bugs, where one, you know, the first end that actually docks the space station is, is uh, one part, it's kind of like a little orbital living room, and then the part that we have the three seats where we do actually sit very, very close. And for people who are taller than I am, like Richard Garriott, who also made his way to space, you have three astronauts here today. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty small, tight place to be, but we only spend, uh, actually it's less time than when Richard and I went. So when Richard and I went, we launched, it takes eight and a half minutes to get to space, and then you spend about a day and a half kind of getting everything set and making sure everybody feels great and you know just figuring everything out and then you dock with the space station but now they dock with the space station about 6 hours later and even though that's really nice to be able to get up to the big volume have the nice bathroom you know all those kinds of things 
Um, I really treasured that day and a half of three people who got to really actually have a little time to think about what they were about to go and do. And while they were thinking about it, you are orbiting the Earth in a very tiny little spacecraft, just you, not some big space shuttle that's like the size of an airplane, just you and your planet and your spacecraft. And I loved that. Next. This is uh, Dimitri Kondratyev in the middle and Paolo Nespoli, my crewmates. So we go up in threes. I, Ron Guerin is not in this picture. I told you I was in space with him. It's because I went up with these three people. Three people were there. We make six. That's patch number one. And then when three people come back, that are three people come home and three more go up. That was Ron and his crew. And that's how we form sort of combinations of six. Next. What happened? It's, no, it's good. It's good. So those are our two patches from our two missions. And I think that your teams here as a hackathon uh, are very similar to being on a space crew where, you know, in some ways you pick your teams, but in some ways you don't, where there's maybe somebody standing there and then they say, you know, I really think I should be on your team and then you have them. And you know, it's kind of like the teams that we have. We don't pick them, but for our mission, which is important, then we are a team and we have to figure out how to get the best out of everyone on the team. These are some of the exercises that we do ahead of time, practicing in the simulators, you know, for the small spacecraft, for the space suit. The space suit weighs about 300 pounds, so we practice in a pool. But now it's launch night and we are doing the final prep preparations, some really wonderful traditions by the Russians. I'm waving to my son who uh, looks very small there but is now taller than I am and I think in the Minecraft uh, uh, room. <laughs> as we speak, and we report in. I begged the guys to take small steps, and um, maybe slowly, but they kind of forgot. We were all a little nervous. Climb into this little bitty, actually the smallest elevator imaginable, and then the little bitty rocket. We are in the very top part of that, which is the uh, like a little triangle kind of part, not the tiny spiky long stick, but the part right underneath that. And every time I've done this, which is three, there is something just viscerally clear to you that leaving the planet is a really hard thing to do. And a lot of things have to go right. And those things are all things that scientists and engineers have designed. This is us up in space. This is my favorite scene in the movie where, I mean, it is flying from place to place. Don't you miss that, Richard? And speaking of flying, so we were in the beginning of the supply ship business. This is a Japanese supply ship. I was the second person to reach out using the controls of the ro robotic arm and capture a, a supply ship, which is the size of a school bus. I had very good space hair, as you notice. <laughs> All of us would have good, well, I don't know. Uh, Ron, Ron had good space hair too, but mine was better. This is another supply ship docking. So we had a lot of different missions coming. I'm gonna show you some pictures from supply ships in just a few minutes. This is the, the sort of new NASA where we have taken the things that we know how to do, which is bringing stuff up and down to space, low Earth orbit, our space station, and bringing people up and down to space. This is a visit from the space shuttle. And there, so you're looking at the tiny thing in the middle is the space shuttle and that is us on the space station. We are taking pictures of them. They are taking pictures of us. It's not just all for Instagram. Part of it is a formal documenting of the heat shield on the shuttle. It was probably the most nervous I was the entire mission in that you have to take hundreds of photographs in quick succession, all in focus. And, uh, and if you don't, then we have to take extra time when the space shuttle is docked to the space station to do those photographs. It's really, really difficult uh, to do. And, and so what did I do? I practiced. That's what we do for the hard things. We practice, practice, practice. And then you have to leave that nervousness behind because you know you've done everything you can to be prepared. So there's the space shuttle docked. Our crewmates are coming aboard. Steve Lindsay, my friend Nicole. Nicole Stott was the first person to capture a supply ship. And they brought up a big giant piece of the space station. And this shows you how wild everything behaves in space, including power cords. And this is our robot, Robonaut. Paolo and I unpacked him. He's, he's our assistant up there. We're learning what can humans and robots do. The robot is the one on the left. Now, 
in that picture, Scott Kelly is on board the space station again. Richard and Ron and I, who are here with you today, are insanely jealous that he is already back there. In that it, it's a magical place. It's a, it's a place where I felt privileged to be one of six humans that were, that were there. And, uh, and I just think there's a lot of really good work to do there. And yet, look at just all the detail in that picture. Look at the kitchen table at an angle, and you know, I'm doing some liquids experiments here. I mean, there's so many different things all over the space station. Most of them are not optimally designed, and that's where we could use your help to make our life simpler so that we can do the important work that can't be done on the ground. Next. So this is our crew, and uh, again, Scott on the right there. Uh, is uh, up in space again. He's part of a very important mission, the year-long mission, where he is going to be up there for a year to help understand the effects on the human body up in space. He has a twin brother here on the ground, and he will be sort of a ground test. We also do before space, during space, and after space tests, many, many, many tests. Uh, I myself, every time I would do a, a data take, it typically would be 20-something tubes of blood that they're taking to test all sorts of different studies that we're doing, many of which help you right back down here on Earth. Next. Uh, spacewalks uh, is what maybe what you think of up there that we're doing, and we do them when necessary. Unfortunately, we were very chagrined that there was no uh, emergency spacewalks on our mission. In fact, one night an alarm rang in the middle of the night, and we all, you know, come out of our little cabins. It's like phone booth size places. Four of us sleep at one end of the station, two at the other end. We meet in the middle at the main computer, and Scott, it was, it was the, Scott was the commander at the time. He looks at the computer and he goes, "Yes, it is a box out there on S zero, which translated means it's a really important, like physically box." It's got a lot of electrical and data connections in it, and it's gone belly up. And we are yet, we, and we are thinking, yes, spacewalk us, yes. <laughs> Minutes later, the ground calls. They say, oh, you know, that's what it is. Big box on S zero. We've got a spare out there. We just have to uh, send the commands to reroute, reroute power and data, and we'll be all set. You could go back to bed. We're like, thanks. <laughs> but you know what? It's it's about the mission, and you don't always get to choose what your favorite part of the mission is or even what you think is the most important. That's why we've got an army of folks down here to help decide those things. And an international space station, 16 different countries participating where we're doing experiments for all of those countries. Next. Uh, I wanted to real quick just show supply ship stuff because it's going to happen if everything goes right again starting Monday. So just a little view of that. You see the station. You see the robotic arm poking out. The little bitty thing against the background of the Earth, that is the school, school bus sized uh, supply ship. Next. S size of a school bus. Next. It's like you're driving down the highway at the same speed, and it's going to be like Indiana Jones you know, jumping into the next train because they're both going the same speed. Um, so reaching out, using the controls of the robotic arm to capture that. Next. This is Paolo and I in the cupola doing that together. Next. Uh, Nicole Stott, who was the first. Next. And a very cool picture. You, if you are from New York, may be in this picture. Can you check out the geography there? Do you see Long Island, New York City, right in back of the school bus size thing, right above the robotic arm? So this is New England in this picture. I looked out after I did this, and suddenly there it was. I grabbed the camera, took this picture. I um, mean, look down there. You see Lake Ontario. You see the Finger Lakes in wintertime. Next. So real quick, a preview for next week. SpaceX is going to launch a Dragon supply ship. And Samantha Cristoforetti Tara and Terry Verts will be the capture team. I'm pretty sure that Samantha is the one that will be operating the arm next. And there's uh, Samantha up in space. Next. And this is what this is what the last uh, dragon capture looked like. So they capture the supply ship. Next. Bring it onto the station. Actually, just locate it in place. Line it all up. Here's a lot of cool robotics for you, robotics challenge people. Next. Next. Just a different view of a different ship, but it just shows you what it looks like. Next. And. The unique thing about the SpaceX ships is that all that 
data that I talked to about understanding what happens to the body after a year or even after a few months up in space, you know, blood samples, urine samples, different things that are more timely that we want to get down to earth, we can't analyze up there. Um, different kinds of experiments, we're doing a lot of different experiments, we want the results uh, to be analyzed down on the ground. They can come down on the SpaceX capsule. When we come down, the three of us in the Soyuz, there's not really much room for anybody but us. Next. It's a marvelous, amazing uh, env microgravity environment. Uh, I think the thing to notice about this picture is that you see about six pieces of chocolate floating. You notice the other 24 of them are somewhere. It <laughs> doesn't take long for the supplies to get opened. <laughs> next. But mostly there's experiments and next. If this might not go. Sometimes this video doesn't go. Next. There's two of them. Yeah. Keep going. And keep going one more time. So this is why we go. Liquids. We need to understand what they want to do, both for going to Mars, understanding you know, how much fuel do you need for, for, to go to Mars, how do you measure it, those kinds of things, and also for us on Earth. Everything that involves flow through a pipe, we are doing our best, but we don't know everything. We know a lot about the main part of the flow. We don't understand what happens at the walls. Really small forces. You see these forces actually every day, whether it's rain on a car, whether it's spread out or curled up like a ball if it's a really clean car. Um, looking in your glass of milk or water or whatever else you have in your glass, you know, you see those liquid molecules climbing up the side of the glass, just at that very little edge, just right there. And it's because those liquid molecules want to be together, but they also like the glass. And so it's that, uh, that it's those, um, those forces, which are very, very, very small compared to gravity, that we don't get to understand because here on Earth we know what liquids are going to do. Wherever gravity is, that is where they're going to go down. And so up in space, we get to see what do they really want to do. Next. Combustion, same thing, where without much gravity, we can, it slows down the combustion process. Measurements that we have to take in less than a second to determine the slope of a line, we can take over 30 or 40 seconds up in space. And so we can, we're able to understand more about how combustion happens, how pollution happens, how soot is produ produced. All those kinds of questions are answered, are able to be looked at differently up there, and it gives us more possibilities for our research down here on the ground for understanding our use of fuel on the planet. Next. Crystal growth. Uh, Richard actually I think is going to, are you going to talk about crystal growth? Yep. Um, and so I'll just say that on the left is what I call the ugly earth crystal. Um, in the middle there or on the right is the beautiful space crystal. Because of the lack of gravity, we have the p possibility to form more perfect crystals and to build materials in a more perfect way, which can help us down on the ground to understand materials like protein crystals for designing drugs to cure diseases, like semiconductor chips, everything you want to be a crystal that you need to understand a structure. Um, those are the kinds of things we can do in a different way up there. Gives us more possibilities down here. Next. Uh, plants, going, growing plants for Mars. We're, we don't have a lot of spare power or spare water or good dirt. Well, there's places where at least one of those things is true, where they need to grow food down here on Earth, but also for our way to Mars. Next. A lot of human experiments. Next. Uh, the one I like to just point out because it's such an important thing is osteoporosis. Up in space, we are really exciting lab rats, okay? Because we lose bone 10 times faster than a woman who is 70 years old who has osteoporosis. What she loses in bone in a year happens to me in one month if I don't do anything. But the great news is, and I can only share my own data, is that I actually came back to Earth with the same amount of bone that I left with. It's probably not the same, and I will be a lab rat for NASA for my whole life. Every year I go and visit, and I've, every time any one of us has something taken out, everybody wants to see it. Um, but we are, we are, because those things happen so fast, and because we tend to have cleaner medical histories than your average 70-year-old um, woman with osteoporosis, and not, and not taking as many you know, medications maybe to keep us uh, together, 
we make really, really good data points to understand this really, really important disease. Next. It's quite a family up there. I, I love it that all of, there's so many of us get to go on the space shuttle. We brought a number of different kinds of people, and all of us bring different ideas and different passions to this business, to this place, which is a, as, um, as Ron says, well, this is, you know, the International Space Station, but down here on Earth, we are Spaceship Earth. Next. I, myself, am a musician, and not an amazing one, but an enthusiastic one. I brought flutes for the Chieftains, an Irish band. And next. And, you know, I've just, I've been having a little video problem. So you'll have to check this out on the web for yourself. If you look up Space Duet, I brought Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull's flute up there. And we did a little duet between Earth and space. And I can tell you exactly when and where it first was done. And that is because I was in space four years ago uh, to tomorrow. Well, I was yesterday, today too. But tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight. And Ian Anderson played a concert in Russia on that anniversary. And he uh, and I did this duet for the first time at that concert in Russia honoring Yuri Gagarin, who was the first person to leave the planet, but not the last. Next. That's our window from space looking out. Next. And a little perspective on how big we are compared to the Earth. Not so big. Next. This is really how the window is, in a way. And Rich what Richard talked about today, earlier in a press conference, about a program that he instigated because he wanted to be able to take certain pictures of the Earth, and he wanted them to be organized in a way he could do it really efficiently. And when I was taken to pictures of the Earth before that program, I ended up having to basically, OK, so let's see. It's going to be Long Island on the right, and this is on the left, and then I'm going to be upside down, which way is which. And this program makes it possible for all of us to take the pictures that we need of our Earth. Next. Next. See, it's true. Italy, indeed, shaped like a boot. And they are working on the Space Apps Challenge right now. Hello, Italy. <laughs> Next. And hopefully you are in this picture. Long Island, Cape Cod, Boston, Hudson River. Next. It's a beautiful Earth. Next. Well, just a little bit about landing, and then we'll uh, take a couple questions and go on to the next presentation. We're trying to get back on schedule. In this capsule about the size of a small smart car, we land in a parachute. Next. Looks bad, but actually that is science and engineering at work. There are thrusters that file, fire right before we hit the ground, because we're like falling, 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 even in a parachute, pretty fast, and then pssst, Supposedly, they call them soft landing jets. None of us will agree that that's a good name for them. But it's uh, softer than it would have been, landing jets. People ask me how the landing was. I say, solid. <laughs> Next. Science and engineering were at work again. You can see that part of the spacecraft has burned up. It was supposed to. A certain amount of it, we know how much to put on there. And, and if you look at the, the helicopters are there, they knew where to go, science and math at their best. We've worked all, out a lot of the details, and it happens pretty nicely these days. And at the same time, it's very complicated, as are most of the things that all of us in this room do, and certainly the things we do at NASA. And that's why we need you here at Space Apps Challenge to make our life easier and to take the good work that we do and take it further. Next. Next. Thank you for satellite phones, for letting me speak to my family. Actually, every day on the space station using an internet protocol phone, and then just a few minutes after landing in Kazakhstan. Next. OK. This is the, one of the last pictures. And I show you this picture of myself, my crew. That includes um, Scott Kelly, my commander, who's now up in space again, his twin brother, Mark, and Mark's crew, who was on the space shuttle, President Obama. When I was the age of all the people doing the hackathon here, of the younger ones, no one knew I was going to be in a picture this, like this. And 
we don't know who are going to be the ones to wear the suits of the future, who are going to be the ones to pave the path to the future. I guarantee you some of them, and many of them probably, are here today. So realize that we don't know what pictures will be composed like this in the future, but we have to have the tools that we need to be ready to be part of those teams. Next. We've got a lot of really cool things to do at NASA. We can't wait to do them, but the younger people, some of them who are, who are here, and some of whom I hope you'll reach out to, all of you hackers, when you go home, I hope, hope you will share this hackathon everywhere because especially the younger people we need. I would say the kids, you know, younger, but even, you know, 13, 11, 12, all those, those ages, next. We've got places to go in our space program and we appreciate all your help here at the Space Apps Challenge in helping us to get there and get there in a way that humans want to go. Thank you. So I'll take a few questions, but then I am here all weekend long, and I'll be walking around, and uh, I'll sign whatever needs signed. I'll take any picture with anybody. I am yours until uh, tomorrow when we give the prizes out. And uh, I'm happy to take a few questions. We may not have time for too many. We'll do a couple, uh, but just a brief announcement first uh, for people watching online. If you want to tweet some questions, we may take some questions from Twitter during the show. Just uh, put hashtag Ask Space Apps, and we'll be getting some stuff from the Twitter feed. And, and I'll be watching Twitter too, and I'll answer from Twitter. Any questions for Katie? Bruce Lincoln of Silicon Home. I want to ask a question if you know about this. I know that Vint Cerf is working on an interplanetary internet, the idea of an internet that can help um, facilitate communications both as you go back to the moon and as you go back to Mars. Can you talk about that at all, Katie? You know, I actually can't. I'm wondering if Richard, when he comes up, will be able to address interplanetary internet. Yeah, see? It takes a whole, and, and I'm informed we are working on it. <laughs> well, but you know, it's actually just not something that I know about. Um, I appreciate that Bruce is here from Silicon Harlem. Uh, he was at our, at our data boot camp yesterday, which was, if you were not here, if you didn't get to go or s go see it, go check it out online. And uh, summaries of it will be, I think, available. Uh, we, we filmed the whole thing. Hi. Um, Bruce, uh, the Internet Society, we have uh, an interplanetary chapter with Vint that are working on this delay tolerant networking and all this kind of stuff. Join the chapter, you can find all about it. Uh, they're going to have a, I, I'm going to look it up and present later because they're going to have, I think, in Washington, D.C. in June or sometime, they're going to have a whole conference on it. Thank you very much. See, you never know who's here and who's going to have what you need. But again, uh, for the data bootcamp, it was just a really inspirational thing where we tried to make sure that the hackers of tomorrow realize that they should actually be here today. but. And, and many of them came, and even more I think we'll have next year because suddenly they realized, and this was mostly girls under the age of 18, realized that this was for them as well and they had a place here. So I think that we probably need to uh, go ahead to Richard. Do you want to do one more? Well, I, um, unless you want to ask, I have, a, I have a question that I'm supposed to be asking for some fourth graders in Connecticut, which you made the uniquely uh, positioned answer, which is uh, when you play the flute in space, um, how does, it, how does it sound and the tonality of it compared in microgravity compared to when you play it on Earth? Any differences? Just like on Earth, it really depends where you play. Our places in our space station are different. If you play in the airlock, there's a lot of metal everywhere, or in the cupola, there's a lot of glass and so nice reflective sur uh, surfaces where it kind of echoes a little bit. And if you play in a place where it's all fabric, then it's kind of a little more of a muted, dead sound. What is distinctly different is I, I never really thought about the fact that the flute sits in your hands. And even if you watch videos of me playing on orbit, you'll actually see me kind of have to, like, before I play, sort of register it, put it in the right place, because it's just not, you're used to gravity doing that work for you. Cool. Any other questions? Or should we, do we have time for one more? Or no, we have to move on? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, guys. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> do you need to connect uh, a computer? Okay. Oh, we did. Right rare. side up. It was good.
no problem while you're, while you're powering up. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Richard Garriott, um, who's a, a video game developer um, and one of the founders of the uh, Ansari X Prize and Zero G Corp, who also became one of the first uh, civilians to go up into space and a second generation, uh, the first American second generation astronaut, I guess, right? That's right. Yep. Who was the first? Uh, Dennis Tito took my first seat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love power for everybody to get it. Uh -huh, perfect. No. And remember, if you have questions on Twitter, hashtag Ask Space Apps. You got this. All right, yes, okay, I'm all set. Perfect, okay, well thank you all in the internets and thank you all, all of you here uh, live in New York. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, both a private astronaut but, a, but an astronaut of a different type in the sense of, uh, if you heard me speak earlier in the press conference, my, my father was a more traditional astronaut, a NASA astronaut. He flew twice in space on Skylab uh, as well as the shuttle. But I flew uh, privately. I helped, uh, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, start part of the civilian space uh, industry by uh, helping to co-found the X Prize and building a company called Space Adventures, which has flown all private, all seven private citizens who have flown in space have flown with my company. But what I want to talk about is the new golden age of space flight that I think we're entering right now. That I think the the younger people here in this audience and the people building these space apps, uh, you know, you're going to get to participate in space at a time when I think it is particularly exciting. You know, 50 years ago, it was literally Sputnik that inspired my father to apply to NASA to become uh, an astronaut. And hang on, I'm getting a little bit of a blip on the video there. Looks like it's coming back. Um, and, uh, uh, and he actually had a, a laboratory at Stanford University that was one of the first and only groups to be able to listen to Sputnik as its beep, beep, beep went across the sky. And uh, he then said, you know, I want to be a part of that. And since he was a radio astronomer at the time, his skills were particularly useful. And he eventually flew twice, uh, first on Skylab and then on the, uh, on the space shuttle. And in that first decade, in the Apollo era, we did a lot. You know, we went from, you know, humanity never having put anything into space to walking, people walking on the surface of the moon. Uh, you know, a great, you know, a, really a stunning amount of achievement in a very short period of time. And that era also was very inspirational. Any of us that are any of us gray hairs in the room who might uh, remember uh, being around during the Apollo period, uh, you know, know how much that really uh, inspired everyone on Earth, but especially here in the United States. And it really caused, I actually think that's part of the reason there was a tech boom was riding on the heels of that great wave. But something was not achieved. And what, what wasn't achieved was we never achieved that Stanley Kubrick 2001 vision of the future. I mean, in the 80s and in the 90s, I, we literally thought that was going to be what we were all going to be doing in just a handful of years. But something happened. We, we, we never really made it. Uh, we do have a space station, but it, uh, it's not nearly that big, and we don't have uh, liners that take us back and forth to the moon. Uh, and what really happened was the reality set in of the difficulty of the current methods of reaching space. You know, space you know, rockets today are expensive. They're fairly dangerous. And when you put those two things together, it's understandable that therefore they'll be pretty rare. And for the last 30 years, we've basically been stuck in low Earth orbit. And you know, even this marvelous space station that uh, you know, three of us here today have had the, jet, the great pleasure to go up and, and, and live aboard, you know, if you do the economic analysis, you know, it costs us almost $100 billion to put it in orbit. It costs us $2 billion a year just to keep it in orbit. On the shuttle, it costs somewhere you know, north of $100 million per astronaut to put them onto the space station. You know, when it's that expensive and that dangerous, uh, it makes sense that uh, you know, we, we don't do it very much. And, and, and frankly, public support, public interest and support for what was going on in space over that same 30-year period was lackluster. And in fact, if anything, was trending downwards. And the congressional appropriations to space was, had always been trending downwards. And, uh, and while that's all been true, I don't think it needs to be true. And I think we're at a stage now where we're reversing that trend very rapidly with some really exciting results. In fact, 
I would actually argue that you know, my own journey and that of, uh, of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and many of the other competitors for the XPRIZE, these are all people who were inspired by Apollo in the first place to go into a lot of these digital STEMI kind of things. We're not kind of circling back and re-participating in the thing that kicked us off in this first place, which was space. And, you know, and for me, you know, I, I grew up in a, a, a household where not only my dad an astronaut, but literally my left and right neighbors were astronauts. I just assumed, you know, when everybody grew up, you go to space because <laughs> that pretty much was the case. And, uh, but a NASA doctor told me that because I wore glasses that I was no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And at the age of 13, I was crushed. Uh, and I felt like I was kicked out of the club that my parents and neighbors were all members of. And I vowed that one day I was gonna fly into space privately since I was not you know, gonna be accepted as a NASA astronaut. Uh, and of course, at the age of 13, you don't really do much towards that. Uh, and in the meantime, I got about, uh, I was very lucky to find my way into a new career which was writing computer games. And um, with my father as an astronaut, my mother as an artist, uh, I think of computer games as the quintessential high-tech art. Uh, and I had, a, so far I had a great career and I still make computer games. If you, if you haven't played it in my Ultima series of computer games, which I'm probably best known for, the term avatar, which you probably have heard, it was created in my games. Uh, the, the top popular category called massively multiplayer games, where everybody plays through the internet together in one central server, virtual world. I created that category of games. Uh, and that, has, that success in gaming has funded my ability to invest in exploration companies, specifically trying to get myself back into space or up into space. And while I've had many failures along the way, I kept at it and kept getting smarter and kept reapplying new solutions. And uh, most recently, you know, did those things you heard me mention, the XPRIZE and Space Adventures, which ultimately opened the door. <clears throat> and then finally on October 12th, of, uh, five years ago, I managed to make my uh, first, hopefully not last, uh, off-planet trip, uh, and I became the 483rd person to, to leave the Earth. And, uh, and since my father was an astronaut, as you know, uh, I became the first generational American to fly in space, and I flew actually in space with the first generational Russian. So, uh, and since then, there's been one more. So there's now three second-generation uh, astronauts at this point. And uh, and far from being a space tourist, which is how private citizens are often referred to, I definitely do not believe I was a space tourist. I use the term private astronaut. I think I did a very serious, very heavy load of commercial and scientific work. That's just some of it. Uh, and, and in particular, we talked about, we were, uh, Katie was talking about some uh, uh, protein crystal research that she did. Uh, my father helped champion that on his shuttle flight. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we've actually flown the experiment that I flew, just flew on a Dragon capsule just some months ago, uh, and it continues to fly, uh, developing uh, uh, results that uh, we believe are, are highly valuable for uh, pharmaceutical companies. I mentioned in the press conference another thing that I did, uh, which was to take, uh, I wanted to take pictures of the same targets my father took on Skylab, because Skylab was the first time we had people on orbit taking pictures of the Earth, uh, prior to Skylab, people were on their way to the moon and back. And so the, from, from a photographic archive of humanity looking at the Earth, Skylab was the first data set we have. And as my father's son, I wanted to go back 35 years later and take some of the same shots. But the problem is, there was no tools that existed for me to load up that data into uh, to be able to know what to take pictures of from space and what lenses to use at what moments in time and which direction to look. Uh, and so I actually helped develop a piece of software that overcomes this problem. You know, when you want to take a picture out the window, the pr pr previous way was you would get a printout that looked like this. It would, the yellow arrow shows you where you're flying across the Earth. You might be want to take a picture of Perth so you can kind of orient your body and go, okay, well that's going to be on our left side, and it's going to be somewhere near 6:20 p.m. But you know, good luck watching your watch and what's out the window and orienting the piece of paper and it looking even similar enough to recognize. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there was a piece of software that the Russians had developed, but it was running on a machine that was not near the window. You couldn't take it to the window. And it didn't have a lot of these capabilities. Uh, and in fact, if you're looking out, like if you're gonna take a picture of Everest, where you're going like, well, there's a bunch of mountains down there. Which one you know, am I supposed to take a picture of? And so this is the tool that I helped develop. It's called Windows on Earth. It had a scrolling kind of Google Earth map view of what's out the window. It showed you the red circles were exactly what targets you wanted to take. The size of the circle was what lens you needed to use. 
uh, had countdown timers on that right band to show you, you know, which targets were coming up in certain numbers of minutes. Uh, and the bottom band was even showing you multiple orbits ahead, kind of the density of targets that were upcoming so you could know if you could take a break or something to uh, uh, you know, go to the bathroom or something if you needed to. Um, and that software was actually so successful that my crewmates who were used to using pieces of paper, I had loaded all their targets into my software before we went up. Uh, and they quickly realized that they no longer wanted the pieces of paper. They wanted my software at my window. And so you can see uh, uh, it's sitting there uh, just to the right of center of the screen is my software. Uh, and they all called, they claimed uh, uh, precedence of, of uh, seniority on me, kicked me out of the window, used my software, and, and, and I, I was left to take pictures of them instead. And here's why I think we're now going to this golden era and the part that I think all of you can play. You know, NASA, clearly the, the spin-offs of NASA technology uh, is enormous. And if you study it in detail, you can see that. But the general public doesn't see it nearly as well as those who are in the industry. And when you're doing something like Apollo, uh, the inspiration value is pretty self-evident and it's, a, it's such a big deal, everybody's watching on television. But now, space launches are so frequent uh, that they are rarely covered even on television, uh, much less that most people will be, be watching it. And so inspiration, I think, is no longer enough. Uh, I think we really have to get into a mode where uh, the return on investment from a taxpayer perspective is much more obvious than it has been in the past. And fortunately, I think we're going there quickly. But here's the problem we're up against. Uh, you know, if you look at every other form of transportation other than rockets, so planes, trains, cars, and boats, they all cost you about three times as much as the fuel costs you to operate. So if I put 100 bucks of, ga of, of, of gas in the tank, I'm gonna spend another $300 on depreciation and insurance and maintenance. And, uh, and the reason why that's true for all other forms of transportation is because they're all completely reusable, right? You, uh, when you go fill up your car with, with gas, let's suppose it was more like a rocket to where you fill up your car with gas and the first thing you do is crush the car, buy a new car, and fill it up with gas. Well, now your $100 tank of gas has also become a $100,000 car at the same time. And guess what? No, none of us would do very much driving if that was the case. And that's basically where we are right now. It, it, it's literally about 100 times. The multiple of the fuel is, uh, to the cost of the flight is about 100x. Um, but that's changing very rapidly right now. Uh, for example, you know, the SpaceX uh, vehicles are already very efficient. Uh, they've taken the price per person from 100 million, maybe down to 20 million for their first vehicles are going up. Uh, as they're getting their first stage and even their capsules to be reusable, that price should come down into the ones of millions. So already, by the way, we're going from hundreds of millions to ones of millions. That's already profoundly better. Uh, and it's important to point out, like on my mission, I paid a few tens of millions to go on my flight, but I earned back a few ones of millions. And so as soon as the price of access is down to the ones of millions, I'm going back every chance I get because I make a profit at it. And you all are at least as good as entrepreneurs as I am. And so odds are you'll be thinking of reasons to fly your own selves into space once the price gets that low. But it's actually gonna go even lower. Uh, oh, and by the way, SpaceX on Monday is making their third attempt at landing their first stage. So we'll hope that that goes well. But it actually, the theoretical floor is actually even lower than that. And there's companies now building next generation propulsion, which is gonna reduce the cost of access to space by yet another order of magnitude. Uh, and if you think about most, most rockets, all rockets for the past 50 years have been chemical rockets. And that means you carry the fuel and the oxidizer and tanks on board. And 85% of the mass of a rocket is fuel and oxidizer. That only is 12% for the superstructure that holds all together. And that only is 3% for the payload. And we need, so that's, that's one of the major reasons for this, uh, this, up, this upside downness in, the, in the, the pricing structure. And so one of the ways to do that, one of the ways to fix that is instead of carrying your fuel and oxidizer with you to create the energy you need to eject something out the back at high velocity, you instead beam the energy from the ground. And so by beaming energy through some, either lasers or uh, more common case I think now is high power microwaves, Instead of carrying fuel and you, you reduce the, the weight of that fuel and oxidizer, you get rid of it, uh, and that lets you spend much more of that uh, mass on payload and superstructure. And in fact, when you're beaming energy, you're only limited by how much energy you can beam, not by how much energy you can carry. And so it actually makes vehicles that are more powerful and much lighter at the same time. 
And there's a, a couple of examples of this electromagnetic propulsion being built. One is already being flown up the, this uh, Vasimir uh, uh, ionic engine uh, that is l very efficient, but only puts out a very small amount of thrust. And so it's great for once you're in space to either keep the space station up or maybe go to Mars and you can leave the engine on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it'll cut the t journey time to Mars to about 39 days as opposed to nine months. Um, and there's one that actually my wife is working on. She's now president of a company called Escape Dynamics and they're building a school bus sized space plane. <laughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> a school bus sized space plane that they will take grid electricity store it in batteries over a few hours, dump that energy out of those batteries very quickly over about five minutes, put that energy through high power microwave sources, beam it to the belly of that, that aircraft. There's a two meter wide by six meter long heat exchanger on it. Uh, hydrogen flows through that, gets super, super heated, much hotter than you would get out of just combustion. And it ejects out the back at even higher velocity than you would get out of combustion. And you're not carrying any fuel or oxidizer on board. And so it makes a little vehicle like this, a little space plane. It still has a large tank for that hydrogen that it's going to shoot out the back. Uh, but it means that you, uh, the price per kilogram, for example, today, if you want to send a CubeSat that weighed one kilogram, the price, the average price is about $50,000 per kilogram. On my wife's vehicle that you see right here, the price will be $250. The price for a human body at that rate is $15,000. So we're going to go from a hundred million to fifteen thousand dollars and I'm sure you can do that math and go a you could probably go yourself just literally with the money you saved up over a few summers a and or if you've got some real work to do it's like completely uh, a no longer an issue and so that's the future that I sincerely believe is coming uh, that you all will get the chance to par participate in is looking at this curve of the cost, and that's a, a, a logarithmic curve there. Uh, and so the pr price is dropping very, very fast. Uh, and the, the, you know, the theoretical floor of even chemical rockets will now be exceeded with electromagnetic rockets. And as soon as we get the you know, re re returns greater than the price, obviously all of us, uh, I, I expect, will be going quite a bit. And so here's how I think that's going to unfold. You know, we're already at the point where suborbital rockets are being built. Uh, uh, you know of Virgin Galactic, of course, and probably XCOR and Mastin, uh, but also uh, Blue Origin. Uh, Jeff Bezos' company just announced they're going to start their suborbital test program uh, here in the next uh, months. Uh, you know, the Google Lunar X Prize is already going back to the moon. Uh, there's a number of teams that are competing for that prize, and I actually already have property on the moon. I purchased Lunacod 2 that is on the moon, I purchased from the Russians, and so one of the bonus prizes is to go land by an existing artifact, and the Russians and the Americans have already said, don't land near ours. So Mine is actually the target, so we'll have a little private exchange on the, on the moon. You know, Bob Bigelow is going to be flying a private inflatable space station com component to the space station as an extra lab uh, later this year. And, uh, and while flying, uh, you know, on the press conference, people were talking about the red tape and legal issues of getting things through the governmental structure. Well, now we're going to have a private option on the side, so that's going to make it much easier and cheaper to, uh, uh, to get uh, uh, experiments performed on the space station as well. And that's uh, gonna bring back again more things like these protein crystals. Uh, there's companies uh, back in Austin that are doing uh, vaccine development. Uh, you probably have heard that Google and others are putting up now constellations, like internet constellations in low earth orbit. Uh, these are actually, uh, what's happening is there's a transition from, instead of sending giant satellites all the way to geosynchronous orbit, instead send a fleet of very tiny satellites that uh, if one breaks its throwaway and you throw up another one, put them in a constellation much closer to the Earth, you get shorter ping times, uh, you get closer views, uh, the vehicles are more disposable, uh, it's a lot cheaper to get there, and the, and the price can keep coming down. And so all of these kinds of experiments you can do much closer to the Earth are now gonna think gonna be, the, in fact already are, the, the growing, the fastest growing segment of things we have in space. Uh, even space-based solar power, I think, is now going to finally going to become popular with this cheap access. Um, I'm uh, one of the uh, co-founders and investors in a company called Planetary Resources. We're actually going to go mine asteroids, which uh, I can talk about later if anybody's interested, that I think is also going to be particularly valuable. You know, there's lots of asteroids out there, and many of them are the metallic cores of protoplanets that were broken up during the early formation of the solar system. Uh, and have lots of platinum, for example, on them, as others have lots of water on them. 
Uh, many of them hang out very close to the Earth. You know, there's these things called Trojans that are orbiting the Lagrange points. And, uh, and so they're actually much easier to reach than the moon because there's no real gravity around them. You know, we have to worry about planet defense these days. We've actually already had a number of, uh, you know, newsworthy meteors have entered the Earth's atmosphere, but there's much bigger ones that we know are going to come very close to the Earth. So, you know, uh, in 2029, uh, you can look at this one called Apophis. It's going to come mighty close to the Earth. See how, see how, notice, notice how much closer than the moon's orbit that is. And it's going to come so close, the Earth's actually going to deflect its uh, path through space uh, substantially. Uh, my company, Space Adventures, already has two clients signed up to go around the moon on a free return trip around the moon. Uh, Dennis Tito, the guy that flew with us first, is, got a, is sponsoring a thing called Inspiration Mars, which is trying to do a flyby of Mars uh, in 2021. You know, NASA has its flexible path to, to Mars that includes stop-offs at asteroids. You may be able, may even stop off, uh, you know, at uh, the moons around Mars, or uh, maybe go to Europa to look for life under the water. And then, uh, then we get to the big target that everybody now talks about, which is Mars. And so I've gone from, in 10 years, I've gone from believing we were never going to get to Mars, at least within my lifetime, uh, because even though a president might stand up and say, let's go to Mars, a 30-year, 30 $30 billion project has no political way to even start funding, much less continue it through economic ups and downs and regime changes. Uh, but uh, I think we finally now have gotten to this flexible path and this proper private uh, public partnership route uh, that I think has finally put us inexorably on the path to reach Mars. So I think that now it finally uh, I've reversed my skepticism, my skeptic opinion into believing that now we will get there. And in fact, you know, my company Space Adventures has already risen to being the sixth largest space agency on Earth. And so uh, by the number of people flown, and we actually have another, our next client, Sarah Brightman is in Russia right now training for a flight this fall. And so, uh, so this really can be done. So thinking that, thinking that space was you know, expensive and difficult and thus rare, which it was, thinking that that was however inevitable or going to remain true would, would be wrong thinking. We're now really truly are entering a new golden era of human space exploration, I believe, and I think the only decision that lies before you all is what part do you want to play? So thanks. <laughs> and we'll see if, they've, if I've left any time for questions. Do we have uh, time for a question or two? Do we have any questions? Oh, and the blue shirt, go wait for the mic. So all of this sounds very exciting, and I can see how the technology will allow us to get into space and different companies, both you know, private and public, will build the craft to get there. Um, do you see any uh, issue with <coughs> conflict in terms of who will actually uh, drive these spaceships, right? If you look at commercial airlines, a lot of the pilots come from the Air Force, the Navy. I mean, there's some from private areas, but it's mostly from the military because that's, they have the background to fly. Is that what would happen here where all the astronauts you listed would then start doing this privately, taking people up, or how would that work? Well, well the good news is that a space crew needs a variety of skills. Uh, you know, when I went to my own training, I actually had to take all the same courses as any other astronaut or cosmonaut had to pass all the same courses. But, but everyone has to pass them to the first level of, which is called user. It means I'm qualified to use, any, in an emergency, I can use any of the equipment. One person on the crew has to be the expert on each system. And it doesn't have to be the same person, but you can't put a crew together unless there is one person who knows how to repair the radio if it breaks, and another person who knows how to repair the toilet if it breaks. And so uh, for most professional astronauts and cosmonauts, they want to become an expert on as many of those as they can because it means they can be assigned to any crew. And in fact, uh, it hardly matters who else is assigned to their crew if they're, if they're an expert level on all those systems. Whereas I had to fly with experts in all those other systems. And so when you get to the, you know, so if you think of that, that analogy of you know, military test pilots, someone on the team is going to likely have that kind of background. However, we're now past the age, you know, most all these vehicles are not completely automated. The Soyuz is 100% automated. You, in theory, could take over and try to fly it manually. You really wouldn't want to. It'd be very dangerous to do things manually on, on that vehicle. 
And so it's really entering data, confirming the data from the ground, and punching the go button. Uh, over and over, and over. there's a lot of it, and you're monitoring lots of systems, so you know, you have an abort button, you can override it if you ever decide you need to, but, uh, uh, but you're gonna see that, uh, you know, since a lot of the work that's being done now is science, uh, there's gonna be people from all walks of life and all fields of science, in addition to some who will come on as the, the, the stick jockey. Someone else? I, uh, really interesting talk. So you um, you write here now. What part will you play? Can you describe some of the parts? Do you think are available? Yeah, you know uh, it, what's interesting. What I found was interesting in uh, my journey because I, my journey is very non-traditional, you might say. Um, and I think that the the first thing, like for the app developers, what I said uh, to uh, some folks earlier today is, is that uh, the best thing to do is cozy up to the space industry and look for the, the failure points. And for me, the first opportunity was, for example, the piece of software to be able to photograph targets out the window with some level of reliability and speed uh, because everything's scheduled so tightly. And there were tons of moments like that. Uh, there, you know, there, if, you, if you look at the space station, uh, when things were built in the old ways, that means they're built very conservatively and with tons of red tape and it means everything is pretty old, and it means nobody's willing to do anything that is newfangled uh, because it doesn't fit the pattern. Uh, and what's happening now is the commercial guys are coming in and saying, you know, screw that, we're just gonna go do it and you know, pay us if we get you there. Uh, but, they're, they're little, but, they're, but they're all over the map. Like for example, another one that they came up when I was flying is, uh, if, if I wanted to take my iPhone to keep my schedule on, or a little Microsoft uh, you know, watch to keep my calendar on, the answer was I, I was not allowed. And the reason why I wasn't allowed is they were worried about glass breaking on the front of something. By the way, there's tons of glass already up there, so it, that's really irrelevant. And the other reason was there is a, uh, a lithium ion battery in here that's not space rated. And so they wanted to pull the batteries out, put on a separate battery pack on the back, and rewire it manually. And for all of that qualification, they want to charge about 100 grand. And then beyond that, by the way, there's no 110 volt outlet, nor is there a 12 volt outlet. There's 100 volts DC and there's 24 volts DC are the only two power outlets on board the International Space Station. So anything that needs to be powered into the wall has to have a custom uh, char charger that is built that also has to be rated, which also costs another $100,000. And so I'm going, you guys are, you know, this is idiotic that we're, that, you know, and when I talked to my father about this, who's an astronaut, he, by the way, if he was, stand I, I gave a speech with him yesterday, he would give this, he would, he has the opposite impression of me going like, when you're already talking about spending billions, you know, who cares if you're gonna spend 100 grand on a you know, charger? And I'm going like, well, that's the point. We're not trying to spend billions. You know, we're trying to use things that are off the shelf as much as possible, and so it does matter, in my mind, that we you take everything down to you know, operate as close to the way it does on Earth as possible. So once you cozy up to these systems, you see these inefficiencies all over the place, and that's really, I think, the opportunity for, for all of us is to go fix those things and make them, you know, Bring them back into alignment with you know normal life. We've got a question. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I wanted to <laughs> thank you for being so inspiring. Um, I'm a huge so Lord British fan. Thank you. Since my childhood. Um, so um, I'm actually part of the hackathon here, and we were spinning a, a around a problem with uh, around um, an app, app idea around visualizing uh, the problem of low orbit space debris. So I was wondering what's your opinion <coughs> on that and most specifically on the Kessler syndrome. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it. It's kind of like the exponential problem of having junk up there ex right. essentially uh, leading up to more and more junk. Right. And how dangerous that is. What, yeah. Yeah. What okay. So yeah, great, a great thing, by the way, for an app to do. So I, first of all, I applaud your, uh, your vision to take, tackle that problem. Uh, you know, the space station is actually moved three or four times a year on average uh, in order to get it out of the way of a potential collision with debris. And that's the debris they can see. And what I mean by see is NORAD tries, or you know, some part of the government tries to radar, identify, and track as much of this debris as they can, uh, but they can only track it down to, you know, the tip of your thumb or somewhere in that, somewhere in that order of magnitude uh, size piece of debris. And, uh, and, and as you were mentioning, if you think about uh, debris or meteorites for that matter, you know, there's fewer giant ones and more and more smaller ones. So the smaller meteorite or the smaller piece of debris 
uh, you tend to go much higher in frequency. And if you go on the space station, some of the modules were launched 10, 12 years ago, and some are brand new. If you look at the brand new ones, their windows are perfectly pristine and clean and clear. Uh, but if you go to the original ones, they're pockmarked, like you were driving your car and got hit by rocks, but they're pockmarked uh, with a lot of pockmarks. And so the oldest windows, you know, that might be, you know, 10 centimeters or so around, have 10 to 100 little scratches, you know, on them. And, uh, and those are from things about, you know, size of a paint, which you could never track. But something the size of a BB would actually go through a spacesuit and the astronaut en route. And, uh, and you can't see those, th that level of debris. So that's one of the reasons spacewalks are particularly dangerous is because of the potential debris impacts. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if, if you watch the movie Gravity, uh, you know, one of the interesting things, they didn't really talk about much in that, that movie, but it was, and while they took a lot of artistic license in many areas, uh, you know, one of the interesting truths is that if you're in orbit with a piece of debris, you're both going around the Earth every 90 minutes uh, when they use 90 minutes in their movie, but actually you'll probably re-encounter things about every 45 minutes on each opposite side of the Earth. You'll re, uh, you know, come close to uh, having a collision. Um, and so, yes, this orbital debris is a huge issue, and that's actually one of the reasons why the space station uh, uh, is, is so low. By putting it not way out in space, but very close to the atmosphere, slight, slightly in the atmosphere, it means they have to keep boosting it to keep it from falling into the atmosphere, but it also means that any debris that is in that same orbital slot, will, its orbit will degrade, and, uh, and eventually it'll re-enter. But that tends to help keep it clean around the space station. Uh, but as we go further into space, this is gonna become a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, and as more things break, uh, it's gonna become a bigger, it already is becoming a bigger, bigger problem. Okay, we've got a question over here. So do you think that New York could become a space hub just like DC or Southern California? And if so, um, in which ways your, the organization that you work for could help this happen? Yeah, so what's interesting about New York, so I'm a relatively recent transplant here to New York. And, uh, uh, and so when you say hub, there's two kinds. There's a spaceport, and then there's the hub of development. Uh, space, uh, New York is actually not going to be a great place for a spaceport just because of the population density, and people aren't going to like you to accidentally drop rockets on people's heads. Uh, but as a, a hub of, of intellectual uh, activity, I think that actually New York can be great. Uh, I can only give you anecdotal evidence as to this con of what needs to happen based upon my experience in the computer gaming field, which is related to technology evolution. W one of my disappointments originally when I came here to New York was that you know while in Austin, Texas, which is a great hub of creativity and art, uh, everybody was doing original intellectual property and creating original games and really moving uh, the art form and the technology form forward. When I arrived in New York, I found that most software developers in New York, to me, appeared to be doing things like advertising apps for the Martha Stewart show. Uh, and while that's a perfectly fine app to make, it's really made to, uh, as a marketing move, to take advantage of intellectual property. And New York felt to me like more of a, a financial deal place rather than a true technological innovation environment when I arrived. Now, that's what I think New York is trying to change and I now see a, a bigger grassroots group uh, coming in behind that saying, we're no longer happy to just do work for hire from a marketing agency. We actually wanna do true uh, technological advancement within these, uh, these fields. Uh, and so I think uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Can New York do it? Absolutely. Uh, are they there yet? Uh, I would say not quite yet. I heard uh, on the press conference that New York is billing itself now as already the number two in the world after probably Silicon Valley. Uh, I haven't seen that data yet, but that bodes also obviously very well for New York. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited to see things like, uh, you know, you have a spacesuit maker, you know, here in, in town. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, you know, a number of uh, biological research uh, companies here in town that are doing space work. Uh, so you have the right foundation, you have the right youth kind of growing up and into it. Uh, so I think just stay focused on it and give it a few years and uh, New York should emerge uh, very strongly. Okay, well, I, I'll bet I've used more than my time. I'll, I'll come over and talk to you afterwards uh, as well. So uh, I'll be here. I'm not in a hurry to head out. I'm going to go down and visit with the students as well, or the, if not just students, but all the people making the apps. So uh, thank you so very much for listening to me today. Thanks. Thanks.
Spaceship Earth, and these are all my crewmates. Off. Lift up of the Soyuz rocket as Ron Garin, Alexander Semakutyayev, and Andrei Borisenko begin their journey to the International Space Station. Shuttle Station Complex is orbiting 245 miles over northern Iraq. Garin uh, in the process of attaching a portable foot restraint to the end of the Canadarm 2. There's your signature view, Ron Garin holding on to the pump module and its support equipment. We're headed down to Atlantis's payload bay. Nice looking spaceship you guys got here. Why, thank you. Sweet ride. Looking back, at our planet for months at a time really gives you the sense that we all live on a living, breathing organism. And looking at this beautiful sight from space, this oasis that, that we've all been given, really makes you think, you know, why do we still face so many critical issues? Why do we still face so many problems? Why is not life on our planet as beautiful as our planet is visibly beautiful from space? When we look down at the beauty of the planet that we've been given, we are faced with an undeniable sobering contradiction. On the one hand, we can clearly see the beauty of our planet. On the other hand, are the unfortunate realities of life on our beautiful planet for a significant portion of its inhabitants. Those who don't have clean water to drink, enough food to eat, the poverty and the conflict that exists on our planet. When we look down from an orbital perspective, we realize that each and every one of us is riding through the universe together on this spaceship that we call Earth, that we're all interconnected, that we're all in this together, and that we're all family. You don't have to be in orbit to have the orbital perspective. And there are people around the world that are working to reduce conflict and improve life on Earth. Here's Ron. How about now? Okay, cool. So I, I wanted to show that uh, video for a number of reasons. One, one is, um, you know, I'm going to show you, we're going to take a journey to space and back, and I'm going to show you some really cool pictures and really cool um, videos and I think all of the videos and all the pictures that you see are contained in this book that, that I just launched a, a few weeks ago. But the other reason why I wanted to show you that is because um, the International Space Apps Challenge is a big part of the book. The International Space Apps Challenge is a big part of the solutions that we're proposing, uh, a solution that leads to better collaboration around the world. So, um, so I know that Katie spoke earlier and uh, I wasn't able to be in here for her talk, so she didn't tell any stories about me, did she? Because she, we spent two months together in space, so 
I so many stories. Uh, man. But did you tell some? No, <laughs> I hope not. Um, so I wanted to um, to just take the, take this moment. You know, we I talked a little bit earlier about how this is the 35th anniversary of Apollo 13's launch uh, today, and how Apollo 13 ended up being NASA's first hackathon, where a group of, of um, unsuspected people came together to solve an unsuspected problem or uh, un, un, um, you know, and a problem that really caught them su by surprise and they had to hack a solution together in a really short amount of time. Um, and we are basically hacking the solutions to the problems facing our planet on Spaceship Earth. And so um, I want to frame the conversation along the, uh, the framework of the, of the book. And the book is, is broken into three sections. Each section has three chapters. The first one is looking skyward. Uh, then there's looking earthward, and then looking forward. And in looking skyward, um, this picture, by the way, uh, was taken, uh, it's, this is the International Space Station, it was taken by um, the crew of a Soyuz spacecraft that was departing the space station. And Katie was on that crew, uh, as well as um, uh, Paolo Nespoli, who, t who took this picture, and Dima Kondratov, who was flying the, uh, the Soyuz spacecraft. And, uh, I was on the space station as well, as you could see, uh, Space Shuttle Ende Endeavor docked to the space station there. But this, as I said, is the International Space Station. It was built by 15 nations. Uh, some of these nations weren't always the best of friends. Some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race. And the, I, the goal of the first section of the book is to bring this international cooperation, uh, this international collaboration, and bring it down to Earth and put it into the context of our rapidly developing, hyper-interconnected global society. Uh, and to basically prove uh, or demonstrate that if, hey, look, if we can do this in space, if we can build arguably the most complex, complex uh, complicated structure ever built and build it in space, imagine what we can do by working together to solve the problems facing our planet. In the next section, looking earthward, we take the focus and we turn it around and we point it back on Earth. And I don't think the, the orbital perspective was born out of any single moment in space, but there are moments that when taken in the context of many, many months in space, I think really led to this uh, interesting vantage point, it led to this in interesting perspective that um, I think could have a profound positive effect on our global society. And so rather than, than just try and uh, describe in words, which took me you know, a bunch of chapters in a book to describe, I wanted to uh, show it to you. So about a month before, I returned to Earth. I flew to a place on the space station called the Cupola. Now, the Cupola is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station. And I went there because I wanted to take some pictures for a time-lapse video project that I was working on. And that was a picture of, of me in the Cupola that you saw. And while I was taking these pictures, this picture really caught my eye. And as you can see, there's this illuminated line that's snaking across hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, across this large landmass. And I didn't know what that was. Uh, I've always been one of these astronauts that say you can't see any borders from space. Apparently I'm wrong because what this actually is, is the man-made border between India and Pakistan. And seeing that from space had a profound effect on me. Um, this represented to me a scar on the otherwise beautiful landscape. It represented to me a barrier and a boundary to collaboration that was keeping creative, innovative people on both sides of that line from being able to work together to solve the problems that they face in the same geographic location. And it really drove home this fact that when we look at things from the orbital perspective, or if we look at things from the perspective that each and every one of us is riding through the universe together, that we're, we are all interconnected, that we all are, all, all of us are in this together, and that we're all family, um, we can practice something called elevated empathy. We could, we could practice uh, a philosophy whereby we, there, we don't look at things two-dimensionally. We don't look at things as, as there's an us and there's a them. Uh, we just look at us. We just look at our one planet and our one people that are on this planet. And you know, when we look down, if you look at the beauty that of our planet, you know, when we look down at that, we really are faced with this sobering contradiction between the beauty on one hand and the unfortunate realities of life. And the International Space Apps Challenge is really uh, doing great things to help shorten that gap, to help try and make life as beautiful on our planet as it is visibly beautiful from space. And I launched into space in, you know, my last mission in 2011 with this belief that we have all the resources, we have all the technology necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. And I spent a good portion of any spare time I had while I was on the space station 
uh, pondering the question, if that's true, then why do we still face so many critical issues? And I think one of the primary reasons why we still face so many critical issues and, and challenges and problems is because of our inability to effectively collaborate on a global scale. We today are, are effectively collaborating on a global scale. So we are overturning that, um, that, that problem right now as we speak uh, in, in, our, in this particular way. Um, and so in the third section is looking forward. Um, and this picture, by the way, was a picture I took in 2011. It shows Ethiopia and Yemen uh, and Somalia. And you know, it's a, I, I think it's a really beautiful picture. But if you were to zoom into the microscopic details of this picture, you would see Canadian Amanda Linhut, which you saw in the, in the opening video, leading something called the Convoy of Hope. This was during, uh, there was a terrible famine and a drought uh, in Somalia, and uh, she was uh, leading this convoy. And what's really amazing about this story is that that was the first time that Amanda had returned to Somalia since she spent 460 days as a captive, as a hostage, un uh, undergoing you know, horrible treatment and torture and abuse. And she promised herself during that ordeal that if she ever had, the, if she survived and she, and she had the opportunity to, she would t return to Somalia and help uh, with some of the issues and some of the challenges that she uh, felt led uh, some of those who perpetrated those crimes against her to do, to do that, and particularly to help the women of Somalia. So I caught wind of this story while I was on the space station. I actually had the chance to call her on her cell phone as she was leading the uh, Convoy of Hope. I, I obviously you know, expressed my, uh, my gratitude and my, um, how impressed I was with everything she was doing, but also uh, pledged my support. But all I could do at that point was try and bring awareness to the, to the uh, effort uh, through sending pictures down from space. And um, van the vantage point from space uh, you know, can really lead to a lot of things. I think we're going to hear a speaker uh, after me who's going to talk about using some of that imagery, uh, some of the data that comes from space to, to help um, things with agriculture and things like that. And I, s I certainly talk a lot about that in the book. Uh, but really the point of that third section of the book is, a, is it's a message of hope, it's a message of optimism, it's a message of um, that takes the mindset that we do not have to accept the status quo on our planet. It takes the mindset that we refuse to accept that the ways things are are the ways things have to be and that we actually have the power to change those things. So this is a, tomorrow's Yuri's night. Uh, t tomorrow night is Yuri's night, so that's the uh, anniversary of the first human to fly in space, and this is uh, us on the crew of uh, Expedition 27 uh, celebrating Yuri's night 2011. There's Katie there that you saw, and Apollo Nespoli, Dima Kondratov, um, Sasha Samakotev, Andrew Boroshenko, myself, and again, it just shows the uh, internet. There's three nations represented there, Italy, the United States, and Russia, and it shows uh, what we can do when we work together, and, and really the key is we. So, does anybody know what this picture is? It's really hard to see. It's the Earth, it's the famous pale blue dot picture. So, um, back, I think about 25 years ago, uh, as Voyager 1 was leaving the solar system, uh, Carl Sagan asked NASA to turn the spacecraft around and point it back on Earth. And this is a, this is a really zoomed in part of a bit much bigger picture. Um, and the reason why I show this is, is again, to, to kind of help with a shift in perspective. But also, you know, I think um, Carl Sagan said it best, and I'm going to read a quote from him about this picture. Uh, and he said, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. And that is true. I mean, we, this is where for the time being, we make our stand. Sure, we're at NASA, we're trying to fly out into the, into the solar system. Uh, we're, we're hoping that all of you help us do that, but uh, we need to make our, stand, make our stand right here. Um, I just want to sh share a story with you about international cooperation. This is uh, a series of pictures fr from the, my launch in 2011. And I think that the value of inter international cooperation was really driven home the night that we launched into space. And you got to realize, I spent the first 15 years of my adult life training to fight the Russians. And on April 4th, 2011, uh, I found myself at the base of a, of a Russian rocket uh, that was going to carry me and my two military Russian crewmates into space. Um, this was the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from. It was the 50th anniversary of the launch. Uh, and as I stood there and looked up at the rocket, I saw an American flag and a Russian flag. And it really drove home this fact that if we find things that we agree on, 
and we work on those things together. Even if we have other things that we disagree on, if we find the low-hanging fruit and work on the things that we agree on, we can do amazing things. And hopefully, that builds a platform that we can start to address the things that we don't agree on. And I think the International Space Station is that platform. I think the partner, not the station, but the partnership that built the space station is an amazing platform from which we can start to look at, and, at solving some of the other problems facing our planet. So interconnectivity, the, the reason I put this up here is because we have been working for decades and decades to solve a lot of the problems facing our planet, and we've made great strides during that time frame, but we still have a mountain to climb. And the reason why we, I believe we still have a mountain to climb is because over those decades, and really in some cases centuries, of work and research um, and development, we did not effectively work together and collaborate. But we had an excuse then that no longer exists. Up until very recently, we didn't have the capability to seamlessly, effortlessly, uh, economically incorporate the ideas and the creative um, drive of, of people from all over the planet. And what, what, what we realize, and when we zoom out to the orbital perspective, is that the internet has become the nerve center of Spaceship Earth, right? Connecting discrete points of creativity, discrete points of effort, and combining them into unified action, or having the capability to com com combine those into unified action. And so I think this is, is a really critical piece. And once we connect the five billion minds that are presently not connected to the internet, the five billion creative problem-solving minds to the internet, we are gonna find solutions that we never even dreamed of from places we've never heard of. And that's why I'm so excited to be here at the International Space Apps Challenge because this is some of the substrate, this is some of the, of the switchboard, if you will, that's connecting those ideas and connecting those efforts. And so it's really uh, great to be here for that. Um, I think this is, should be really clear, and, and the reason why I brought up Amanda and the reason why I bring up so many stories in my book uh, of people who are exhibiting the orbital perspective that have never been in space is because you don't have to be in orbit to have the orbital perspective. You don't have to be in space to realize that we're all interconnected and that we're not going to find the solutions to the problem we face if we don't learn to work together. Um, we do have a wonderful world, um, and it's not as wonderful as it should be. It's not as wonderful as it can be. Uh, but I think um, one, of the, the <laughs> one of the best ways to affect real change is to believe that, that real change is possible. And I want to just personally share with you some of the things that I personally believe are possible. I believe it's actually possible to live in a world without poverty. I, I think it's actually possible to live in a world where everybody has access to clean water, nobody goes to bed hungry every night, nobody dies from preventable or curable diseases. I believe it's possible to live in a world that educates all its children. And I believe that we do live in a world where the possibilities are only limited by our imagination and our will to act. It is within our power to eliminate or reduce the suffering and the, and the poverty and all the other problems that exist on our planet. And that's really important because, again, the first step to being able to affect that kind of ch type of change is to believe that real change is possible. And the reason why I think that is because I, I, don't, I think that nothing is impossible. Not only is every great accomplishment at a first seemingly impossible, it's, it's seemingly a little crazy. So if, you know, for hundreds of years, or maybe more, people would have thought you were crazy to say we could fly to the moon and back, right? But we did it. We did it. Human ingenuity, the determination, the human spirit pr proved that it was possible. If we can go to the moon and back, if 15 nations can join together and build the International Space Station, this orbiting research facility uh, in orbit, if we can do that, we can do many of the things that are needed to solve the problems facing our planet. Nothing is impossible. And so I wanna, I'm going to end here. Um, with a music video uh, that's going to ask you a question. Um, this is a picture of my crewmates and I and our backups. Uh, that's the rocket would, that would take us to space. This is a couple days before launch. And I'm going to ask you um, this question in the form of a music video. And I want you to, um, as you're watching this mu music video, and you see the beauty of the planet we've been given, and you see the international cooperation that built the International Space Station, I want you to view that as, a, as your call to action, a call to action to look for ways to break down the barriers to collaboration, realizing that the barriers to collaboration are no longer technical, they're, they're cultural, they're, they're political, uh, and so do we need to start breaking down those barriers. And so to, to set the stage, uh, when it was time to come home from Earth, uh, when it was time to come home to Earth, <laughs> uh, we, my, my Russian crewmates and I got into our spa uh, Soyuz spacecraft, we undocked from the space station, uh, we did a couple of laps around the planet, and as we passed the south tip of South America, we fishtailed our spacecraft around to point the engines backwards. And as we did this, I saw this crescent moon go by the window. When we fired the engines just enough to get into the atmosphere, we had this fiery, violent ride through the atmosphere. 
Uh, the parachutes opened, we went slamming into the ground, we bounced, we rolled, we flipped over, and as we flipped over, we landed on our side. And as we landed on our side, uh, I was on the bottom, I was in the right seat, and the right seat window was now pointing at the, at the ground. And out of my window, I saw a rock, a flower, and a blade of grass. And I thought to myself really distinctly, I'm home. And what was really interesting about that thought, and I realized this right away, was I was in Kazakhstan. And so to me, at that moment, my home was no longer New York, where I, I grew up, or Houston, where I live with my family. My home was Earth. And with that, I just want to leave you with this question. What kind of world do you want? So that's, I, I love that video, that's a great video. So um, 
Oh, by the way, um, that video and all the videos you saw and many, many more are in the enhanced uh, ebook version of the, of the book, The Orbital Perspective, that just came out. I'm going to do a book signing uh, right after this. The proceeds are going to go to the New York Tech Council that was one of the hosts of uh, uh, Space Apps New York City. And I just want to close the talk before we open it up to questions and answers by thanking you all for being here. Everybody ar ar around the world who's uh, in the International Space Apps Challenge, uh, thank you for helping make our planet... Uh, as beautiful as it looks from space, um, and thank you for not accepting the status quo on our planet. So, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. So, thanks. Any questions for Ron? Hey, so I get to I get to ask a question. Why, why do you get to ask? <laughs> Since a question? we were together up there, so actually, it's not. It's she more wasn't in the room when I was talking about her. So it's more of a story. You know, which to me is profound, and I, and I tell it, where I was already on board the space station for about four months before De Ron got there. And I remember in, during like the first week or so, um, talking about the drinking straws that were, uh, it was uh, in Rwanda, is it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, my, do I have mm -hmm, that right? Yeah. Well, Kenya, and actually, yeah. What's that? In Kenya. Kenya. In Kenya. Yeah. And so I asked Ron, we're looking out the window, and, and, and he said, I, I said, how's your day? He goes, you know, it's a really good day today. And I, I said, yeah, for me too. Like, well, how come you had such a good day? I mean, because we're kind of in the same place. And, uh, and he goes, well, you know, we gave out, I want to say 10,000 uh, filter straws in Kenya that could be used to filter water, uh, you know, from a sewer, literally, and be able to drink it. And... It just was very profound to me because I thought, well, you know, I woke up this morning, I did everything on the schedule and maybe even a little bit more. I talked to my family. I did everything I was supposed to do, but I didn't actually change the world in that way and I didn't even think to. And not all of us are like Ron and he's really taught me a lot about the fact that it's a very big planet and it's a place, it's a wonderful place we're from, and that there's things we can do to change that. And some of those never occurred to me until I spent a few months with him up in space. Oh. <laughs> well, I, th thanks. Well, I didn't give those, I didn't give those filters out either. That, that's, again, an example of, of collaboration, in this case, collaboration on the ground and with some lone guy up on, on the space station. So, um, thank you, Katie. That was, that was really nice. Yeah, Carla Pilato, exactly. Um, which is a fragile oasis project. So. Any other uh, questions? So it's fairly easy to recognize how the internet's enabling us to communicate in a global scale. Uh, I think what's important to recognize is some of the limitations that we have ideologically about how we communicate and collaborate, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So some of the barriers to overcome with, okay. How we um, make use of the internet. Yeah, and the so the, the I'm, I don't know if I could do this in a short amount of time, but um, because there's, that's a pretty deep question um, that has a lot of facets to it. If you look at the International Space Station, if you look at what built the International Space Station partnership, it was built out of treaties and formal, formal contracts. You know, a very rigid formal structure was built. Um, to enable what you saw being built. Uh, but what really made it work was the personal relationships that developed, uh, the trust that developed when people said, and organizations and nations said, we are gonna deliver, and they actually delivered, and you learned to trust them, then trust is what built the International Space Station. Um, and that trust was, like I said, enabled by formal contracts and formal treaties. But you don't necessarily need formal contracts and formal treaties. What enabled the International Space Station to be built was the fact that the 15 nations of the International Space Station's partnerships, individual national objectives aligned. Because international cooperation occurs when the, when the national, when, when what's in the best interest of each of the nations coincide. Um, because at the end of the day, all nations will act in what is their best national interest. Which is why I believe that a collection of individuals like the International Space Apps Challenge is a much more powerful vehicle to affect change than a collection of nations um, because we don't have those ba boundaries and barriers to overcome uh, and we can more seamlessly. And the trust that was built in the International Space Station partner that required face-to-face -face interaction is not necessarily necessary 
to build the level of trust that it takes for a 48-hour hackathon or the level of trust that comes together just for the time that is needed uh, and doesn't have to maintain a long, you know, you know multi-year uh, um, relationship. And so I think, there, I'm not, I think there's a place for all of that. And what the International Space Apps Challenge and other uh, private public uh, hackathons do is they connect the two. It's, it's such a, an amazing hybrid um, operation that can take the best of what the government has to offer with the flexibility and the speed and the agility that, that the private sector has to offer and connects them together. Um, and it really is uh, overcoming some of the, some of the limitations. I, there's a lot more to it than that, but I think in, it, there's a chapter in the book on that called Mass Collaboration. So <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Okay. Um, I think we have to move on to the, the next speaker. I did have one Super. question, though. Why is the Indo-Pakistani border visible from space? Because it's lit up. It's actually all those miles of border have lights on them. And, and I think they call it elephant grass. And I mean, it's, it's a militarized border. Um, and there's many borders that are actually visible from space. Um, so that's, not, that's just one of them. And they all, they all look like that, that kind of star on the landscape. So. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Live stream, but you can tweet questions with the hashtag AskSpaceApps, hashtag AskSpaceApps, hashtag AskSpaceApps. Um, and our next speaker is Steve Adler, uh, Chief Information Strategist. Yeah, I just don't know how to, oh, I think I have to do this. Okay. Is that mirror? That's Steve Adler. Hey, guys. Chief Information Strategist at IBM, responsible for a lot of things, among them IBM's open data strategies, which may be pertinent to the Good. hackathon today. So, thank you very much. Hey. I'm Steve Adler, I work for IBM. And what I wanted to talk a little bit to you about today is something a little bit more down to earth than flying in space. Something very down to earth. I want to talk about food and agriculture and agricultural production. Uh, about a year ago, I, I, to be honest, I didn't know anything about NASA or about farming until about a year ago when I joined a program called GODAN, which is the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Program, launched by the US Department of Agriculture. And the purpose of the program is to try to inventory agricultural production all over the world for the first time in human history. In the United States, we have really great agricultural information about what food is produced because we have the US Department of Agriculture that collects this data. 20 or 30 other countries do so around the world as well, but the vast majority of other countries don't. And even in the United States, we don't know fully all the food that we produce. It isn't all counted and accounted for. But thanks to NASA, for the first time, we can use satellites to monitor how much food is produced exactly anywhere in the world. There are satellites that are circling the globe that take photos of the planet every four days. And these photos can identify acres of land and the types of crops that are growing in that land using infrared and spectral analysis. And all of this data is available on NASA's website on their open data repository. All this data is available for any of you to take advantage of to identify exactly where in the world, what is being planted, when it was planted, etc. It's really pretty cool. For the first time, we can identify exactly how much food we're producing. And this is really critically important because we have 7 billion people on the planet today. And the planet is warming. And soon we'll have 9 billion. 
And rather than wait for a food, a food emergency, the United States and UK created this GODAN program to begin identifying exactly how much food is being produced, how much uh, nutrition people are getting from the food, and where we're going to have shortfalls in the future before we have a crisis. Now that's the idea of the program. NASA's also just launched a new satellite called SMAP. SMAP reads soil moisture from space. Farmers used to read moisture of from, um, from their own farms by setting out um, sensors in the ground. They no longer have to use those sensors or uh, planes that fly overhead or drones that fly around. They can get this data directly for free from NASA. And this, this data tells you exactly what the moisture is of a particular farm. And if you count, if you take the satellite images of what's being planted, and then you take a look at what the soil moisture is, you can begin to calculate what the yield might be for that particular farm long before it gets harvested and goes to market. We can monitor drought conditions long before we have droughts. We can monitor, we can predict floods based upon how much groundwater there is, how much water runoff, what the snow caps look like. All this information is being provided by NASA for free to everyone all over the world because these satellites circle the globe. And we can also assist with something called precision agriculture. Do you know what this is? It's a really cool thing. I just learned about it. Precision agriculture uses satellite data to correctly inform farm combines. You know, these big machines. I think I have a photo of this. These big machines, see this guy here? He's filling up these tanks. These tanks contain uh, fertilizer and pesticide. And what they do is they calibrate, which you can see in the photo on the top are infrared photos and spectral analysis of specific fields. Farmers use this information to calculate exactly how much water and nutrients and pesticides to deliver to specific zones on the ground. That is, they don't think about an entire field as just a huge field that we have to water and throw water at and throw pesticides at it. They think about a field as a set of microzones. And each zone has specific climatic conditions. And they can measure what those conditions are on a daily basis and use that information to precisely calibrate exactly the right nutrients and pesticides and water to provide to exactly the right plants at exactly the right time. And in parts of the country like California, Precision agriculture could save 50% of current water consumption in that state. You know, last year, or just recently last week, the governor announced these big water measures uh, where they're forcing rationing among the population, asking people to cut back 25% on their water usage. And that's going to, personal water consumption is only 10% of the total of, of water consumption in California. Agriculture makes up 80% of water consumption. And so using NASA satellite data, which again is this natural resource the government is providing for free, farmers could use that information to dramatically cut back water consumption and maximize resources. And of course, all of this could have a really big impact on human health because we are what we eat and having a better understanding of exactly what types of pesticides we should be delivering into our foods could minimize the use of pesticides more specifically and cut the contaminants in our food. So, all this data is there. It's all free. Its latency is very low, which means it's updated on a regular basis. Sadly, its utilization is also very low. And I'm here today to urge you to think about how to take advantage of this great resource. You know, a lot of people say, oh, we can solve world hunger. You know, it's really actually possible today. For the first time in human history, we can use satellite imagery to identify exactly what is being farmed where. And that is just a remarkable opportunity for you guys. If you want to make a difference on the planet, if you want to make a difference with your work, this is our golden opportunity to do so. So that's what my challenge is to you. Take advantage of this data and increase its utility. Use your genius, your apps, your creative collaboration, and help us change the world. Any questions? Can I ask a quick one first? Yeah. So is the API just particularly uh, burdensome or something on this data portal? Like why is the utility, why is the usage so low? I think the awareness is very low. Um, so for example, um,
um, there just aren't a lot of people who are fully familiar with the opportunity to do this. And that's why I'm here speaking about it. Um, GoDan, the program that IBM has joined, that the US Department of Agriculture and the UK are running, has 140 partners around the world, but they're mostly either large or small businesses that are participating or non-governmental organizations. And citizens really haven't been engaged yet. And we haven't had a, the opportunity to participate in hackathons like this and raise awareness about the availability of this data and talk about its use. And I think that's true for lots of open data. I, I work with open data at IBM all over the world. And I think it's, you can make this statement not just about open data from NASA, you can make this statement about open data from New York City. Well, maybe the latency for New York City open data isn't quite so low, but the utilization sure is pretty low. And that's a challenge we have everywhere, is that we just aren't really finding creative ways of taking advantage of the data that we're publishing. It's true for NASA as it is for any other locality. I think there was a question over here, right? Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. This is eye-opening. I did not know it existed. I'm curious how the private sector can use this data to their benefit, and if any companies are using it in the private sector. Many companies are. So, for example, that would be a key, if you were thinking about developing let's call it um, an app or an information product, a key customer would be the agricultural industry, both domestically and internationally. So big companies like John Deere and Caterpillar, they build these combines that use the, the, um, this information to deliver the nutrients, et cetera, into the fields. There's also networking companies that use this information. Precision agriculture has been around for about 15 years, but so far, maybe about 10, 15% of all farms in the United States actually use it. In many countries around the world, it's still on an experimental basis. And I think um, there's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs who could develop better apps, take better advantage of this, of uh, the data. Um, and so I would think about uh, private industry, both companies like mine, IBM, Microsoft, in the IT industry, who build IT solutions that might take advantage of this data, as well as uh, participants in the agricultural industry. Thank you. Sure. I had just a follow-up question on the, the challenges, and I totally agree with you about the last mile of open data needing more applications, more people working on it. I'm wondering specifically with this data, if you have any ideas or if you've seen anything interesting that will get the information to farmers in a better way. Um, yeah. We actually, it was funny, um, last year I was, uh, my introduction to this whole topic came last year when I participated in the Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, which is this big um, powwow in Washington that the president organized for um, 34 heads of state from across Africa. And uh, we worked together with USDA on an Africa Open Data Jam that we hosted at our IBM offices alongside the Leadership Summit. And we developed an SMS application to using IBM Bluemix, the guys outside, and in like four days, I had a team that developed an app that would send SMS messages to farmers in remote villages and ask them what they had for breakfast. And you know, you may wonder, well, what does it matter? Like, did they have Cheerios or something for breakfast? No. In a lot of um, developing countries, breakfast is not a common meal. Uh, in a lot of developing countries, they only eat one meal a day, and it's probably lunch. Uh, and breakfast isn't a common meal. But if you, if you have a farmer that's eating breakfast, that's an indication of the health of the farm. That's a simple question you can ask to find out how well is that farmer doing? And if he's eating breakfast, if he answers that he ate something for breakfast, that's already an indication that his farm is doing pretty well. So it's sort of an indirect way of surveying. So SMS messaging is one way of delivering some of the information. And that's actually being done. Um, NASA and USDA teamed up with, um, there's a use case if you check the NASA website, uh, with Rwanda. Rwanda was facing huge runoff uh, from storms, they had over farmed their country and they had depleted the natural plants that resist. You know, it's a, it's a mountainous country with lots of ravines, and because they over farmed it, they had vicious storm runoff that just led to landslides and huge agricultural losses. And so, they used NASA satellites um, to map out where they should plant indigenous plants to restore the hillside to prevent the runoff. And they calibrated that data with smartphone apps that they delivered to farmers to help them understand exactly where in their farms they should plant, you know, in the terraced hills, these plants to hold back the water when it rains. And so cell phones in many countries are a primary tool for information dissemination when you're trying to 
bring this data from up high down to low to a farmer. Yeah. Other? So if this information, all this data is freely available and it's been underused, why do you think that companies like Skybox or Planet Labs are launching microsatellites to generate the same kind of information? Planet Labs is a, Planet Labs is a brilliant experiment um, and I'm really excited by it. Um, and I think they offer the kind of innovation which the private sector can bring to issues like that. And I think you heard the, the astronauts talking about this earlier, that it isn't just international or um, fully funded national programs that can launch satellites today. But Planet Labs, do you guys know what Planet Labs is? Oh, it's a small company in California that is launching 100 very small geospatial satellites. And they are like nine feet long. Uh, they cost about $200,000 each um, to make. And so they're very cheap. And they've launched 28 so far and they're planning to launch 100 and they're gonna go in a ring around the Earth. So the NASA satellites, they take a photo of every part of the planet every four days. The Planet Lab satellites will take high-res photos of the entire planet like a photocopier every day. It's like they're gonna photocopy the Earth every day. Um, now the thing that's cool about that is just the frequency of information because we'll be actually be able to see roads being built day by day by day, you know, Houses being built day by day by day. Urban sprawl day by day by day. It's fascinating. However, they haven't really figured out their revenue model yet. So <laughs> let's give them a little time to figure that out because they have this kind of funny model where they're, they put this stuff up there talking about it, but no one's really sure yet, gee, why are we gonna pay for Planet Lab data when NASA's giving us nearly the same data at a three-day lag for free? So like, I think it's a great idea. I'm just not sure what their model is. For, for revenue. And I, I'm, I think if you ask them, they'll probably tell you, we're not really sure yet either. <laughs> sure. Other questions? Yeah. By the way, the NASA data is coming from Landsat. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, like, uh, what kind of data uh, are you extracting? Is there some sort of, uh, are you making it smarter or are you adding uh, your own contributions to it or is it just you're just grabbing information? It's just, a, it's just a raw data. It's uh, in CSV, Excel uh, okay. files. It's in an open data repository in the NASA site. Check, check out NASA, what is it? Data, is it nasadata.gov? Or datanasa.gov? I don't remember the exact URL. But uh, all the data is up, it, it's, it's all up there. I think, I think that the SMAP, no soil moisture data, is just coming online now. The satellite was just launched, I think, for the last few months. I think the data is just coming on stream now, but the Landsat data is available right now. And it's, uh, as it's, it's published as open data, it's downloadable, machine readable, you can just take a copy. Are there security implications to the coverage of the, of the Landsats? Like is there stuff that other governmental agencies and departments you know, want to censor out from this or no? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that uh, there's lots of satellite data that you won't see for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, there are images of, of places, you know, you can even find that on Google Maps. If you check out Google Maps, there are certain parts of the map that somehow mysteriously are not available to be seen. Um, and I don't know what the protocol is for that. You know, I suppose if the US government has a carte blanche protocol, no, don't show that. But I'm not sure exactly what, how the Chinese get the same privilege. Are these, small enough, these are small enough areas that food production there is not a significant Right, somehow action. Fiji doesn't have that privilege, but I guess larger countries do. Any other questions? Uh, no? Okay. Great. Great. Thank you so Thanks, much Steve. for your time.
Tell the me. ISC E3 reboot project. There we go. Take it away. And uh, um, this is in the spirit of the hackathon here today. Uh, what the ISC E3 reboot project is, is that in 1978, NASA launched a spacecraft as part of a three spacecraft constellation. And the one we're talking about here today is ISC E3. Uh, the spacecraft um, was the first spacecraft ever to go out to the Earth-Sun libration point, and it and its two companions were the first spacecraft to, in real time, uh, look at the science of the Earth's magnetosphere and to look at the Sun, which what ISEE-3 did, 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, closer to the Sun, at the Earth-Sun libration point, which meant that the spacecraft continued to orbit with the Earth around the sun, but with ISEE-3 closer to the sun, so it could see what's happening outside of the Earth's magnetosphere, and then the other two spacecraft would see what was going on inside of the Earth's magnetosphere as a result of the influences from the sun, from solar flares, solar wind, coronal mass ejections, things like that. Uh, and the spacecraft, this is a, a little graphic of it, um, it was it was really really cool spacecraft. This here is a uh, this is what it looked like in the LAM and in flight. It had a bunch of antennas coming out to the side. The spacecraft spun at 19.75 RPM. That means it did a full rotation about every three seconds, and it had antennas. And what I think it, one of the cool things is that two of the antennas were 41 meters, or about 135 feet long, and, and they're whipping around at 19.75 RPM. And uh, uh, we were talking about if it went off course when it was coming back to the Earth, we just call it the space blender. Um, this is what it looked like prior to launch, and this is what it was actually doing in its original mission, uh, and looking at the influences of the sun, and so it carried a cosmic ray detectors, it carried gamma ray detectors, it carried radio wave detectors, plasma wave detectors, and it wrote the book on a science called, and actually the term heliophysics, which is from the Greek, that helios is the Greek word for the sun. It's literally, literally the physics of the study of the sun. And that entire science was spawned by this spacecraft. And why this is important to us today is that in studying the sun, there was uh, something that happened in 1859 called a Carrington event. If that Carrington event happened today, which was a massive solar flare, every single bit of technology that we talk about in hacking would be gone because the influence of the sun is so strong in electrical power, it would disrupt the entire planetary electrical grid. And it, the, it was so strong that the only technology we had in 1859 were telegraph stations. It burned most of the telegraph stations in the United States down just from the induced power uh, to the uh, uh, wires to the uh, um, telegraph stations. Now, the ISEE 3 mission was extended, and a scientist by the name of Bob Farquhar figured out how to send it to a comet. In 1980, NASA was kind of like it is today, it didn't have all the money it needed, and there was a, a lot of uh, spacecraft going to Halley's Comet in 1986, and the United States didn't have one. And Dr. Farquhar just really didn't like that. And so he figured out a way by using Earth's gravity. And what you see up there, this is all of these paths the spacecraft took, wrapping around the Earth and wrapping around the moon and doing gravity flybys to get enough energy to take a spacecraft that was designed for Earth orbit out into the solar system. And they were so successful that on September the 11th of 1985, this spacecraft passed within eight thousand kilometers of the comet Gacobini Zener, uh, which was an inner solar system comet, it, and it passed directly through the middle of the tail of this comet. It was the first spacecraft to do so, uh, and it was the first one to be successful, and ever, ever, nobody really knew what would happen, but it successfully made it through the comet, and that's important, and we'll tell you a little bit about it later. But uh, after it did the comet flyby, it did a long flyby uh, of Halley's Comet about 21 million kilometers away and discovered that Halley's Comet, which comes back every 86 years, 
hasn't influenced even that far away from the comet itself on the solar system's magnetic field. Well, after the, uh, the September the 11th and after the comet flyby uh, of Halley, it continued in the solar system in what's called a heliocentric orbit inside of the Earth's orbit. And um, it worked in concert with another European mission called Ulysses. Ulysses was in a polar orbit around the sun. It went out to Jupiter, did a flyby, and went into polar orbit around the sun. And ISE-3 was in an equatorial solar system. If you look at our solar system, we, because we're Earthers, we define the, uh, the equator of the sun-Earth solar system line as being in the plane of the Earth and the sun. So ISE-3 was in the equator, and Ulysses was in the polar, and so they gathered more data on the solar wind. Well, the guys in 1986 figured out how to send the spacecraft back to the Earth, but it was going to be 30 years before it got here. So they actually figured out a trajectory that would bring ISE-3 back to the Earth in the spring of 2014, and this is where we came in. Uh, Isaac Newton Hates Us is, is the title of this because what happened, the spacecraft was coming back to the Earth, but the only thing these guys didn't plan on in 1986 is that NASA wouldn't have money to be able to contact the spacecraft in 2014. It turns out that in the late 1990s, <coughs> NASA got rid of all of the hardware to talk to the spacecraft. They got rid of all the software to talk to the spacecraft. They got rid of most of the data to talk to the spacecraft. And so Dr. Farquhar has been, had been trying for several years to get NASA to, to create a project to do this, but last year NASA was talking about turning off several active spacecraft. So what the heck are, are they going to do uh, with, this, with the 30-something-year-old spacecraft? They're going, we're just going to let it fly by. Well, April 12th, of last year, we had a teleconference with NASA headquarters, and we said, look, we know there's a very, very small chance of us being able to do this. You're, you're, just, you're not far away from being able to do it. You're not going to do anything. Can we play with the satellite? And fortunately, Dr. John Grunsfeld, who is the, the Associate Administrator for Science at NASA, he knows me, and he, he knew my compatriot, Mr. Keith Cowley from NASA Watch. Uh, and John knows I've worked on a lot of space stuff. So this isn't exactly, we're not exactly unknown quantities. Uh, but uh, Dr. Grunsfeld was interested in this. Uh, the heliophysics community wanted to see it. The original principal investigators were, were willing to play. And they said, okay, you can go, you can go for it. So on April 12th, we got the go ahead. On April 14th, we started a crowdfunding project. And our project, beginning on uh, uh, April the 12th, we raised $159,000 by May the 18th. And I went out on a limb and borrowed a bunch of money from friends uh, to be able to fund this until that time. We were able to take and, and use advanced technology that we didn't have back then. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but we, we started, well, I'll, I'll go ahead into that. I was thinking about it, and I kept thinking about how they did that, how they did it, and all, all the stuff was going on. Going, well, this is a spacecraft that was built in the mid-1970s. It's not like it has the brain of uh, a modern spacecraft. It's actually a dumb spacecraft. It doesn't have a computer. It only has what we call a state machine. And so it had a limited number of commands to give to it. Uh, the waveforms were relatively simple, uh, especially compared today with what's on the cell phone. The cell phone today has way more complex waveforms that are done in software. So I'm going, okay, maybe we can do software radio. And I call up a couple of people. Fortunately, I live in Silicon Valley, and you have this, this overwhelming mass of really smart people around. And I'm going, oh, we might be able to do this. And, and so we had a bunch of people who came in and started uh, working with us. And uh, we went and we started thinking about, okay, we've got to get a transmitter. This is on a frequency. We can't go to NASA because one of our rules from NASA is that we can't use NASA assets unless we pay for them. We didn't have the money to pay for them. So I started thinking about antennas, and I'm going, well, there's this really, really big antenna 
in uh, uh, Puerto Rico called Arecibo. Maybe we could use that. So here we are a few weeks later at Arecibo. And another one of the problems is uh, that forced us to go to Arecibo is that, you know, I can't just go out and order off the shelf a 10 kilowatt, 2.4 gigawatts radio transmitter. You know, I can, but it's going to take six months to get, and we didn't have six months, and it cost a lot of money. So I'm going, we substitute a really, really big antenna, and then we can buy a really small transmitter. And you actually see uh, in the picture there, this is a transmitter. It's from a, a ham radio people in Germany, uh, Dirk Fischer Electronics. In two and a half weeks, he produced this 400 watt transmitter, and we had it, uh, we FedEx. Uh, that thing weighs about 250 pounds. We FedExed it overnight from Germany to Puerto Rico. Uh, and so we got it, we took it there to Arecibo, and we get on there, and, and we just, they weren't back. Fortunately, the timing was such that the spacecraft, we, we, you can only talk to it two and a half hours from Arecibo, because despite what people think, this is a huge telescope sitting in the ground, it can be steered slightly because they have, and I'll show you a picture of this, uh, it can be steered in azimuth, azimuth around 360 degrees and in elevation about 15 degrees. So we had about two and a half hours a day. Well, it just so happened that the time we wanted to talk to the spacecraft was at the end of their maintenance period. And so usually they're always finished with the maintenance period early and so it kind of fit in and they invited us down there. Well, about that time we get a phone call from Google Google Creative Labs, actually right here in New York City, and they said, we want to come down to Arecibo with you and film what you're doing. So we said, okay. So everybody went down to Arecibo, and here I am wearing my Google Glass up on top of the, uh, uh, the, the we call it the dome down there at Arecibo, and there that's Austin Epps, uh, my engineer, and, and Bollett Sieber, and Bollett was from a company called Edis Research, and Edis Research made the software-defined radio that we use. Well, uh, Bollett said, I really want to do this, and uh, Edis Research loaned him to us uh, for this project, and then, and this is a worldwide collaboration because the signal from the spacecraft was first detected from an observatory in Bochum, Germany on February. They signed on to help us out. And then I get an email one night from an old friend of mine from the ham radio days. Uh, as a little bit of background, I built the first student satellite that NASA supported and paid for the launch in the 1990s. Well, I met a bunch of people back then, and one of them was a guy by the name of Phil Karn. Turned out to be one of the top engineers at Qualcomm. But he has cancer, and he was going through chemotherapy. And he says, you know, I really wanted something to take my mind off my chemotherapy. Can I help you? Well, he wrote in about two weeks a K equal 24 Viterbi decoder to be able to decode uh, our telemetry in real time. And so we had Phil Karn, we had the folks from Edis, we had John Malesbury, who was also Edis. And on May 20, okay, remember, we started this on April 12th. We had nothing. May 29th, success. What this is is a waveform. The very first command we sent to the spacecraft. The spacecraft it had was just sending out a uh, what's called a beacon. It just had the transmitter on with a carrier with no signal. The very first command we sent to the spacecraft is turn telemetry on. And what you see right there, that, and we told it to turn it on at 512 bits per second. And the black line is what we expected from simulation. The, uh, the blue squigglies is the actual data from the spacecraft showing it was in 512 bits per second telemetry mode. So we were able to take and do this in six weeks, and this is kind of sort of how we did it. We had, we, I, we call it, let's say I won't have to tone down my language a little bit. Uh, we call this our half-baked, half-duplex uh, method of talking to the spacecraft and substitute a word for derriere for baked. Uh, and so we had, we had, uh, we ended up coming back to California. So we had us in California on Skype. We had a, a Linux, a Linux uh, laptop at Arecibo with gigabit ethernet. We had two software radios, one for transmitting and one for receiving because you can't, it takes, uh, it takes two, it, 
It's almost a minute and a half to go from transmit to receive at Arecibo because I've got to move these huge structures around. I mean, biggest antenna in the world. And then we had the folks in Germany that were receiving. So what we so instead of doing both transmit and receive at Arecibo, we'd transmit at Arecibo, and then we'd get confirmation in real time from Bauckham. And then we had an internet link to where Bauckham was pipelining the telemetry back to us that we could then display on our laptops here and be able to see the telemetry in real time on the spacecraft. We had all this working in about two months. And so we went on and um, one of the things we didn't know is that the spacecraft wasn't exactly where we thought it was. Uh, and this is another one of our huge hacks that NASA participated in. We had done the initial uh, orbit calculation based on being able to, the, the beam width of the antenna at Arecibo is like 30 arc seconds. So that means at 2 million kilometers or 15 million kilometers, the beam is only about uh, half a million kilometers wide. So we knew where the spacecraft was within a certain area. And the NASA uh, uh, ephemeris that tells you where the spacecraft is was wrong. And so we were updating it with Arecibo, but we had a, what's called an error ellipse or what's called an egg plot that showed the spacecraft possibly hitting the moon because the spacecraft was supposed to come and do a lunar flyby at a, it's 50 kilometers above the lunar surface that would get it back into Earth orbit. And so it looked like it could hit the moon, so NASA said, look, we've got to help you. And so NASA brought the Deep Space Network in because it would be really bad press for NASA if this spacecraft hit the moon. Uh, <laughs> and so they brought some assets in, but guess what? NASA still did, there, there's a quirk in this spacecraft that uh, in order to turn on what's called the ranging transponders, you gotta send a command. Well, it has to send a command and then hold the carrier on that command until you get a response. Well, NASA didn't have the ability to do this anymore. Well, we figured something out. We took it, we made an audio file of the command to turn it into what's called a, a, a coherent ranging mode. And we, ma we made this audio file and they had a laptop there at the Deep Space Network that they took an output from the audio file, ran it into what's called an, uh, an IQ uh, modulator that they were able to get the right phase on the signal. And they sent that out and commanded the spacecraft from, uh, from NASA, from the Deep Space Network. We had no idea whether this would work or not, but it did. And right here are the waveforms to actually show where what would happen is that uh, when we would hit this signal, it would shift the frequency. And you can actually see this frequency shift here, and you can actually see what's called, uh, there's a set of codes, I forget what the codes are called, that help you with ranging. So you see the codes, you see the transmitters held on, and everything worked. It was like, oh my God, can't believe we did that. Uh, but it worked and we were able to get a better ephemeris on the spacecraft and then we were able to get all the telemetry. Guess what? We didn't have all the data. We had to guess at some of the telemetry. And we finally figured a lot of it out and so we were able to do things like get the temperatures. I mean, this spacecraft's been in, or in, in space for 36 years. What's happened to it? It turned out the temperatures on the solar array were very close to the predicted values. The solar arrays actually put out more energy, or uh, it was 93% of the energy they had in 1980. And when we're going through all of this, NASA says, okay, you just really proved out the value of your space actor room. Because what we had to do, we had to prove to NASA at each step that we could do this. Oh, and by the way, we had to get authorizations on like almost a daily basis to even transmit because there's probably some things they didn't, some spacecraft out there that aren't officially on any of these frequencies that they didn't want us to interfere with. So we had to get daily, it was, it was just, it was really interesting, but NASA really came around because initially they said, well, who is this bunch of internet nuts that wanna do this? But then eventually they came around and they became our biggest fans. And then this is where our mission operations were uh, in an abandoned McDonald's at NASA Ames uh, where we do some of our other crazy projects. This is, we call this our hack space. Um, but then, after everything was going, we had telemetry, we actually did a firing, the initial firing of the engines, which was NASA's last 
Uh, it's called gates. We had gates that we had to go through for NASA to give us permission to do the next thing. We actually successfully fired the thrusters on the spacecraft because over 30 years, it, the spin had slowed down and we had to get the spin back within spec. Even that worked. But then the agony of defeat, at least temporarily. What you see right here, this is from an accelerometer on board the spacecraft. And when we fired the main propulsion system to do a course correction that would put us on track to come back into Earth orbit, this right here, that's an exponential decline function. Well, what that meant was is that the propulsion system wasn't working. And what we eventually found out, and one of our students has just completed a master's degree on this, Marco Cagliari, who works for us, is that over 27 years, the nitrogen, uh, think of nitrogen pressurant in a spacecraft is like your fuel pump in a car. Doesn't matter how much gas you have in a car, if your fuel pump's not working, you're not going anywhere. Well, the nitrogen pressurant had leaked away. And what we think may have happened is that during the pass through the tail of the comet, a micrometeoroid uh, uh, penetrated the hull of the spacecraft and created what's called spall. And the spall didn't penetrate the tanks, but it thinned the tanks for the propulsion system enough to where nitrogen at the molecular level could seep out of the tanks. And it did that over 27 years. That's and the biggest hydrazine experts in the world, they couldn't come up with a better solution. So Marco's about to get his master's degree based on that. But be that as it may, we were able to do a bunch of science with the spacecraft. And this is from a website that Google Creative Labs did for us called Spacecraft for All, where we were able to get data. And unfortunately, since we weren't able to get it back into Earth orbit, uh, it's back out in the solar system, so we weren't going to be able to get this data all the time. But here's some of the data from the spacecraft. Now remember, the scientific instruments on this spacecraft hadn't been used since George Bush Sr. was in office. And so we recommissioned a few of the scientific instruments and what you see right here, uh, as the spacecraft's coming back into Earth orbit and passing by the moon, it comes through what's called the bow shock. And what the bow shock is, it's this um, oval, and you see that back here, dee, 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 dee. this, the front, oh, one more, uh, right here. That's called the bow shock, uh, the front there. So the scientific data actually showed us going through the bow shock. This is from ISCE3. It showed us going through the bow shock, the entrance to the shock, the exit, and the time, and it was utterly consistent with other spacecraft that we have that have been out there taking data. So even though we couldn't get the spacecraft back into Earth orbit, we pulled off a major, major hack. It was funny, Katie, the astronaut, uh, she came in there a while ago and I uh, met her and never talked to her before. She, and I told her what I was gonna be talking about. She said, that was good. And, and it's, we, we're very proud of what we're able to pull off. A very small team in a very, very, very limited amount of time, we were able to do what we did and basically, you know, I kind of uh, called upon my 40, now 40 plus years. I, I started out, I got my ham radio license. The, the internet of 1974 was called ham radio. Uh, and I got my ham radio license and worked on early microprocessors and did hacking. I worked in the computer industry in the 1980s, but I loved space so much that I went into space. We, I've flown a bunch of space hardware and all. And so, uh, we had a great team, a bunch of really good people, and NASA helped us out. And, and the time crunch, I think, really helped because everybody wanted to jump in. Oh, my God, can we actually pull this off? And I, I had dinner recently with the former center director at NASA, Goddard. Uh, he said, none of us thought you were going to be able to do it. Uh, and and we've, I'm just proud as punch of everybody that worked with us, the young engineers that we've trained, uh, even uh, high school students that were on the team helping us do stuff. And it's what we call techno-archaeology, which is literally the archaeology of technology. We're going back and we're digging through all of this old engineering data. We had to find out what are the command codes, what are the modulation schemes, how do we do it? 
how do we bring this back? It's like, you know, today, and I tell, I tell people when I talk about this, what if we had the engineering drawings for the Great Pyramid? Or just in the last couple of years, we've rediscovered the formula for concrete that the Romans had that resisted salt water. How much better would New York City bridges be if we still had that Roman concrete? Uh, because the region your bridges deteriorate around here, salt water. It's Roman concrete, doesn't have the problem. So there's technologies that we've had in human past and human history that even today we could use to help better our lives that we don't have. And so that's kind of the, what we did. And so what we're doing next is, uh, is working with the CubeSat business. We're gonna be building a large solar electric uh, spacecraft to carry CubeSats to higher orbits. We're gonna send our spacecraft past the moon, uh, out to the asteroid Apophis, and if I say anything about it, if we have enough fuel, I'm gonna go try to find the ISE-E3. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yep. Big mic in the back. Uh, so the, the Kevington event that you mentioned that fried the, the uh, Carrington, Carrington event. yes. yes. Um, how long did that last and how long did it take to recover, if you know? Well, uh, the Carrington event only lasted a few hours. And what it was is what's called a coronal mass ejection. The sun is always putting out energy. And what a coronal mass ejection is, is that you have billions of tons of hydrogen plasma that gets blasted off the sun. So this plasma of hydrogen gas is headed towards the Earth. And it only took about 18 hours for this hydrogen gas to get from the sun to the Earth. And it hit the Earth and what happened, like everybody knows what an aurora is. And so think of a, an aurora on steroids where they could have seen auroras in Jamaica. Uh, it hit the Earth's magnetic field and what it did, it, it, it generated electric currents in the Earth's crust. Uh, there was a small one in 1989 in Canada that knocked out the power grid in Canada because what a lot of people don't realize, the Earth, uh, there's a lot of iron, especially in the eastern United States because uh, it's close to what's called the shield or the bottom of the continent. And anywhere, and so what it does, it changes the ground potential. And your ground potential is no longer ground, and that basically fries everything. Uh, and those happen every few hundred years. Uh, and they happen in a time of low sun, solar activity, and the sun is about to transition back to a period of low solar activity. Do you have a question? So you mentioned other projects that NASA was thinking about decommissioning. Is there any projects you're working, or programs you're working with NASA on to like transition those projects that they might be decommissioning to the public Fantastic, space? Fantastic uh, question. There are, this year, uh, NASA's talking about uh, turning off Opportunity Rover on Mars, Cassini around Saturn, and LRO uh, in lunar orbit, lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Um, it's a bit outside of our possibility to try to take care of Cassini but I do think there are possibilities for the Mars rover, for Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and there's other satellites in Earth orbit that have been turned into dormant mode, but that could be revived for science. And literally, Dr. Grunsfeld, it was his intention and the folks at NASA headquarters to use our project as a template first to see if we could pull it off, but if we could pull it off to show that as a, let's call it a pathfinder, but other people who may want to take over satellites, and, and if you're a university institution, a nonprofit, or people that have some measure of credibility, I think there's going to be more and more opportunities uh, over the next several years to do just that. About how many dormant satellites do you think, can you estimate there are? Well, orbit? I know of probably 10 to 12 that are out there, including some. Uh, Pioneer 6 and Pioneer 9 from 1966 are still alive. And, um, I, and they're even simpler spacecraft. I think those could be contacted. 
ISCE 3 is still out there. Uh, it went into safe mode after it went beyond uh, the earth, and we're going to try to recover that and turn the science instruments back on. Uh, but there are actually several spacecraft out there, and, and I think it would be a wonderful thing uh, that if we could find a benefactor, because part of the thing with ISCE 3 is it was such a near-term crunch that a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't have kind of jumped in did. Uh, and after the flyby of the moon and it's back out in the solar system, people start to really want to get paid to do stuff. And so you have to have kind of a, a minimum amount of funding. But I think, uh, uh, and there's been volunteer groups that operate ground stations around the world. The Germans in, in Germany, at Bauckham, the Bauckham, uh, that that's, they used to be a ground station for NASA, and a bunch of ham radio guys took it over and operated as a radio observatory. And so there are opportunities and there are spacecraft out there to get. And, it, and there is value to it as well. It's just NASA doesn't have, and I tell you one thing about science and the science business, it's always easier to get money for the next big project than it is to process the data from the old, it's like the, the NASA guy that was just talking. I have been uh, on very small budgets. I reprocess the data from Nimbus from 1964 and 1966 and 1969. Here's some of the scientific value. In that reprocessed data, they found huge variations in the amount of ice in the Arctic and Antarctic from the mid-1960s that nobody had a clue about. Uh, we do the same thing. I, my other big project is that we've recovered the data from Lunar Orbiter from the mid-1960s and reprocess it to modern standards. So for citizen science, this is a huge frontier for citizen science uh, in taking data in startups. It, it's just, and I think the NASA guy was very right. There's a lot of stuff you can do with the free NASA data that's out there, and one thing he didn't bring up, but it, it's absolutely true, there's a company called the Climate Corporation. Talk about startups. A company called the Climate Corporation started out, I think they had six guys. They built an app using free Landsat data that transformed the insurance industry for crop insurance. Now, a farmer, one day he'll get a check in the mail that says, oh, we've analyzed by satellite, the production of your field is uh, likely to be down by 20%, here's your crop insurance check. No adjusters, no, no human in the loop at all. That, that business was sold to Monsanto for uh, $1.2 billion. And it was just six guys who built an app using free satellite data. So I, I really encourage folks to take a look at that NASA data website. I think there's some gold to be mined there. Thank you very much. And on that note. Okay, we're ready for the next, uh, cool. So our next speaker is Mike Lee. He's the founder and CEO of Studio... Studio Industries. Studio Industries, right? Which is a, a 
Innovation Agency, a food design and innovation agency, and he's also the founder of The Future Market, about which he's going to talk to us a bit today. Thanks. Hey guys, how you guys doing? Um, I'm a little bit of an outlier today, I think, because I'm maybe one of the only speakers that's not directly related to kind of space and space issues, but um, I'm here to talk to you about our project called The Future Market, which is tied to just aspirational uh, future thinking in the food world, which is really the second largest industry in uh, the world behind energy, and it touches all of us, yet paradoxically, I want to make the case that I think it's got the least amount of cutting edge innovation kind of focused onto it and we're trying to fix that a little bit. So um, the future market uh, was inspired by something that had nothing to do with food. Um, it was inspired by cars and auto shows. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, and uh, as a kid, I grew up going to the auto show every year, and I didn't really care too much about the you know, 1986 Ford Taurus. It was more about the concept cars that were up there. Um, and the concept car was always the most exciting part about the auto show for me because it just kind of showed that tomorrow would be okay. Um, something would be more interesting than we had today. Nobody expected that you would buy this thing today and actually drive it, but it really spurred ideas of the future that maybe could actually trickle down into stuff you do today. So maybe the 1987 Ford Taurus looks differently because somebody had created a concept car. Um, Fast forward to you know my current you know uh, role as as you know working in the food industry, uh, doing product design and innovation, um, and you realize that innovation means a lot different things depending on which industry you look at. I think uh, events like this, I think there's a very certain uh, definition of innovation, and I think we all kind of know what that is and we feel what that is. Um, I mean, it's literally stuff in space and it's really deep science and it's really amazing stuff that doesn't always translate into the world of food. And especially in, think about the center aisles of the grocery store, you know? So you look at other industries, and I worked in tech briefly too, and you look at like uh, Elon Musk, you know? He puts out, it wasn't enough for him to put out an electric car and change that industry. He put out this audacious idea of a Hyperloop, you know, get you to, from San Francisco to LA in 14 minutes. Google's self-driving car, Amazon's drone. Some of these may be actual, you know, production, technologies that will be out there and available to us, some of them not, but that's not really my point. I think when you look at food, I don't know what the answer is in the food world to this. You know, who's the Elon Musk of food that's trying to present a Hyperloop style idea? Who's the NASA of, of food that's really thinking forward uh, to the second largest you know, industry in our world, something that we all need for our lives? So really that was the genesis of where the future market um, really, really came from. I'm really uh, struck by this anecdote about Martin Cooper. Uh, Martin Cooper was the head of R&D at Motorola uh, in the 1970s, and he was the father of the modern American cell phone. He was the guy that led the charge to create the project that ultimately led to the thing he's got there in his hand, and you know, of course, uh, the thing that we can not live out with uh, today. Um, and I really love the fact that actually he went on record numerous times in interviews and in the press saying that one of his key inspirations for the cell phone was Star Trek, right? So to me this is really cool because a science fiction show um, kind of trickled down to somebody who was actually working at the helm of science and industry to really create something that completely changed you know, our, our mindset. Um, you know, I think, you know, especially here, we, we, we all kind of understand the effect and the imagination that Star Trek kind of stirs up in us, but I really like to see the fact that, um, you know, how can I create a Star Trek-like experience in the world of food that can inspire Martin Cooper's of today to create something as magnificent as the cell phone for, for food. So really, the whole thesis for the future market is, is around this statement. Um, I really believe that better innovation in food today starts with more ambitious thinking about tomorrow. Um, again, this is not second hat as much in the food industry, um, you know, as much as it in uh, as other industries. So you might look at this and you kind of say, well, it's really obvious. It's not as obvious as you think in some industries, and I'm imploring everybody to kind of really focus on it. This is your typical supermarket. Um, you know, like I said, you know, it's, it's such a big industry, but paradoxically, it gets so little innovation. Um, I always say that it's sort of the food industry is maybe 15 years behind uh, other industries that were upended by digital technology, things like media, things like music. Um, you know, Napster scared the crap out of record labels long before uh, any food company, you know, food startup could do it, because food is naturally just slower. It's inherently slower, it's capital intensive. Um, you can't iterate 50 times in a day like a Google could change their homepage um, in food because it's very slow and, and plotting. And as such, I think it just moves, you know, innovation moves a lot slower that way. 
It's not for want of effort, though. You know, right now is actually a really exciting time in food because there's more food startups than ever, and they're growing every day. Um, this is just a, you know, this is on purpose kind of an eye chart because just to show you the wealth of how many people are kind of focusing their energies um, on, on food issues. Um, but it's still got a long way to go. You know, uh, last year there was approximately six billion in venture capital and seed capital devoted to the food industry and food innovation. That's you know a, a fraction of the 48 or so that was kind of pumped into Silicon Valley for other things. So while it's kind of growing, um, you know, I, I would love to see that number be more than that 48. I would love to see these numbers kind of switch over in the near future. So really, what it comes down to it is, you know, our our question for our team. And uh, in, in last July, we, uh, we took over a beach house in New Jersey, and we locked ourselves in there for five days. Um, never saw the beach. Um, and we really just started this idea. Um, we're an agency by trade, so we take on client work. And we kind of said that this was the client project that no client ever asked us to do, and we just wanted to see. And the whole goal was try to create this loop again. You know, Try to get a Captain Kirk type thing to inspire a Martin Cooper, but just for food. This is an early sketch, really, really early sketch. Um, we've just scratched the surface on this, but you know we're using this paradigm of a market. Um, we don't want to change it too much because we want to have some part of it feel familiar. The ideas and the concepts that we want to present inside of it, um, I think, are trying to be a little bit more out of the worldly. So we don't want to change the whole thing and make it like you know a holodeck or something like that because I don't think people can anchor uh, their minds around that. The beauty of grocery stores, it's a language that everyone in the room understands. You may or may not understand or care about you know physics or science but everybody gets what it means to go through a grocery store and everybody gets what it means to eat and, and shop for food so this is the visual uh, language that we wanted to choose um, you know one of the things we play with here is you can kind of see this greenery this active live greenery um, you know we want to play with the idea of like you know how much can a grocery store become the site of production versus just a receptacle for other people's production you know our centralized food system was designed in the 60s and 70s when gas was cheap when it was more efficient to actually build humongous farms and truck it out to everyone. And really, the grocery stores were just boxes with cash registers. Um, oil's not cheap anymore, you know, and not like it used to be. And there's so many other problems with that. So how do you make it, how do you destroy the supply chain for food? You know, how could you eliminate every single truck that has to ship food out to a grocery store? Well, you look at things like hydroponic you know, gardening, stuff like that. You look at stuff like rooftop farms, which I see as version 1.0 technologies. They're very big, they're very clunky, but as we know in technology, technology tends to get cheaper, more high-performing, and smaller over time. So our concept is in 50 years, you know, what could happen if that big hulking urban farm on the rooftop of the Whole Foods in Gowanus could just literally be compactized and, and accelerated to fit inside of a bodega? You know, so these are the kind of ideas we're doing. We chose 50 years uh, purposefully. Um, you know, in the food industry, I think most people can't think past the next five weeks. Um, and 50 years, we definitely chose purposely because it's far enough that um, it just signifies this as being an abstract kind of concept thinking. Um, people walk into kind of uh, food trade shows and things like that, and they say, "Oh well, I don't know if that couple. You know, what's the unit price on that? You know, how many how many SKUs you're going to stock? What's the velocity of that? You know, that's like." today's kind of world of thinking. They're always thinking about next quarter. Um, this clearly signifies it. It's not a trade show. It's not about trying to get something on the shelf right now. It's about spurring your thinking and actually imagining a world without constraints and then trying to bring that thought back to a world that does have constraints. So we have six aisles. So like the aisles in a regular grocery store, we have six aisles, but instead of uh, categorizing things by ingredients, we're categorizing them by uh, six really big themes that we think are gonna really upend the world of food in the next 50 years or sooner. Distributed production is one. Um, distributed production really uh, goes to the, 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 the thing I said before about um, what can you produce in a grocery store versus having it centralized. You know, How can you split up supply chains so it has less links um, and, and, and you know, what can you do to grow food and cultivate food? Cultured protein, things like that, uh, hydroponic you know, greens and things like that. How can you shrink that down and have that at the site of purchase instead of kind of centralized? 
hyper customization. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of kind of uh, startups and technologies today, like you know things like Fitbit and like anything that's kind of um, you know connected self stuff that's trying to track little pieces of the things you do, the things you eat, the things you walk, the things you feel. Um, I don't know that anyone's really cobbled it all together yet, but we want to jump to 50 years out where we say, okay, well let's forget the messy part in the middle where we've figured out all that stuff. What could you do if you could capture the entire kind of data set coming out from a person, you know? And, and make it seamless so it's not so obvious as pulling out your cell phone and like scanning things and stuff like that. Um, could you walk into a restaurant and everyone could see different menus based on what they need in their diet or what their dietary restrictions are, you know? Avoiding that whole uh, thing that my wife always does, does this have gluten, does this have cilantro, does this have that, you know? Imagine that, you know, imagine that food is on demand and there's no such thing as one size fits all food. You know, think about that. One size fits all food. People take really big bets and they make one type of cookie or something like that and they just try to get, cram it down everyone's throats. But what if you could kind of specialize food and especially if you could produce food on site uh, to exactly what people need? Alternative protein is a really um, big one and it's one that's really starting to bubble up right now. Um, I work with a company called EXO. Uh, they manufacture energy bars that are made from cricket protein. Um, Oddly enough, I think the United States is actually somewhat in the minority of, of, of the countries in the world that actually don't really have a big, you know, healthy attitude towards insect protein. Um, you don't have to go further than Mexico to go to a bar and you'll get a, a bowl of, you know, roasted uh, grasshoppers to eat with, you know, your tequila or your mezcal. Um, so alternative proteins kind of comes in one way, you know, the, you know the, the idea of eating crickets instead of beef it has huge implications for what it could do to the environment. Um, a cricket is 70% protein by mass. Um, a cow is somewhere around like 27%, right? So imagine the amount of resources and land mass you could save if you could shift a meaningful amount of people from animal, large animal protein to something like insect protein, you know? I'm not saying it's trying to replace the steak you have at Peter Luger's, but what if all the ground beef and all the things that came to McDonald's, all that kind of substandard meat today was replaced by something like insect protein? I think that's really exciting. Um, there's another theme, there's another company uh, called um, Modern Meadow, they're based in Brooklyn. Um, they're working on cultured meat. Um, what they're doing is they're taking skin biopsies of cows um, and they're literally growing them in cell culture, culture in a completely sterile environment, growing uh, flesh and they're growing leather. Um, you know, again, it's ridiculously expensive to do this right now, but that's not the point. I think the price I hopefully will get down over time and it will become more ubiquitous. Um, but you know, they have this vision of kind of having, um, meteries, uh, like instead of a brewery, like a meadery where you have these giant vats that are kind of culturing this meat. Um, and a lot of people say like, Oh, what, you know, why would you eat meat that came from a lab? Um, you know, I really implore those people to really go see what a real meat processing plant looks like, and you might be actually more inclined to eat meat from a lab. Um, so this is a really interesting idea that I think is so audacious, and maybe, you know, on a 50-year timeline, they have a big chance at making a really big dent in our world. Um, waste. Waste is huge. Um, we're, our Earth is, is, is going to be about 10 billion people in 50 years. Um, and, you know, I don't think we have a problem of supplying enough food for the world. It's just a problem of distribution and, and use of the food that we do have. Um, I think, you know, countries that suffer from obesity have too food and there's too much food and there's countries that suffer from starvation that have too little food. That's a distribution problem to me and I think waste is a big part of it. Um, Dan Barber, he's a really influential chef, uh, owns, runs a Blue Hill restaurant in the West Village and at Stone Barns. He just finished a 21-day uh, uh, kind of special pop-up where he redesigned his restaurant and he called the, 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 the program, he called it Wasted. And instead of this kind of three Michelin star menu like you're used to there, all of the food on the menu he created from foods that are typically thrown away. And I'm talking about rotten food, but I'm talking about like at a vegetable processing plant where they're peeling carrots or, um, you know, cutting up, you know, broccoli for pre-cut things. Um, there's so much scrap that just gets thrown out. And what he wanted to do was apply his kind of team of three Michelin star chefs to all of these, you know, garbage items um, and, and, and make it something really interesting and show people that, you know, there's, there's many ways to, to eat food than just kind of eating the crowns of the broccoli and things like that. Um, and I'll have to say, I, I had the, the pleasure of going and uh, his food with waste food is probably better than most people's restaurants with regular food. So um, if that's where we're heading, that's pretty hopeful. 
mass sustainability. Um, so this is the topic that uh, you know I'll talk about maybe a little bit more in a second because it uh, it was the theme that our first prototype product really centered around. Um, but really, you know, right now we kind of have this dichotomy of there's like the Dan Barbers of the world that do these really nice art artisanal organic farms and everything's really well run and efficient and it's, you know, the most sustainable farm possible. On the other end, you've got agribusiness, which, you know, pumps out so much food but is, you know, hardly very sustainable. Um, in today's world, those are two things that are sort of mutually exclusive and I want to believe in 50 years that they aren't going to be mutually exclusive anymore. So how do we do massively sustainable stuff at scale? Um, you know, is that is that possible? And then population growth. This touches on a lot of things around waste, um, but you know, this we can kind of tackle that debate of you know GMO. You know, a lot of people say you know how can we feed all these people in ten billion you know ten billion people uh, without crops that are optimized? Um, you know, I think it's a really contentious argument. We kind of want to face that head on. How do we feed the world um, in, in ten uh, with ten billion people? We made one rule for ourselves: is not make anything up. Um, we didn't want this to be complete science fiction or just fantasy. Um, our process is really around extrapolating ideas that we see today that are sort of on the fringe. So what ideas in food today are happening that maybe only under 1,000 people are really interested in? Um, and then blow that up in 50 years and say, what if those 1,000 people you know, could play the whole chessboard and they could do what they wanted to? You know, what happens when cultured meat becomes uh, the de facto standard? You gotta remember in 50 years, this grocery store wouldn't be for any of us in this room, it would be for our grandkids. So think about not only the technological things that would jump in 50 years, which I think we can all visually kind of see, but think about the cultural things that'll change too. Things that are disgusting to us might be just perfectly acceptable to our kids. You know, think about that gap that you have today with your grandparents in terms of culture, and then amplify that up 50 years. And I think once you kind of think on the cultural level as well as technological technological, your mind really starts to open up to what's possible. So we just started on this project. Um, we are planning to launch a digital version early summer, and then we're planning this winter um, to do a one month long physical pop-up in New York City where we're gonna actually have the grocery store and actually have prototypes for people that can, they can buy them and they can taste them and they can eat them and kind of immerse themselves in you know, all of these kind of themes of, of, of what the future holds. Um, we, did, we debuted our idea at the Future Food Expo in Brooklyn um, back in September. Um, we set our table up like, a, uh, like you would a traditional trade show table uh, with our first prototype product, and it was pretty funny because people actually thought we were you know, a manufacturer of these products, and you know, we had grocery stores asking us for a sell sheet and things like that. Um, but this was really the first start of the idea, and the first product we launched was Crop Crisps. Now, you might be thinking this doesn't look terribly futuristic or anything like that, um, and you know, sort of that, that was on purpose for us. Uh, we, this is a cracker, it comes in four flavors, and um, you might notice that it looks very similar to a cracker that you guys may have in your grocery store right now. Um, but you know, I think it speaks, that, it speaks to, from this place that it looks very mass. It doesn't look like it's you know, some hipster in Brooklyn kind of making this in his or her loft. This looks like a manufactured product and we want to do that on purpose. So the trick here is that these four flavors are actually only available one year at a time. And the idea is that these four flavors are actually indexed to crops that are in a proper crop rotation. So today, a wheat thin is all about wheat all the time, anywhere, all the same wheat, standardized. The only way to do that is to really reinforce this monoculture where you're nailing the soil with nitrogen fertilizers and you're basically just nuclear bombing the soil of all those nutrients because you're just adding all the stuff back in there. That's really what supports a product like a wheat thin because we've all come to expect the same damn wheat all the same damn time. The idea of crop rotation is basically saying like, okay, this year we're gonna plant wheat Okay, we're gonna harvest. Next year, we need to fix the nitrogen in the soil, so we're gonna plant a legume, right? A legume will capture the nitrogen from the air and bring it back to the soil and then self-fertilize the soil. You don't need external fertilizer. You don't need anything based you know, with petroleum. You can just kind of plant wheat the next year and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's kind of strange to say in 50 years, like here's a cracker, right? You know, can we make crackers today? Of course we can make crackers. Um, can we do crop rotation today? Of course we can do crop rotation. The point here is that it's the combination of those two on a mass level. Instead of all of these monoculture farms, what if the entire system was doing stuff the same way that a small farm upstate New York did? You know, what kind of impact could that have on the planet? So that I think is where we're trying to you know, pinpoint the, the, the forward lookingness. That's I think where the future uh, lies is stuff like this, mass sustainability. 
Uh, we even went as far to create a, a fictitious newspaper. This is us taking a page out of the onion. We call it the Future Chronicle. Um, it's published bi-weekly, uh, but it's basically whatever today's date is plus 50 years. Um, we realized that in a pop-up, uh, you know, we can't necessarily tell all the stories that we want to tell um, in one kind of elegant space. So this is sort of a long-form way for us to explain, uh, explore a lot of interesting themes that we think are uh, are going to happen. Um, and you know, it's 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 approaching the these heady themes of sustainability, environmentalism, with a little bit of fun, uh, which I think is a little bit disarming because I think those arguments can get very heated sometimes. So like I said, we're very at the very start, um, but you know, what I would say as you guys are here this, this, this weekend is uh, I would implore you guys to really take another look at the, the really interesting problems we have in food. Um, I think a lot of opportunity is there, and I think it's a really important thing, um, and I would really love to see just kind of more talented scientists and engineers kind of trying to hack the food system um, instead of kind of doing what we have today. So the future market is still under construction, but you know, I would love to partner with anybody who is you know, interested in these issues um, or has an interesting opinion about what the food world could look like uh, in 50 years. Thank you. Any questions for Mike? Oh. Um, hi, are you familiar with uh, the product called Soylent? Uh, it was made a few years ago. Yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, on how that may change the food industry? Uh, you know, I. Everybody, a lot of people come to me and say like, oh, you're doing a future market? What's that? So are we going to all be eating Soylent, you know? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, kale is hot right now. Everyone in the room doesn't eat kale 24 hours a day. Um, I think Soylent's interesting. I think Soylent is interesting because it can really serve a really good need in terms of providing precise nutrition in places where um, a food system is very hard to sustain, places like space. Um, as a lifestyle in society, I don't think Soylent will become the mainstream because there's an emotional part to eating that we can't discount. Um, you know, it, it's not terribly hard to make something like Soylent and, you know, it's been around for years, but why hasn't it become mainstream? It's because food is as much cultural as it is, you know, nutritional. So I see it as an interesting kind of splinter cell of people. That, that use that stuff, but... Um, oh, but so yeah. Soylent is, just for the... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Soylent is, um, is a startup uh, from the West Coast. Uh, it's basically a powdered meal replacement, and he's calibrated it to be perfectly nutritious so that the idea is you don't have to eat real food anymore. You can just literally just make these shakes. Um, he, you know, in an arguable PR branding move, he named it Soylent after the movie Soylent Green. Um, but I can assure you it's not made of people. Um, my wife is like, you know, obsessional healthy eater and she eats, and so she used to drink soy milk and everything and all this kind of thing and eat seitan and so on. And then she f she's going into sort of menopause, but she found out that it has estrogen and it has like things like that in it, and she still now won't touch it with a barge pole. Is there any concern about this kind of thing with hormones? And yeah, um, you know, so, so that's a big theme for us is, um, you know, I would argue the the reason why we have so many hormones and, and fertilizers in our food is because of the way we're growing it and the demand that, that the food industry places. Um, if you try to grow all one thing all the time, you naturally need to add a lot more stuff and you need hormones to grow the, you know, increase the yield. You need antibiotics to increase the resistance because there's a lack of biodiversity. Um, I think that, you know, people are like, oh, what's the product of the future? I don't think it's one product or one kind of product. I think it's actually a much larger uh, family of products. Um, because right now everything is corn and soy, and there's a lot of problems behind that. But I think that, you know, like the crop crisp, we should be able to digest and understand more than just one or two kinds of crops. Um, and be able to kind of have a, a much more diverse diet. And if we have a much more diverse diet, we have a much more diverse farming system. And I think that really, um, you know, cancels out the need for a lot of things like, you know, fertilizers and hormones and things like that. Hi. Your, your venture is, is a proponent of a reversion of uh, crop uh, rotation. Mm -hmm. All right. And to me, it's like the old style was always the best. 
you know, and now everything is going back to the old style. We're going back to organic. We're going back to crop rotation, you know, and we're trying to get away from GMOs. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually am, a, am a very appreciative of that, you know, because we have no idea what GMOs are going to do to our, our bodies, our children, our children's children in the future. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a very disconcerting uh, thing for me to think about, you know, and it's, you know, it, it, I appreciate you bringing this up, you know. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, and, and like I said before, it, it, you know, we very strategically chose the supermarket in a very mass angle because we want to show this is not just a bunch of hippies doing this. This is like what is the de facto way of growing food, um, of, uh, you know, in the future. Um, and it's interesting to think about also, especially in food, what gets more cold and technological and efficient and what gets more natural, you know, and how do you smash those together? You know, I, you get these two poles of people that think like, oh, we're all going to be like agrarian farmers again. I don't think that's the... Thing. And you get the other poll of people that says we're all going to be eating food and pills and like soylent. I don't think that's right either. I think there's somewhere in the middle um, that that that's where the, the answer lies, and it's using technology to make the most out of nature's system, which is the most intelligent system that we've ever had. You know what? I I think one of the basic problems with society today is that people don't want to cook, yeah. all right? So people are looking for something that's instantly gratifying, yeah. you know, something that they can just put in a blender or, or throw in a microwave, you know? And they're missing so much flavor, yeah. so much more textures, you know? It's, it's just boggles my mind when yeah. I think about it, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, the, um, the, the food writer Michael Pollan, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few years ago and uh, he said, he proposed to America, I have a brand new diet for you, and I'll share it with you guys. The diet's very simple, you can eat whatever you want, and you can eat in any quantity you want. The only catch is you have to cook it yourself. Has anybody ever made fried chicken from scratch? It's a pain. <laughs> Trust me, if you made it all by yourself, fried chicken, chocolate cake, you wouldn't eat it too much. It would just be a treat and it would just be something different. So yes, I, I think cooking is not just interesting from a cultural and culinary point of view. Um, I think when you work with raw materials, you get to understand them better and you appreciate them better. And I think that forces you to demand better products in the future. And I think cooking is really just, you know, where the rubber hits the road, so. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was curious what your thoughts were on um, one of the points you brought up on hyper customization. So um, in the future market, how would that evolve? Because I see a lot of um, a lot of ourselves kind of returning inward and that hyper customization being addressed in a very um, small scale in a personal environment. Right. How does that um, how does like a person in the future then um, go and externally um, source their food and change environments in yeah, that way. Yeah. Well, so, like, so why would they want to, I guess? No, yeah. right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think everybody would want to. I think the fact that the, tech, the option would be there is interesting. So for us, practically speaking, um, this idea of hyper-customization was really born out of actually another brainstorm we had around kind of on-demand food production. So um, 3D food printing technology exists today. Yeah. I would argue it's it's the equivalent of in video games like Pong, you know? But I think in, you know, look how far we've come from Pong in 30, 40 years. We've got Halo now. Um, what happens when 3D food printing gets to that Halo stage where you literally could immediately kind of print something that, that is edible and, and recognizable as food, right? Because I think the customization is not really that interesting if you can't actually customize it, right? And aside from having the, the omelet guy, you know, make you an omelet like that, which is, I think is kind of superficial, um, I think it'd be much more interesting where you could have kind of nutrient cartridges that are inserting into 3D printing of food and actually make something that is designed for your body chemistry, for your mood, for your whatever. Um, so, so I think those two themes are kind of hand in hand, but you know, for us, it's, it's all about just, you know, what if, what if we had everything that was in your head and was immediately transmittable, what could you do with that? I'm obviously taking, you know, it's sort of a cop out for us because we're like, we're not going to worry about how to create what if. I just want to focus on the end goal and then maybe I can inspire more people to figure out how to create the technology behind it. 
I think um, also, I'm not sure if you're looking at them, but Boots in the UK is doing some cool stuff as a grocery model, and yeah. um, I know they've already implemented 3D printers yeah. there as well. That's great. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Other questions? The mic? Still too long? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. away from here just a couple of blocks down there on the uh, west side highway and 46th street so if you're uh, bored and you're in, uh, in town go ahead and check it out uh, we do a lot of great stuff uh, one of the things we've been doing recently is uh, we've been talking a lot about the hubble space telescope it's the 25th anniversary of launching the hubble space telescope and uh, we had uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to create a really great uh, uh, exhibition about Hubble at 25. It's a really great exhibition. This uh, presentation I'm going to give you is uh, uh, designed as a complement of that exhibition. So if you do get a chance uh, to check out the Intrepid, definitely go to the Space Shuttle Pavilion and check out that exhibition. Uh, now, uh, I call this presentation the focus on the Hubble. It's a challenge to improve our greatest telescope. Now, the Hubble uh, wasn't our first space telescope. Uh, it was the largest when it was launched. We have a, a couple bigger ones now, but it, it still uh, really provided some of the best data we have of any of our space telescopes. One of the main reasons for that is that it was designed from the beginning uh, to be upgraded with our space uh, shuttle that we, uh, we have uh, uh, started producing right about the same time we started working on the Hubble. But the idea for a space telescope far predates uh, the space shuttle or even our ability to get anything into space. In the 1920s, they thought of it. They knew it was going to be a good idea uh, to get a telescope above our atmosphere, because our atmosphere, as nice it is it, as it is for us, it does uh, refract or bend light as it comes through it, and that's going to make all the images you're going to get from outside of the atmosphere a little fuzzy. Uh, now, uh, they had, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, we had uh, some great ideas in 1952. This is uh, one of the, uh, the famous articles we like to pull out at the Intrepid, uh, written by William Von Braun. Now, he's uh, a great rocket scientist, really a brilliant guy. He uh, got his uh, start working for the Germans in World War II, uh, but after World War II, we brought him over to the United States. Uh, uh, got to pick his brain about all uh, the things he was uh, going to expect to have happen in that century, and a lot of them uh, really did. Uh, now, they don't look like uh, they looked back in 1952. You're going to see a space shuttle, uh, I'm sorry, a space station in a big circle. If you've ever seen photos of the International Space Station, you know it's, it's not a circle. And uh, similarly, you have that kind of cool looking uh, pointy space plane. Uh, well, if you've seen the space shuttle, uh, it uh, looks a little bit differently. If you haven't seen a space shuttle, we do have one at the Intrepid right now, the uh, Enterprise, really the prototype space shuttle. Looks a little different, but the same concept. It's going to be a spacecraft that's going to uh, enter low Earth orbit and then come back as an aircraft and it's going to land just like an airplane. Yeah, and uh, that's the same concept. Also in the same article, 1952, you'll see a space telescope. They still thought it was a good idea back then. Uh, now, we didn't actually get around to start building the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, I'm going upside down here. There you go. Hubble Space Telescope until 1978. Uh, so that was a while ago. That was the year I was born to. Uh, and it's also a year before the Sony Walkman came out. Give you an idea of what technology they were working with back in uh, 1978. And uh, that's one of the main reasons they made uh, the Hubble Space Telescope upgradable. They knew 
<laughs> that our technology was going to increase, and boy, were they right. Uh, now, 1978 was a while ago. We wanted to get the Hubble into orbit in the uh, early 80s, really. Uh, that didn't actually happen. We had some budgetary and uh, uh, design delays, and then, of course, in 1986, we had a first uh, big tragedy with Space Shuttle when we lost uh, Space Shuttle Challenge and, our, and uh, seven of our astronauts. So we were delayed all the way until 1990, 25 years ago this month. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, the launch went off perfectly. The deployment went off very well. Here it is. Uh, now, by the way, it, it's a little hard to tell the scale in this, but the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of uh, one of those big yellow school buses. And it was deployed using the Canada Arm, or uh, more formally called the Remote Manipulation System. That's that big arm attached to the Hubble in the photo there. And that uh, deployment with, uh, went out without a hitch. Beautiful deployment. And then they started to get information back from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the photos we were getting were quite a bit fuzzier than we expected. Yeah, there was a polishing error in the mirror. Now, this mirror is a pretty big mirror, eight feet tall, taller than I am. And uh, the error is actually relatively small in comparison to that whole mirror. It's a polishing error, really a calibration error in one of the tools. And they polished the edge of the mirror a little bit too flat. And when I say a little bit, I really do mean a minuscule amount. The error was, uh, what it, it's equivalent to about 1 50th of the width of a human hair. That's, that's still going to make pretty fuzzy images, though. Kind of weird that that small, small error is going to make such a big difference. But it did. And this, let me tell you, was a huge political relations nightmare. Uh, you know, uh, political cartoonists uh, like to make fun of it a lot. Let's see if I can help you out there. Is that a little bit more stable? Yeah, I got a little flicker there, but uh, yeah. Uh, the political cartoonists like to make fun, a lot, uh, fun of it a lot, and uh, we were already having a little bit of uh, uh, public relationship issues in terms of the, the space programs here in the United States, uh, so this was not helpful. Now, scientifically, it wasn't a complete failure. Give you an idea of the difference here. This is uh, uh, two photos of a binary star. Uh, the one there on your right hand, uh, or actually I guess it's on your left hand side, is uh, is what you can get from the Earth. So it's still quite a bit fuzzier than what you get in the Hubble. You can actually tell those two stars are very distinct units uh, with the Hubble. So we're still getting a little bit of scientific in information, but nowhere near as much as we wanted. Luckily, from the very beginning of the Hubble program, we designed it to be serviced in low Earth orbit, which is pretty amazing. So it was really designed um, uh, to have the capabilities of our space shuttle program in mind. And the space shuttle uh, was easily able to get back up to low Earth orbit and service the uh, Hubble uh, with the first servicing mission in 1993. Uh, now this is a, a pretty cool one because uh, it uh, corrected that mirror error. And the main way it did that was with the corrective optic space telescope axial um, uh, replacement. Um, that's a mouthful, so uh, everybody called it CoStar. And it's a <laughs> big box you can see there being taken out of the big uh, payload bay of the space shuttle. And uh, that CoStar is uh, uh, a little box that has uh, arms in it with mirrors at the end of the arms. They swing out so they can refocus the light with the mirror error uh, coming off of that uh, main mirror into the instruments with an automatic correction. They also replaced one of the instruments on the um, Hubble Space Telescope with a built-in correction. And uh, that's important. I'm going to bring that up a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but the basic thing you need to know about that mission is it fixed the problem. I can see the difference right here. Uh, much, much clearer after that CoStar replacement and the upgrade with the uh, instrument they replaced. Uh, very uh, beautiful images are coming back, and we're getting a lot of scientific discoveries as well. Here's another great example of a before and after picture. This is a, a distant star, give you an idea of the type of objects that the Hubble studies and the uh, uh, kind of fuzziness around it. These are uh, uh, disks of uh, dust that uh, are probably going to someday form p uh, planets, maybe uh, similar to the Earth, and probably what the Earth's solar system looked like before the Earth was formed. So we're learning a lot about the universe in, w in which we live, uh, even after that first uh, uh, upgrade. Uh, fortunate timing happened as well. Uh, this is a picture of Jupiter. Now, remember that uh, repair mission happened in 1993. 1994? Uh, something kind of exciting happened. A big comet crashed into Jupiter, <laughs> the Shoemaker-Levy comet, and it left these giant scars. That's a scar down in the, the kind of lower, uh, from your perspective, right-hand side of Jupiter there. And that's, uh, that's about the size of the Earth, by the way, <laughs> to give you an idea of how massive this impact was. Now, the Hubble didn't get to take a photo of that impact because uh, it was on the other side of Jupiter. Uh, we did have a, a little... Um, 
uh, probe out there that was actually launched by a space shuttle as well, uh, the Galileo probe that took some photos of that impact. But uh, the Hubble has uh, a bit more uh, uh, advanced equipment, so we could uh, study all the, the gases that got churned up from that impact. We're usually only able to study the surface gases of Jupiter, which, by the way, is just one huge big ball of gas. With this impact, we're able to, uh, to learn about what's underneath there, and it turns out we were wrong about some of the stuff. We thought there was uh, going to be more water under there, for instance, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's always fun when scientists uh, have predictions that, that uh, they get wrong, but it's also fun when they have predictions that go right. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that doesn't look like much to, to someone who doesn't uh, know a lot about astronomy, but this is a... Is a uh, uh, a galaxy, and you can see how fast it's uh, spinning around the galactic core with this photo, and this uh, uh, proves something that Einstein predicted with his general theory of relativity, uh, that there should be a, a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy, which uh, is pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, we also get some uh, really cool photos back, like uh, the Eta Carina, give you another idea of the type of uh, objects we're studying at this time. Uh, and Eta Carina is a, a star that has outbursts. And uh, uh, the biggest outburst uh, we've seen with Eta Carina happened back in the 19th century. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, it had a big outburst. And uh, you can only see this, by the way, from the southern hemisphere, but it was the brightest star in the southern, southern hemis hemisphere. And we think it's going to explode all the way pretty soon. Uh, which is going to be pretty fun. So we have a lot of uh, telescopes looking at this all the time because we want to see a big supernova uh, when um, we have uh, our modern instruments pointed at it. Uh, now, in 1997, uh, we have our uh, second servicing mission, uh, which is a pretty good one uh, because we're going to extend the, uh, the, the vision of Hubble from just the visible light to uh, light we can't see. Uh, the... Uh, uh, visible light is uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It ranges uh, uh, from the, uh, the violet color to the red color. And if you go above the violet cover, uh, color, you get ultraviolet. Below the red cover, color, you get infrared. And we're able to see both of those uh, areas of the spectrum with the Hubble after this uh, upgrade mission in 1997. We're able to study things we wouldn't be able to see before, like the uh, aurora of Saturn. Uh, Saturn has aurora, similar to our aurora, borea aurora borealis here on Earth. Uh, it's an uh, interaction between uh, the uh, 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 electromagnetic uh, uh, field around that planet and the, uh, uh, the uh, solar winds, and that's uh, going to be pretty cool. Uh, you can only see that in infrared, though. Uh, that's not the natural color. So what they have to do is take the uh, uh, infrared image they get from Hubble and uh, choose a color and replace uh, that in uh, the, I'm sorry, this is ultraviolet, ultraviolet <laughs> Uh, information getting from Hubble with the color we can see, like this uh, particularly nice shade of blue. Uh, now we uh, are still uh, continuing to see things uh, with uh, the visible spectrum, and uh, Levi Einstein, he made a lot of predictions we're able to, to see evidence of in, uh, in, with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is uh, an Einstein ring, which is pretty cool. This uh, uh, kind of yellowish blob in the center here is a really big galaxy, and it's so big that it's warping space around it, like Einstein's uh, theory of re relativity predicted, and uh, that uh, blue circle around it, that's a galaxy, or the light from a galaxy, that's almost directly behind that galaxy in front of it, and uh, the only reason we're able to see it is because the light's being warped around that galaxy in the front. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, in 1999, we have another servicing mission. This is 3A. Yeah, you'll see a little letter in there. This was not a planned mission. This was a bit of an emergency mission. And it was an emergency mission for uh, two reasons. Uh, one reason is that we uh, had some gyroscopes fail. Uh, to aim the Hubble Space Telescope with the precision we needed uh, need to, to, to take good pictures, uh, we have to have uh, three gyroscopes working. And uh, we sent the Hubble up with six. So if uh, any three of those failed, we'd still be able to point it at uh, whatever we wanted to. Uh, by uh, 1999, four of those had failed. So when he had two left, it was in safe mode by the time uh, uh, the space shuttle got there. And uh, to make matters worse, it was 1999. Uh, you might remember something happened in 1999. We were worried about the Y2K bug. Yeah, so we were worried about thinking it's 1900 next year. So uh, they had to replace the main computer there. Uh, they also, um, uh, actually, that's no, not this one. The next one uh, was actually the regularly serviced uh, mission, the uh, uh, 3B. And this one was pretty cool. They uh, actually replaced the solar panels, made them uh, smaller, and uh, made them more efficient, which is pretty cool. They also replaced the, uh, the cooling system uh, for the infrared camo, camera, which is pretty cool. And they also replaced the, uh, the basically the big main camera uh, so we can uh, get information faster. We were able to get much bigger images, uh, like this galaxy here. <clears throat> 
Modern I mean, this galaxy uh, uh, was so big as far as uh, data when it came back to Earth that uh, NASA had to put a warning on uh, images like this for all the people back in 2002 uh, with their dial-up modems that this might crash your computer. So warning, it's a really big file. It's how detailed these images we're getting back from the Hubble Space Telescope is. And I always like to take a, a little side trip here to talk a little bit about Edwin Hubble. He's the guy the Hubble Space Telescope's named after. And uh, he got his uh, uh, really big name by uh, discovering that there are, are, are other galaxies kind of seems amazing uh, today, but uh, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, people didn't think that there were other galaxies. We thought the Milky Way was it, uh, but uh, well, Edwin Hubble was taking a look at these uh, kind of spiral shape, what they were calling nebula at the time, and he's really like, okay, uh, these uh, are much further away than we think, and they're much, much bigger than we think, and we're realizing that these are other galaxies similar in many respects to our own. Now, this isn't our galaxy, uh, but if it were, we would be about uh, two-thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy, and uh, it's, uh, it's bright in the center because there's a lot of stars, but there's also a lot of dust in there, and when we try to look at the center of our own galaxy, a lot of that dust gets in the way. One thing infrared light is good at doing, though, is going around the dust, uh, so this is uh, a really nice image the Hubble brought back to us uh, from the center of our galaxy with that infrared capability and that was the increased by the extra uh, cooling system we put on the Hubble during this last mission which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, and you're also able to study uh, these nebula which are big clouds of dust which are pretty fun uh, and uh, they kind of move throughout the galaxy and uh, you'll see uh, uh, the stars in there have uh, these kind of bow shapes in front of them, kind of like the wake in a boat. And that's where you can see where the motion is going in these photos, which is kind of fun. Uh, they're what we call bow shocks, uh, which are pretty th uh, cool things to study. Uh, and this is probably the most, uh, I think, awe-inspiring photos that Hubble has uh, brought back to us. And it was brought back in this time. Uh, it is uh, the deep field image. And this is kind of a fun photo. It's uh, taken, of course, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, from Earth, the same patch of the night sky could be covered up with a pinhead from arm's length. It gives you an idea of how tiny this patch of the night sky is. And uh, uh, it looks like complete darkness from Earth, but with a very long exposure on Hubble with a, a lot of orbits going around making the same exposure, you're able to see all these little points of light. And with three or four exceptions, uh, these points of light, they're not stars, no. no. They're entire galaxies full of uh, hundreds of billions of stars. Gives a little bit of perspective on, uh, on how, yeah, really how big and how vast our universe really is. Uh, kind of fascinating there. Uh, now, uh, we also have uh, the last servicing mission, servicing mission four. Now, this is a big one. We know it's going to be the last one. This is in um, 2009. And uh, a lot of the uh, artifacts we have at the Intrepid today as part of our uh, Hubble at 25 uh, display we have there come from this mission, which is pretty cool. And it was a pretty extensive mission because they knew it was the last one. Uh, they uh, uh, did a lot of uh, preparation work. They had to build tools. That's what's happening in the upper uh, right-hand corner here. These are, are brand new tools because they're replacing parts on the Hubble they didn't expect to replace. They didn't expect it to last this long. So they're replacing uh, instruments they didn't just uh, didn't build the tools for that have to work in space, which is a very unforgiving environment. Uh, the guy who's uh, using that tool up there, he's Mike Massimino. Uh, I'd like to give him a quick shout out. He's actually uh, a professor at Columbia now. He also comes down and helps us out uh, when he gets a chance, and he really helped us set up that display we have at the Intrepid today. Uh, he had to do a lot of rehearsal, as well as his entire team that went up there on that mission, and a lot of that happened in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory uh, on the top left there. Uh, this is actually a pretty fun laboratory. It's basically a giant swimming pool, and uh, you get a, a, a simulate a lot of what happens at that, that microgravity environment, uh, because every second you have in space is, is very precious. And I, I do have to point out, these astronauts are uh, really bold people. Uh, one of our missions at the Intrepid is really to uh, honor our heroes. And let me tell you, these guys are heroes. They're risking their lives for science when you think about it. This is 2009. By this time, we didn't just have uh, one big space disaster, but two. We lost two space shuttles. These guys are still willing to go up there to service the Hubble, make sure it, uh, we get as much great scientific information as we can out of that, uh, uh, that space telescope. And the Hubble, by the way, is further out 
uh, there, uh, than anything else that the, uh, the space shuttles were meant to, to deploy or service. And, uh, and it's really as far as we've been since the Apollo programs back in the, the uh, 70s. So uh, these guys are really bold fellows. Uh, down in the, uh, the, the lower left-hand corner, you're going to see a, a photo of a big, uh, big basically refrigerator-sized thing he's pulling out there. Uh, that's actually a box to hold CoStar. If you remember back in the beginning, I said you had this big uh, uh, box with these arms with mirrors in it to uh, refocus the light for the mirror error. But by, uh, by this time, in 2009, we've uh, replaced all the instruments with that built-in correction. So we didn't need CoStar anymore. They took it back to Earth. It's actually at the uh, Smithsonian uh, uh, Air and Space Museum uh, today. So that's pretty good. If you ever happen to be in the Washington area, definitely check that out. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is uh, down on the lower left-hand side, they uh, had a rare opportunity on this particular mission because uh, there were some weather issues in both uh, Florida and California, two places they wanted to land their space shuttle, and they had uh, a rare thing on a space shuttle, that's free time. They got to hang out for a couple of days, which is always fun. To give you an idea of uh, how, <laughs> how courageous these gentlemen are, uh, while they were, uh, you know, passing the time, they decided to watch a movie, and the movie they chose was Apollo 13, a movie, if you haven't seen it, it's about a big space disaster. Give <laughs> you an idea how, uh, how uh, <laughs> courageous these guys are. And uh, they did a lot of really great work up there, uh, made sure it was going to last as long as possible. And you can see the, they upgraded the main camera, and you can see the difference uh, from the earlier photos to the, the ones after this uh, last upgrade mission. You get a lot more detail. This is the... Um, uh, uh, Horse head nebula here, another uh, big uh, star forming region of space. Uh, these star forming, actually, by the way, the guy who uh, just spoke before me had this, I noticed, on the background of his uh, laptop, which is kind of cool. Uh, this is another star forming region of space. This is uh, what they uh, nickname Mystic Mountain. It's not another one of these uh, nebulas. Uh, there's stars off screen, uh, basically up and to the right of this photo, that are blasting uh, solar uh, radiation at these big clouds of gas. And uh, you'll see some stars are also forming in the, the top of the clouds making these little jets going off to the side a very beautiful stunning image that we're able to bring back uh, from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope now I also mentioned uh, that uh, we uh, we often for the Hubble Space Telescope with the infrared and ultraviolet take uh, the, that infrared uh, data and the ultraviolet data and, and assign different colors to those uh, different frequencies of light we can also do that with frequencies that we can see and that's useful for scientists because they can assign different elements to those different colors uh, so uh, uh, you can see uh, for instance if you have hydrogen is red oxygen is uh, green you can uh, make these different uh, uh, images that uh, will tell you a lot of information scientifically, and they, they also end up being uh, fairly pretty. This is uh, uh, the opposite end of a star's life, life cycle after a star, similar to our own sun, uh, uses up almost all of its, uh, its hydrogen gas. It uh, makes a big shell and kind of poofs out there. It's not a violent explosion in the center. The very center there is a white dwarf star, and you can see what the elements are around that white dwarf star because we know exactly what frequencies of light uh, they're going to give off. Uh, now, I like to pull this uh, photo up too. This is a, a pretty fun object out there in the universe. This is the remnants of a, a star that exploded all the way. And uh, we know what happened in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 12th century because Chinese astronomers are pretty good at writing things down. Now, astronomers all over the world saw this. You couldn't miss it. It was a star shining in the day when this thing exploded. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the Chinese astronomers are the ones who were good enough to figure out that this is actually the object. It's what we call the Crab Nebula now. And it's a really uh, stunning object in the night sky, uh, but this isn't the natural color of the Crab Nebula. This is actually uh, uh, it, uh, information that we gathered from three different space telescopes. Uh, the visible light portion of this image was gathered by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but we also had infrared image uh, gathered by the Spitzer Space Telescope, another space telescope that uh, uh, slowly does infrared stuff, and the Chandra X-ray Telescope also brought back, mm, pardon me, a lot of great information. Uh, and that, uh, so the Chandra is that uh, part in the middle, the part on the edge is really mostly the Spitzer stuff. And uh, the Hubble brings it all together. So this is the kind of uh, power you can get and uh, really great images you can get from uh, combi combining uh, information from different telescopes. Uh, now the Hubble te Space Telescope is still up there. Uh, and uh, we hope it stays up there for a while longer. Uh, we're hoping at least 10 more years, but uh, well, the Hubble Space Telescope has outlived the space shuttle program. All the space shuttles are in different museums throughout the world, or really throughout the country. And we do have one, again, here in New York where I work at the Intrepid, just a few blocks away. And um, well, uh, what's the fate 
of the Hubble Space Telescope when it runs out of juice, when it can no longer send us back images uh, uh, for uh, any number of uh, reasons that might happen in the, uh, the distant or not so distant future. Uh, well, uh, the original plan was to have a space shuttle, grab it, take it back to Earth and put it in the Smithsonian Museum, which would have been cool. But, uh, well, again, it's outlived the space shuttle program, so the last servicing mission, they put a little mount there so that a robotic probe can go out there and deorbit it safely so it doesn't land on anybody's head. It's pretty big, again, about the size of a school bus. Uh, so we want it to deorbit, uh, make it a controlled deorbit, and that will happen sometime in the future, but we're going to keep it, ag again, going as long as we possibly can, and hopefully that's uh, quite some time to come. I do want to point out here uh, that, oops, let's see, I am... Just a presenter here at the Intrepid. These are the, uh, the photo credits for the guys who are doing the real work. I'm just presenting that work, uh, again, at the Intrepid Museum just a few blocks away. And that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, and yeah, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of the Space Ast Festival. Thanks, Philip. Uh, we're running a little behind schedule, so we need to move on to our next uh, speaker. Whenever you're ready to... Connect. Yeah. Do you have anything you have to connect, or you just? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sweet. Yes. Okay. Probably should have used your cable. You wouldn't have had to. Propulsion Lab, JPL in Pasadena. He's the deputy, the deputy lead of their ops lab, focusing re on research on natural user interfaces. And he's going to talk to us today about some of the work his lab is doing with collaborators on uh, interfaces we use to control spacecraft and robotics. And remember, if you have questions, tweet them, hashtag AskSpaceApps. Audio check here. It's not coming out HDMI. It's coming through my speakers. Oh, uh, just when I play my video. I only have one video that I need audio for. Yeah, it just doesn't sometimes. It's okay. We'll, we'll make it work. Because it's not plugged in here. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we'll make it work. I'll just do this. Thanks for uh, staying late Winter. for this.
All right, so I'm from California. I'm a Jet Propulsion Laboratory in sunny Pasadena. Came uh, almost three, three hours in the past, so I'm a little jet lagged. But uh, thanks for staying here. Um, today I'm gonna really talk about sort of how we've really leveraged commercial technologies in our lab to advance research in the operations of the neat deep space robotics that we have out there. So things like the Curiosity rover, things like the spaceships around Saturn, Jupiter, um, trying to command those in a more effective and innovative way. Starting from things like the Kinect all the way up to things like the Microsoft HoloLens, which just was announced a couple months ago. A little bit of background, I work in the Ops Lab. This is basically a conglomerate of designers, developers, artists who are keen on making things work more effectively. So things like these guys, um, robots that are roaming, robots that are flying, you got um, satellites, things that are on Mars, things that haven't really been into space yet, but things we want to take to asteroids, to Mars, and the moon, and beyond. And while this is an awesome opportunity for us, it's really exciting to work on these projects, it's also a huge challenge, right? Because these robots are so complex and so different. So we have to come up with innovative ways to control them. And one of the first industries we looked to was the gaming industry, of course, right? Because we're thinking, you know, if you've got people who can pick up a really complex game like World of Warcraft in just a few minutes, then why can't we leverage some of those skills to have our rover drivers or our science planners control spacecraft that effectively and so we've uh, we've talked to a lot of companies out there we started with this one which is the Xbox Connect which came out four years ago four or five years ago and when it came out it was really exciting right because it was a, a device that captured not only color data but depth data and it compressed it all down into a USB uh, interface that anyone could hack on and of course for us we started right away to hack on it. We didn't really know what we were doing back then, so we tried a lot of different things, like people here, and I, I strongly recommend that when you have a new technology, you try a lot of different things. Things like manipulating virtual objects uh, with our hands, with uh, stereoscopic 3D. Uh, what if you could hold an object and move it around by tracking you? And then we sort of extended this idea to say, hey, what if you could work and collaborate with other people in the same environment? What if you had a tablet user who could look at a model at the same time you could manipulate it with your hands? So in, you know, think about this in a mission operation, mission control, mission planning world where you can modify a 3D model in real time and other people can see it being affected. This is also the beginning of when we started to look at fusing multiple data sources on Mars to create some of the best Mars terrains out there. And we'll see this work develop over the course of our experience there. This is some work with the Robonaut 2, which is a humanoid robot on the space station. And we were able to map our body to it and actually control it with our body. Uh, pretty neat ideas out of here. But really just kind of sparse, trying to just spray and pray, trying to see what kind of ideas might hit. And actually what happened out of this is we started a really fruitful collaboration with Microsoft. And the one idea that came out of it was we should build a game. And not just any game, we were gonna build a Mars rover landing game right before the landing of the Curiosity rover. And this was a unique opportunity because it was actually NASA's first console game. And it was released for free, of course, around the same time of the landing. A really exciting way to share not only the landing experience, but sort of educate the public a little bit about how complex it was to, to do this crazy task of landing uh, a spacecraft on a different planet. So in this game, you got to go through three different phases of entering the atmosphere, uh, firing off rocket boosters to, to, to shoot off parachutes and break out the heat shield, and then of course, safely land on the surface of Mars. Very exciting opportunity for us, well received in the public and within our, our own agency. And that was the really the beginning of a long-term relationship, well, which, I'll come by, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Shortly after this, we 
found out about another technology out there called the Leap Motion. Now this was another input device, which was really neat, very easy to hack. And this one capitalized on capturing your hand gesture, right? It could recognize your, your fingers and it was able to give you much higher fidelity mapping to your hands than the Kinect was able to do. And so we were thinking, well, hey, what could we do to hack on this thing? And one idea clearly came to mind. And it was centered around this robot. This is a robot called Athlete, and we have it at JPL. It's a real robot. It's two stories tall, one ton, six legs. Each leg has six degrees of freedom, six joints. And we want to send it into space to help build habitats for astronauts. So it's a complicated robot. You can imagine a nightmare to operate. We started thinking about ideas of how to do that, right? Using the Kinect, using this Z-Space device, basically, uh, 3D stereoscopic display with a stylus for fine manipulation. And then moving on, of course, to mapping it to our hands directly using the leap. And then we took it a step further. We mapped it directly to the actual robot in our labs. And with our hands, we were able to fly it around. So we displayed this at GDC a couple years ago on stage. And it was a really exciting but really scary moment as I hovered my hand over this leap device and moved this giant robot you know, hundreds of miles away. Let's see. It's called Athlete, yeah. All terrain, hex limb, extraterrestrial explorer. There you go. So it was back then we were exploring a lot of input devices and through that, of course, we looked at app ways of more with, with ways of better immersing the, the operator, right? Using stereoscopic 3D to just try to give them a better understanding of the environment. But we wanted to do more. We want to explore more on the output side of things. And it was around that time, a couple years ago, that this device came out, the Oculus Rift. Again, a super neat gadget that was super hackable and a great opportunity for us to explore a new side of operations. Right. What if you could immerse the operator, the scientists or engineers, on a place that they were familiar with, like Mars? So again, we took the hacking and we built a couple different prototypes. The first one you see here is basically a, a panorama viewer, left, right eye stereo, and we built a space station fly around. You could fly around on the inside and the outside of, of a space station, get you a little understanding of it. Then we took the Omni treadmill device and allows you to literally walk on Mars. Here again, you're seeing another iteration of our terrain fusion technology. It's getting a little bit better over time. This is mostly just high resolution imagery from the satellites, but you get a nice kind of progression as we're getting better terrain, as we're getting better input, and we're fusing output with input. At this point, we're, we're thinking that we might really have something. Right, and, but, but of course, at JPL, as a scientific institution, we had to prove that we had value. And to do that, we had to do something extra special. And that was to perform an experiment. And to perform that experiment, we had, the technology back in time didn't have what we needed, so we built our own. We took the rotational aspect of uh, uh, the data from the Oculus, merged it with positional data that we built from the Bicon tracking volume, a mocap system, we put the user on Mars and tracked them in this 3D volume. And then we created an even more impressive piece of terrain using both a collection of 2D and 3D data. So that they were standing literally on a real site on Mars with the rover. And what's neat is that, you know, when we're looking at images of Mars right now, all the images is, are from the perspective of the rover, right? They're taken from the cameras on the rover. And really for the first time here, you can walk around from different angles on Mars at perspectives that no one has ever seen. And so it was just a quick prototype, of course, but we wanted to do a study. So we took 17 of the best Mars scientists out there operating on uh, opportunity and curiosity, and we told them to map out an area on Mars, both in their current mission tool, which is a 2D interface that we also built, and in this prototype, right? So we picked out five rocks for them and said, 
hey, where do you think they're located relative to each other? And the results were, were really surprising to us because we found that they were able to discern distances and angles far better in this immersive experience than their mission tool, than their current mission tool. So they're making errors in their judgment of the understanding of Mars as they're doing this. And they're doing this every day, right? And then they get together, tens and hundreds of these guys get together with different mindsets, with different errors, and they try to plan on Mars. So you can imagine a, a lot of time is wasted just on correcting their kind of understanding of the morphology or space that they're on. So really neat data came out of this. And around the same time, we got in touch with Microsoft again, and we heard about this device, uh, HoloLens, of course. We saw this a couple years ago because we were close with our friends starting working in the Kinect. And a year ago, it was at a point where they reached out and said, hey, I think we have something ready for you guys. What do you think you could do with it if we gave this to you? And you know, this is right after we did this experiment with the, with the Oculus and we said, oh my God, we have to take scientists to Mars. We have to bring Mars to their office so that they can walk around just like they would do if they were a geologist on Earth. And so that's what we did. We took five people from our team and we sent them to Redmond and lived with the, the Microsoft people for two months and we built a prototype. The prototype was called OnSite. It was so successful that we proved this through all the upper ranks of Microsoft and all the ranks in NASA. And we are gonna deploy this into operations in just a couple of months. So let me show you a video real quick. Hopefully this will work. And this should speak for itself about what this product will do for you. OnSite is a tool to connect scientists and engineers with the environment of the Curiosity Mars rover. Since we can't put our scientists yet physically on Mars, a technology like this allows us to investigate what's possible if we can make them virtually present. This was the first time where I could basically do a 360 and see Mars all around me. I love the fact that people, when they first encounter this project, have a feeling of, wow, you know, I've lived to see this. Instead of looking at 2D images, they can now walk around and explore Mars in their office. It was part inspiring, part just like, wow, I can finally do this thing that I really want to do. I could see using this every single day. It is a different way of exploring. That's transformation. Our plan is to deploy on-site to mission operations this summer and to be controlling rovers on Mars with this technology in July. It's funny, that guy in that video, Fred Caliph, he is what we call the keeper of the maps. So he's in charge of building the best representation of the understanding of Mars that anyone knows. And when we showed them this, he just went nuts. You know, he started crawling on the floor, looking at rocks from different at angles, Nobody ever expected that from him. But um, really exciting to, to see that the scientists or engineers on all sides are very engaged about this. And I mean, you can see sort of a progression of, of how we explore these technologies. We, we find them, we embrace them, we explore the opportunities, and we narrow it in on a couple of ideas of that, that we try to you know, polish up. And you can see we came from early days of Connect and really hacking together ideas to a place where we're at now where we're actually gonna use this on a real mission. So I have another couple of stories to share, but I think I'll just wrap up around here. The, the reason why we're all here today is because you know, we're excited about two things, right? Space and technology. And the intersection of those two things is sort of where we wanna be. And that's what we've always pushed on this mission. The idea that two separate groups, two companies could come together 
and, and all get along and agree that space is great and technology is great and holograms are great um, was sort of a, a huge advancement. Because at NASA, we're, we're excited to be on the forefront of technology. You know, in all these talks, we're talking about how, how NASA's pushing the barrier of the future. But on the, on the flip side, you're hearing about all the, all the things about, you know, the iPads on the space station, right? But the iPads came out six, seven years ago. And really, for the first time, we wanted to be on the bleeding edge. We wanted to have the HoloLens. We wanted to build with the device. We wanted to deploy with this before anyone even knew it existed. And I think we were uh, able to accomplish that. So in the spirit of Hackathon, um, very happy to be here to tell you about technology. We got a little bit of understanding about how we came to really embrace commercial industry and all the technologies out there. And, and at the heart of it, we're just hackers like you guys. So thanks for having me, and uh, I'll be around. Any uh, quick questions for, uh, for Victor? So most of the devices you guys have been hacking on come from the private sector. Do you find that uh, those devices are accurate enough for something like flight controls or something like that? Or is it just completely out of the realm of that you would use like a, a, a private sector device for something like that? Or does that question make sense? Yeah, you know, it's funny because when we talk about uh, controlling these robots and I'm talking about how hard it is to control some of these robots, it's not just that they're, they're hard to control as in like joysticking, but some of these robots are millions of miles, hundreds of millions of miles away. Right? So you've got the time delay problem, you've got communication problems, and um, yeah, so we're not joysticking some of these things. I and mean, you think about the Mars mission, right? We've got pretty much a 24 hour planning cycle. We've got, uh, we get data back in the, uh, at the beginning of the day. Then when scientists look at the data and try to understand where they are, uh, they try to understand what they can do next. Then they have to negotiate with each other, uh, like I mentioned before, about what their right understanding is, agree on the top few priorities, and then negotiate with the engineering team to see what's feasible here, how much power do we have, can we really do this during the day? And then, um, you know, they get into the sequence with like writing out the code that actually talks to the robot. So, you know, that's a roundabout way of saying on, on the on-site mission, we're actually just enabling, the, our top priority is enabling our scientists, engineers, and eventually, of course, the general public to have a better understanding of just where they are. And that is, you know, ha more than half the battle right now. Other questions? Oh, you got your own? Great. Thank you. Um, the last product that you mentioned, would it, would it be available in, in retail, and how much would it go for? Yeah, the, I, I think the HoloLens is expecting to go to release to the public soon. Um, the next big announcement they'll, they'll probably talk about is at the build conference in a couple weeks. I don't think they said anything about availability, except that it's going to come in the Windows 10 time frame. So. But it's going to be a real product, which is really exciting for us. Obviously for us, we, we want it to be a real product because then we can buy hundreds of them for all of our scientists. And our goal is, of course, if this works well, we want every single scientist on the mission to have one. Because why not? Sure. Uh, can you talk about, share some of the most surprising discoveries that um, have been made from putting this technology in the hands of scientists? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good stories. I'll give you one. There's a place called Dingo Gap. If you guys follow Mars missions, it's a, it's a tiny little hill on Mars. The scientists, when we got to that hill, deliberated about whether we could go over that, that tiny hill for, I think, a week. And that's expensive, right? And we, we then, of course, took these same scientists through our on-site demo. And the first thing that said was like, oh my God, if I had this for like five seconds, we would have saved, you know, days of time. So it's things like that, you know, just being able to look at it for different perspectives is immensely valuable. You know, like just me walking around on it and being able to walk around the office and run around these hills is just incredible. It's like being in space, almost there.
So when we compare uh, virtual reality like the Oculus versus augmented reality like the HoloLens, mm -hmm. people will usually associate like full immersiveness with virtual reality. What what made it more, I would say, more realistic or more useful to actually go with a an augmented reality approach like the HoloLens? What was the big differentiator here? The big differentiator here is that we were actually using, leveraging the mixed reality capabilities of the device. So one thing we, we didn't want to do and what we learned from actually doing that test with our scientists was that VR is actually really intimidating because you put that in front of a scientist and you think these are not technologies, they're not hackers, they're not gamers. It's scary, right? Like suddenly everything goes away and you don't know where you are. And if we're telling them, hey, go walk around on Mars in their office, it's really intimidating. So actually what we have here is not only is it mixed reality so it doesn't cover your entire vision, but we have the capability of cutting out their desk. And so if you, if you see some of these videos and if you walk through the experience, it's actually really magical because you see all of Mars around you in your office, you see your office, and you see a cutout of your monitor and your desk. So they can still use their, their current mission tools on their computer and be on Mars, and then they can take their mouse and move it off their screen into the virtual world. So it's kind of like a mix of all these worlds, which is just not capable with, with, with VR. And for us, you know, VR, AR, MR, it's all good, right? We don't, we don't pick and choose. We, we pick the right device for the right application. And as you see in all of these videos, we really try to narrow in on what's the right thing to do. Do all these devices have open APIs or do you have to reverse engineer some of this stuff? Um, I mean, for most of these guys, we were, we were so close with them that we're, we're in at the, the entry level. But I'd say all of these have open APIs. I mean, like Leap has APIs, Connect, Oculus, and at the Build Conference, I'm sure they're going to talk a lot more about... Same level of API that you guys get to use at Ops Lab. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nothing secret. It's just we got to work with them a little bit before everyone else did. So it seems that uh, the sequence of events is that uh, Microsoft develops the hardware and then they introduce it to you and then you develop the application. Yeah. What if you could reverse the process? What would you, like, which, which, what would you ask Microsoft to do it? You know, that, that's, we think about that a lot, actually. It's what's the next step, right? Like, we got to a point where we were ahead of the hardware release that we can make influential decisions in their roadmap. What, what would be really exciting for us next is to be able to influence the decision making of the hardware. So not only from the commercial side of things, but imagine if on the next Mars mission or the next Jupiter Europa mission that we could tell them, hey, if you put this sensor package on board, we would be able to give you this much more data back. Right? If you just had this onboard processing power, we could build a complete map of the site drive before even getting it back to Earth. So I, I, I think it's really exciting to think about what's possible in terms of just moving up um, our influence level. And I think part of it is just proving that we can do this, right? The more we prove ourselves, the more they trust us, the more we have control over the, the, uh, the initial steps of the development of the device. Yeah, actually just following that up, uh, I was just curious, it seems like your limiting factor is the cameras on the rover itself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know there's many of them, but I was just curious if you could say a few words about Absolutely. what that's like. Yeah, um, so this, this deserves a talk in itself. And my colleague Alex Menzies, he's, he's, he's brilliant. Basically what we've done is we've created in this on-site video that you saw, all of that terrain data is real. Um, it's not CG. And how we were able to do that is we're combining the depth data from the, our nav cams. So we get a 3D stereo correlated um, point cloud data from the depth, uh, from the navigation cameras on the rover. We stitch that with high resolution mass cam data. So that's a, another camera that takes high resolution images. We stitch that together. The problem in the past that have tr uh, kind of plagued us is that when you do this, you have holes in the back of rocks, right? Because you can only see sort of where you are from the rover. And we've solved that problem by two things. 
One is we're fusing data from the high res, the high rise camera from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we were fusing satellite data with the, the rover data, and then we're fusing that with multiple sites that the rover has been. So because we have the calibration data from all of the cameras, from all of these uh, cameras on the, uh, the rover and the spacecraft, we can stitch that all together. So multiple side drives, multiple camera views, and even stitching in the satellite data to create some of the best looking terrain that's ever made. And then doing that all autonomously within an hour. So that's our goal. Basically by June, uh, July, uh, for our team, new data comes in the pipeline from the spacecraft. We ping it, we get that, we, we, we receive that data, we build that entire new terrain data set within an hour so that the scientists can walk in there and make smart decisions that day about where to target science uh, on Mars. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, <laughs> let's thank Victor. Thanks. I'll be around if you guys want to talk more. OK, we've got one more um, talk that's a short talk. It's not on the schedule. Um, you about ready, Dylan? You ready to uh, set yeah. up? Okay. So, um, how many of you have used the internet? <laughs> how many of you have heard of the Internet Society? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, you, you might wonder, you know, who runs the internet? Who, who organizes the internet? And the answer is nobody. You know, it's like the English language. Who controls the language? Nobody controls the language. It's just a mutually agreed kind of thing that I say something, you understand what I say and therefore we can communicate. And basically the internet is the same kind of thing. There are protocols that, you know, that say that if, this, if you do this, then they understand that, and you know, that's the way that things work. So how, you know, after Vince Cerf and Robert Kahn came up with the original TCPIP, did these protocols and so on arrive? Well, they eventually, um, with John Postel and so on, they came up with this thing called the the RFC process, people make requests for comment, and then they figure out with a thing that's known as consensus and running code what goes on, and this is, became the Internet Engineering Task Force, and, the inter and it became bigger and bigger, and then eventually they needed an organization to run it, so in 92, that was when the Internet Society was formed, and, uh, and the mission was, uh, the Internet is for everyone, and you might have seen the picture of Vince Cerf with a t-shirt that says IT on everything. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, that's how it continued. And so it was a hard slog in the early years, you know, to like knock out X500, which was what, you know, the ITU was trying to impose on everybody. Uh, but it grew up like weeds and now, you know, we, we all use it. Um, and, uh, and the hard work in the early days was just getting it around the world. There were, you know, there were whole countries in Africa that only had like 56K for the whole country, you know, and the, it just, you know, one satellite link and so on and so on. And, it's, and then the thing kind of took off and from trying to push it along, we were like running after it to try and hold it back by the early 2000s. And, uh, and fortunately, we were able to take hold of the .org registry, which gave us some money. So now we keep going. We work at a lot of different levels in the Internet Society. We had, uh, so, and I'm with the local chapter here in New York. So uh, I just thought I'd sort of introduce, basically I've got a few web pages here. This is, um, this is our website, which you see, we would welcome someone who, a WordPress developer to come in and improve this. Um, there you see the top thing we have there is like a comment on the net neutrality where you might see that we're not totally gung-ho over net neutrality because globally, we're worried in a lot of countries about them using this as an excuse. So look, America's done it. 
we're going to like regulate the internet in our country and make it, you know, sender pays and all kinds of things that will screw up the free and open exchange of information. Um, so that's there's there, it's, there's the comment on our site. Our site is isoc-ny.org. Um, so something's happened here that I've lost the rest of my pages. Okay. So there's the Internet Society's main page, um, there, which is uh, isoc.org or internetsociety.org. Um, here's the mission, which is still the Internet is for everyone, and uh, the mission to promote the open development and evolution and use of the Internet for the benefit of all the people throughout the world. And this is what we'll come up to in a minute, because we're now extending beyond the world. And uh, so just I had this... Internet Engineering Task Force, there's their site. Internet Engineering Task Force is a fascinating organization. If you ever, you know, they have these meetings, if you tune into their meetings, it's incredibly high di how dynamically you work to hear these engineers hashing things out. And the, the system is that when people agree with stuff, they hum. They go, mmm. So when things are going well, you hear this kind of sound coming through the room, mmm, and you know that, that, that things that things are, are going right. Um, Internet Architecture Board, we do this. There's some very interesting stuff coming up now where they've actually coming up with a new HTTP standard, HTTP2, um, things are developing, which is going to make WebRTC work a lot better, and so you'll be able to do a lot more things in your browser. And I will say, since we're here at Microsoft, we appreciate that Microsoft has been an organizational member a long time and is a big contributor, platinum sponsor of the Internet Society. Um, and so we have over 100 chapters around the world, and there's a ha handy map of everything. But, and so our chapters are geographically based. They're all geographically based, except for one, which is a disabled and special needs chapter, which is about accessibility, which is one of our big things that we, you know, we continuously push on. And then the other one, which is like arguable whether it's geographic or not, is we have uh, this one, which is the inter, inter, which has just reached chapter thing, which is interplanetary networking special interest group, which is now a chapter, and this in, is, includes Vince Cerf, who is like, you know, Vince and Robert Kahn were the founders, original founders of the Internet Society, and uh, the the key technology is delay and disruption tolerant networking, otherwise known as DTN, so that you can send packets and things. To, to like Mars or wherever where it's going to take, you know, however long it is for something to come back and it still works, you know. There's a lot of jokes in the IETF about, you know, pigeon, sending packets by pigeon as, uh, you know, as being more efficient than some forms of uh, wired networking. But, um, and so we had a thing last year in San Francisco, a small meeting to sort of, this is going up to sort of the next level and coming up on here, we'll see that on May the 18th, which is not so far away, we're having the second annual Internet Planetary Networking Conference down in D.C. Um, with Vince, Vince Cerf, the NASA Boeing team, uh, Scott Burley from uh, JPL, um, D the people who are standardizing the, the DTN protocols. And uh, the new thing they've got is like using lasers. They did this successful test with um, in 2013 of of communicating with the moon by by uh, by laser or something like that, and they're going to do another. It says here they're going to do another test in 2017. So what I'm saying basically is that if you are interested in communication and space, this group is the one to join. Okay, and they have a very short uh, URL, which is ipnsig ipnsig dot org. Okay, and that. Oh, and of course, as you know from us, the event will be webcast on the Internet Society's live stream channel, as you might expect, as this is what we do. Okay, physical attendance limited to 150 people. So you must register, but I know if you register now, you can get to this, uh, and it's free. Okay, so that's what I have. Thanks, Julie. So the Okay.
Do you want to just come up? Am I introducing you? Come on. Okay, so that's day one. Uh, we've got some closing remarks by Mike Capri, and then I'll say a few words before uh, we sign out for the day. Is this thing on? Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for today. Um, this was our our inaugural uh, space festival and conference, and you know I I have to say that I mean I, I've been you know running around all day, kind of doing organizing stuff, but just the collection of people that we were able to have here today and having them talk with each other and meet with each other and just, just the networking and the, the conversations, uh, you know, just the quality of people that we've had. I'm really, I mean, I almost kind of want to say we're aspiring to like TED level <laughs> for like just the awesomeness of our talks and everything. Um, so yeah, I, I've come away really inspired and uh, I'm just really, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, by, by, by what's going on today. So. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we will be back on uh, live stream again uh, first thing tomorrow. Uh, we've got some more great speakers coming up on Sunday. And uh, tomorrow will be our demo day for all the hackathon projects. You guys haven't really seen or heard sort of what's been happening downstairs, but I've snuck down there a couple of times and there's a lot of amazing things happening. Uh, so we are going to get those folks a little more organized uh, from now until the end of the night. They're gonna, some of them are gonna work through the night, the entire night, uh, to create projects for tomorrow. Uh, and that's it. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we will see you all tomorrow morning. That's coming on now. After I talk, it's coming up, okay. Okay, great. You wanna plug you or no? Plug him too? Should I plug him as well? Should I plug Mike Wilson? So we're done, right? Okay, that's the end of day one of the NASA Space Apps Challenge. Um, coming up now on the live stream, there'll be a few episodes of Shameless Plug, once again, our show on PBS uh, Digital Studios called Space Time. Uh, you can continue to watch it on the live stream. How many episodes are we gonna be sending? Just one or? Just one, which one? The aliens one? Oh, okay, yeah, about whether it's rational to believe in aliens or not. Um, you can also check out Mike Wilson's show on PBS Digital Studios, Comaniti, also about space. That's Mike Wilson, if the camera can, or if you can just jump in in the middle of the screen. <laughs> anyway, we'll be here again tomorrow morning, Sunday, April 12, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, to start day two of the Space Apps Challenge. See you then. The universe is huge. We know this, but how huge? And how can we possibly measure the size of the universe? Put it like this. It's common to quote astronomical distances in light years. That's the distance light travels in a year, or about nine trillion kilometers. Given that, here are some facts to blow your mind. The diameter of the solar system is about eight light hours, or nine billion kilometers. The Milky Way, our galaxy, that's about 100,000 light years across, or close to one quintillion kilometers. And the next closest major galaxy, Andromeda, that's two and a half million light years away, which is just silly to talk about in kilometers. All pretty big distances, right? Now, let's talk about the whole universe. We can't see all of it. Some things are so far away, the light from there hasn't reached us yet. So we're gonna focus on the observable universe. That's the part that we, in principle, can see with light or gravitational waves. So how big is that? Well, it's a sphere with a radius of about 46 billion light years, or rounding down to keep it simple, about 90 billion light years end to end. Now that's crazy big, but it's even crazier that astronomers think they know that number. It's not like they measured the universe with a ruler, so how do they know? In a nutshell, you start with the age of the universe. The, the universe is huge. We know this, but how huge? And how can we possibly measure the size of the universe? Put it like this. It's common to quote astronomical distances in light years. That's the distance light travels in a year, or about nine trillion kilometers. Given that, here are some facts to blow your mind. The diameter of the solar system is about eight light hours, or nine billion kilometers. The Milky Way, our galaxy, that's about 100,000 light years across, or close to one quintillion kilometers. 
and the next closest major galaxy, Andromeda, that's two and a half million light years away, which is just silly to talk about in kilometers. All pretty big distances, right? Now, let's talk about the whole universe. We can't see all of it. Some things are so far away, the light from there hasn't reached us yet. So we're gonna focus on the observable universe. That's the part that we, in principle, can see with light or gravitational waves. So how big is that? Well, it's a sphere with a radius of about 46 billion light years, or rounding down to keep it simple, about 90 billion light years end to end. Now that's crazy big, but it's even crazier that astronomers think they know that number. It's not like they measured the universe with a ruler, so how do they know? In a nutshell, you start with the age of the universe. The current estimate is about 13.8 billion years. That's the maximum amount of time light has had to travel to us. And then you work out how far away the emission point of that light is right now. And that's the radius of the observable universe. Remember, that distance is not 13.8 billion light years. It's much bigger. To understand why, it's critical to realize that space itself is expanding. A popular analogy that I wish I could take credit for is a loaf of raisin bread rising in the oven. Each raisin represents a cluster of galaxies in the dough space. Now, the raisins don't move through the dough, but as the bread bakes and rises, all the raisins get further apart from each other because the dough itself expands. Now, each raisin stays the same size. Galaxy clusters aren't expanding, and neither are individual galaxies or the Earth or people or trees. It's just the relatively empty space between those large clusters of galaxies. And not only does the dough expand, it can expand at different rates during different stages of the baking process. Maybe really fast for a billion years, then slower for the next two billion. These two facts, the expansion of space and the fact that it can expand at a variable rate, complicate how we measure the size of the observable universe. In fact, space itself can expand at any rate it wants to, even faster than the speed of light. So over the lifetime of the universe, the birthplace of a beam of light can be carried ridiculously far away by the expanding space dough. To know exactly how far, though, and calculate the size of the universe, you need to know how quickly space has been expanding at every moment in history, ever. So how can we possibly know the expansion history of the universe? using something called cosmological redshift, which is like a fingerprint that the expansion of space leaves on beams of light. Let me take a moment to explain. Light has a color determined by its wavelength. Longer wavelength light is redder, shorter bluer. If space were not expanding, then light from a distant galaxy would be the same color when it arrived on Earth as it was when it first set out. Blue on departure, blue on arrival. But because space is expanding, the wavelength of light gets stretched as it travels to us, making the blue light red, hence the term red shift. In more extreme cases, the wavelength can be stretched out of the visible spectrum altogether into microwaves or radio waves. Now, here comes another important point, so pay attention. The light from more distant galaxies is red shifted more than light from nearby ones. You see, the light from more distant places has further to go, so it spends more time in the expanding space, in the rising dough, and thus it has its wavelength stretched more. Makes sense, but how are redshift and distance related quantitatively? That is the million dollar question. If we knew the answer in numerical detail, we could figure out the expansion history and in turn, the size of the universe. So can you do this? Can you measure the distance redshift relationship? No sweat, just find a bunch of faraway galaxies, much further than Andromeda, measure their distances and their redshifts, then put those distances and redshifts on a graph and find the best fit curve. Voila, you now know the distance redshift relationship and from that, how fast the universe was expanding at every moment ever. Once you have the expansion history, how do you actually determine the size of the universe? Remember, as I said a long, long time ago, we first need to get the universe's age. So let's go back to the raisin bread. If we run the movie of the rising dough backwards at the rate given to us by the expansion history, eventually nearby raisins will sit on top of each other. That is the Big Bang, and how long it takes to get back to this point is the current age of the universe. Our best current estimate using that expansion history is 13.8 billion years, give or take. Step two is, well, annoying math but we can represent it visually as follows. Imagine that seconds after the Big Bang happens, every raisin emits a beam of light that can then travel without hitting any obstacles. As we run the movie forward, at the rate given to us by the expansion history, those imaginary beams would travel through the expanding space and reach us at different times. One of those beams of raisin light would be just reaching us as the clock hits 13.8 billion years. We then see where that raisin is now. Answer, about 46 billion light years away, boom. So that's how we know that the observable universe is about 90 billion light years in diameter. But what about the unobservable universe? Aren't there galaxies even further away whose light hasn't reached us yet? Well, yeah, there are, 
but I'm afraid that's a subject for another episode. If you're inclined, go ahead and get the discussion about that started in the comments below. I'll report on any interesting threads from that conversation on the next episode of Space Time. Last week we asked whether it's irrational to believe in aliens. Here's what you guys had to say. Pantsu Man and others point out that it'd be really low odds to accidentally bump into a Millennium Falcon in space. I think you guys took my glib example a little too literally. The real point of the Fermi Paradox is that colonization on a galactic scale could happen so quickly that if life is really that common, at least one civilization should have already done it by now. And they should be so widespread that we'd see some evidence. Nick G commented that a really advanced civilization might not try to expand outward into space, but inward into, let's say, advanced computer circuitry. Pretty good thought. The G to AFH asks, what about the Prime Directive? Well, what about James T. Kirk? He didn't care about the Prime Directive much, so why should all the aliens? And Rob LaRosa left us with a deeply insightful comment from Calvin and Hobbes. Good work. everything in its path. And in this corner, yeah. it's your science rapper and educator, yeah. Mike Wilson, a.k.a. Yeah. Coma Nitty. Like a bajillion stars are in the sky. And sooner or later, those stars will die. When some stars die, they may go supernova. Exploding and scattering star stuff all over. Let's take a tour. Deep inside the star's core. Gravity and fusion are playing tug of war. A delicate balance holds a star's shape. When fusion fails, it falls on its weight. With so much mass packed in a tiny place, it rips through the fabric of time and space. A black hole is born, and nothing can escape. Not even light can manage to evade black holes capture imaginations black holes put fear in our brains there is a black hole in our galaxy 28,000 light years away bye bye uh oh uh oh uh oh uh oh oh why is everybody scared of black holes i know that this may sound crazy but black holes aren't that scary uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, oh, why is everybody scared of black holes? I know that this may sound crazy, but black holes aren't that scary. Don't worry, black holes aren't evil. They don't purposely destroy planets or people. You've been watching too many sci fi movies. When you learn about them, black holes aren't scary. The sun's gravity makes the planets go around. The Earth's gravity keeps us all on the ground. Black hole gravity does the same thing. Trade one for the sun and everything's the same. Events horizon is what you gotta worry about. Once you reach it, there's no way that you're coming out. It's like Scorpion is on the other side. And trust me, you don't wanna fall inside. If you fall inside, you would definitely die. Your body would be stretched and spaghettified. That's the term for death by a black hole. Sounds like a deadly awesome cosmic possible in space. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, oh. Why is everybody scared of black holes? I know that this may sound crazy, but black holes aren't that scary. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, oh. Why is everybody scared of black holes? I know that this may sound crazy, but black holes aren't that scary. Hey everybody, Komen Nitty here, and thanks for watching the Black Hole Rap. If you like this iTunes, then you can buy it on iTunes. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like this video for more awesome songs and videos about science. And special shout out to NASA Blue Shift for helping us put this video together. I'm Mike Wilson. Thanks for watching. No skills. The universe began with a big, big bang. We thought it would expand and slow, slow down. But no, it just keeps going. Cosmic oceans keep flowing and we don't. A lot of people, including many scientists, seem pretty confident that aliens have to exist somewhere in the universe. Is that just wishful thinking, or can you actually calculate whether intelligent aliens exist? UFO sightings and Area 51 rumors aside, we have never seen an alien, never heard an alien, or had any kind of verifiable indication that they're out there. So how do you estimate how many intelligent aliens you should see when you've never actually seen any with probability and statistics. 
We just need to get a handle on the factors at play in the emergence of intelligent life as we know it. So, where do we start? Well, the Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars. Based on recent analyses of exoplanet data, we can now also estimate, without totally guessing, how common planets are that might support life. It looks like it's around one habitable planet per star on average. So, 200 billion stars, 200 billion habitable planets. Now for the unknowns. We need to know what percentage of the habitable planets would actually sprout life, and then what percentage of those life-sprouting planets would evolve intelligent species. Multiply these two probabilities by the 200 billion planets, and voila, you know how many Wookiees or Covenant or Vulcans you should expect. What I've just described is similar in spirit to what's called the Drake Equation. The details are different since Drake, the founder of SETI, was estimating the number of detectable alien radio signals, but the overarching logic is the same. Anyway. If we get the odds of intelligent life, we're golden, but here's the problem. Whenever anyone, even a scientist, quotes a number for the probability of life arising, it's pretty much a complete guess. How come? Because the only place we've ever seen so much as an amoeba is Earth. We have no clue how frequently life sprouts, much less intelligent life, because we have a whopping sample size of one. So is this game over? Is it impossible to take a rational, statistical, scientific position on whether or not aliens exist? Not exactly. There are sensible arguments both for and against the existence of aliens. They rely on other numbers that we can calculate, mixed in with a bit of logic. None of those arguments is decisive, so I'll present you with simplified versions of some of the most famous ones and let you be the judge. Let's start with a pro-aliens argument that intelligent life should exist. The argument says, look, 200 billion habitable planets, that's a huge number, so huge that it should compensate even for crazy low odds of intelligent life arising on any one of them. The late great Carl Sagan was a big proponent and popularizer of this viewpoint. Here's an analogy. Suppose the odds of sprouting Daleks was as low as the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot with a single ticket. That's about one in 175 million. You would still expect over 1,000 alien civilizations in our galaxy by now. If the chances of intelligent life evolving are even lower, well, 200 billion is just the number of habitable planets in our galaxy. If we sweep nearby galaxies into our planet count, we can add trillions more planets to compensate. And that is Sagan's point. If the odds of intelligent life were so insanely low that you couldn't compensate with billions or trillions of habitable worlds, it would start to look like a cosmic conspiracy, like Earth and humanity are absurdly special. And scientists hate special, any kind of special. Our whole model of the universe, dating back to Copernicus, is rooted in the democratic notion that our planet, our sun, our galaxy, none of them are special. The Sagan view then is not that alien life is guaranteed, it's that the alternative is so contrary to a closely held scientific principle that it's quite difficult to swallow. Pretty persuasive? Well, as it turns out, there's a way to turn this argument entirely on its head. One prominent no aliens argument begins by pointing out that our galaxy is not just very big, but also very old, about 10 billion years old. So say you grant Sagan logic. Taken to its conclusion, there should have been not only enough places for intelligent life to arise, but also enough time for at least some of that life to spread around the galaxy. That a species would spread out isn't some crazy assumption on our part. Remember, our species, which is only about 200,000 years old, has already sent the Pioneer and Voyager probes out of the solar system. In fact, with current propulsion technologies and no fancy sci-fi stuff, we could send probes or robots across the whole galaxy. Yeah, it would take us 20 million years or so, but so what? The galaxy is 10 billion years old. That's a blink of an eye. Our more advanced future selves might need even less time to do this, and we're just one species on one planet. So, given how old the galaxy is, shouldn't there be evidence of at least one other such species that's jetted around the cosmos? Something like radio signals, space stations, probes, a broken down Millennium Falcon, I don't know, an alien drink Pepsi sign, something. But we've seen squat. We've seen exactly zero evidence of current intelligent aliens or residual evidence of extinct ones. Now, if our ability to send stuff into space isn't special, and alien intelligence really is inevitable on the billions and billions of habitable planets, then where are the aliens? Or at least, where's their stuff? This argument was put forth by the physicist Enrico Fermi, among others, and it now bears his name, the Fermi Paradox. The punchline is that precisely because we don't see aliens, the odds of intelligent life must be, wait for it, astronomically low. Now, you can, of course, explain the Fermi Paradox away, but it's never totally satisfying. Maybe aliens hate exploring space? Okay, but all of them? It only takes one. One Klingon Richard Branson to hop around the galaxy and leave some kind of a trace. Maybe we're not looking in the right places? Sure, but remember the numbers here. The galaxy is 10 billion years old, and humanity, right now, would only need 20 million years to spread all over. And we're not special, right, Saganites? So someone should have left something even in our little corner of the galaxy. Huh.
a lot of people, including many scientists, seem pretty confident that aliens have to exist somewhere in the universe. Is that just wishful thinking, or can you actually calculate whether intelligent aliens exist? <laughs> UFO sightings and Area 51 rumors aside, we have never seen an alien, never heard an alien, or had any kind of verifiable indication that they're out there. So how do you estimate how many intelligent aliens you should see when you've never actually seen any with probability and statistics. We just need to get a handle on the factors at play in the emergence of intelligent life as we know it. So where do we start? Well, the Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars. Based on recent analyses of exoplanet data, we can now also estimate, without totally guessing, how common planets are that might support life. It looks like it's around one habitable planet per star on average. So 200 billion stars, 200 billion habitable planets. Now for the unknowns. We need to know what percentage of the habitable planets would actually sprout life, and then what percentage of those life-sprouting planets would evolve intelligent species. Multiply these two probabilities by the 200 billion planets, and voila, you know how many Wookiees or Covenant or Vulcans you should expect. What I've just described is similar in spirit to what's called the Drake Equation. The details are different since Drake, the founder of SETI, was estimating the number of detectable alien radio signals, but the overarching logic is the same. Anyway. If we get the odds of intelligent life, we're golden, but here's the problem. Whenever anyone, even a scientist, quotes a number for the probability of life arising, it's pretty much a complete guess. How come? Because the only place we've ever seen so much as an amoeba is Earth. We have no clue how frequently life sprouts, much less intelligent life, because we have a whopping sample size of one. So is this game over? Is it impossible to take a rational, statistical, scientific position on whether or not aliens exist? Not exactly. There are sensible arguments both for and against the existence of aliens. They rely on other numbers that we can calculate mixed in with a bit of logic. None of those arguments is decisive, so I'll present you with simplified versions of some of the most famous ones and let you be the judge. Let's start with the pro-alien argument that intelligent life should exist. The argument says, look, 200 billion habitable planets, that's a huge number, so huge that it should compensate even for crazy low odds of intelligent life arising on any one of them. The late great Carl Sagan was a big proponent and popularizer of this viewpoint. Here's an analogy. Suppose the odds of sprouting Daleks was as low as the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot with a single ticket. That's about one in 175 million. You would still expect over 1,000 alien civilizations in our galaxy by now. If the chances of intelligent life evolving are even lower, well, 200 billion is just the number of habitable planets in our galaxy. If we sweep nearby galaxies into our planet count, we can add trillions more planets to compensate. And that is Sagan's point. If the odds of intelligent life were so insanely low that you couldn't compensate with billions or trillions of habitable worlds, it would start to look like a cosmic conspiracy, like Earth and humanity are absurdly special. And scientists hate special, any kind of special. Our whole model of the universe, dating back to Copernicus, is rooted in the democratic notion that our planet, our sun, our galaxy, none of them are special. The Sagan view then is not that alien life is guaranteed, it's that the alternative is so contrary to a closely held scientific principle that it's quite difficult to swallow. Pretty persuasive? Well, as it turns out, there's a way to turn this argument entirely on its head. One prominent no aliens argument begins by pointing out that our galaxy is not just very big, but also very old, about 10 billion years old. So say you grant Sagan logic. Taken to its conclusion, there should have been not only enough places for intelligent life to arise, but also enough time for at least some of that life to spread around the galaxy. That a species would spread out isn't some crazy assumption on our part. Remember, our species, which is only about 200,000 years old, has already sent the Pioneer and Voyager probes out of the solar system. In fact, with current propulsion technologies and no fancy sci-fi stuff, we could send probes or robots across the whole galaxy. Yeah, it would take us 20 million years or so, but so what? The galaxy is 10 billion years old. That's a blink of an eye. Our more advanced future selves might need even less time to do this, and we're just one species on one planet. So given how old the galaxy is, shouldn't there be evidence of at least one other such species that's jetted around the cosmos? Something like radio signals, space stations, probes, a broken down Millennium Falcon, I don't know, an alien drink Pepsi sign, something. But we've seen squat. We've seen exactly zero evidence of current intelligent aliens or residual evidence of extinct ones. Now, if our ability to send stuff into space isn't special, and alien intelligence really is inevitable on the billions and billions of habitable planets, then where are the aliens? Or at least, where's their stuff? This argument was put forth by the physicist Enrico Fermi, among others, and it now bears his name, the Fermi Paradox. The punchline is that precisely because we don't see aliens, the odds of intelligent life must be, wait for it, astronomically low. 
Now you can, of course, explain the Fermi paradox away, but it's never totally satisfying. Maybe aliens hate exploring space? Okay, but all of them? It only takes one. One Klingon Richard Branson to hop around the galaxy and leave some kind of a trace. Maybe we're not looking in the right places? Sure, but remember the numbers here. The galaxy is 10 billion years old, and humanity, right now, would only need 20 million years to spread all over. And we're not special, right, Saganites? So someone should have left something even in our little corner of the galaxy. Huh. So it seems like choosing between the Sagan and Fermi camps comes down to deciding which of two unlikely things you think is less unlikely. That intelligent alien life never evolves on the billions of possible planets, or that intelligent aliens evolve, none of whom ever spread out in any observable way in the 10 billion year history of the galaxy. There is an interesting third option, a way for them both to be right without having to invoke weird coincidences, but it's a little depressing. It's an argument that also has many proponents, but it's been articulated especially nicely by Oxford University philosopher Nick Bostrom. Here's the idea. Maybe the odds of intelligent life arising are pretty decent, but the odds of intelligent life going extinct before it can spread into the galaxy are also high. There very well might be an evolutionary great filter that works against intelligent species. It could be something natural, like a virus or Godzilla, or species made like a nuclear holocaust or out of control nanobots, but something that would tend to wipe any intelligent species off the cosmic map, including, unfortunately, us. But hey, extinction extinction, right? At least you can sleep better knowing that it's possible to reconcile Sagan's billions and billions argument with the fact that Chewbacca wasn't at your office holiday party. Anyway, now you know how legit scientists and scholars handle the question of space aliens. So what do you think? Give us your two cents in the comments. I'd like to hear which side of the fence you find yourself on. Alien abduction stories, also welcome, with proof. I'll report any interesting findings on the next episode of Space Time. Last week we asked, what planet is Super Mario World? Let's see what you guys had to say. D. Moritz found that Sonic the Hedgehog lives on a planet with about 5.6 Earth Gs. Closer to a planet, good work. Gaetan commented, science. That's correct. The gentleman physicist points out that Super Mario World could be a platform accelerating through space with rockets at 70 meters per second squared. And it could be, but think about how much fuel it would take to keep that acceleration going. Nicholas Feely suggests that maybe Mario is on a black dwarf. Cool idea, but you're off by about 100,000 Gs. And James Morgan? you keep regulating. Hey, thanks to everybody who watched and blogged about the debut episode. Remember, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We'll see you guys next week. And hey, subscribe already. Don't make me send this guy after your cat. Go. Roger, don't bother to change your tape. Stop your tape. Uh, we can give you the word and tele telephone 93 and restart prior to uh, Y angle 91. Uh, I guess we're all set now. Uh, well, no, no need. Video 12 reported the um, US giving me a turnaround reading. Uh, and, yeah. And he reports that uh, focus stop it is D5 volt, so you're, we concur beautifully. Right, we're reading about 5-3 uh, also on hard clip, uh, at the... Roger, thank you.
engineers of the Boeing Company and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are making final preparations to launch one of a series of lunar orbiters. The satellite's primary mission is to photograph landing areas on the moon for America's astronauts. An Atlas Agena booster will launch the orbiter from Cape Kennedy. In the 1980s, when I was working on the uh, Space Exploration Initiative, a friend had given me five rolls of microfilm of every image from a program called Lunar Orbiter. This is five spacecraft that went around the moon in the 1960s and did photo reconnaissance for the Apollo program. And I'm looking at these images, and they're fabulous. These five Lunar Orbiter spacecraft were sent to the moon in 1966 and 1967 as recon spacecraft to look down at the moon and help find landing sites for the Apollo spacecraft. When orbital speed and altitude are achieved, the Atlas booster and nose shroud will separate, and the Agena will fire to place itself and the lunar orbiter into a 100-mile-high orbit around the Earth. Soon after burnout, Agena separates, and the 850-pound orbiter will be on its way. Now speeding through space at 25,000 miles per hour, the vehicle will extend its two-way Earth communication antennas. And solar panels will open to capture and convert the sun's energy into electrical power for orbiter systems. They will be able to lower the vehicle's orbit to a close 28 miles for photography of the moon's surface. The television or electronic cameras at the time simply were not up to the resolution. They just couldn't do it. So they came up with this way of sending real cameras, and when I say real, it means chemical film and so forth, to lunar orbit, took the pictures. One lens will cover an area of 25 square miles and record objects as small as a card table. The other will make overlapping photographs of 440 square mile sections. During its mission, the lunar orbiter will take 160 pairs of pictures while filming 12,000 square miles. The film was chemically processed in a dark room by a spacecraft, which was really a robot, but didn't have, even have a brain. The photos were then scanned with a photo cell. An analog image was sent back to Earth. And then it was shown on a kinescope screen, a high-resolution TV screen, photographed. Incoming photographic information from the orbiter is fed into this equipment, where electronic wizardry converts the electronic signal to a pinpoint of light of varying intensity. The tiny beam sweeps back and forth, exposing a moving strip of 35 millimeter film. When processed, the resulting negative shows what the orbiter's camera saw. Most of the 18 miles of film will be sent to a reassembly facility where the strips will be developed and arranged into large negatives. Prints of these negatives will form the basis for lunar maps. This data is vital to landing men on the moon. But somebody had the forethought of saying, well, maybe we should record these. And they recorded them in these analog data tapes. Rarely were they looked at after that. The film record, which is a 35 millimeter film, had a dynamic range of about 250 to 1. And for the Digerati, that's about 8 bits. But the original 70 millimeter film on the spacecraft had a dynamic range of 1,000 to 1. And the magnetic tapes, which is a direct scan from the spacecraft down, had not been degraded. It still retained a 1,000 to 1 dynamic range. So that's about 10 bits, but that's four times the dynamic range of the film. So I'm going, where are these? As a matter of fact, they made five complete sets, some 1,500 you know, tapes per set. But all but one set eventually were recycled or destroyed or whatever. So in 2007, the Internet's around, and I, I'm reading on an aerospace blog one night, and somebody posts and says, there's this woman, her name is Nancy Evans, she was a Viking project manager uh, for archiving, and she has these tape drives from Lunar Orbiter, and she's retiring, and she wants to give them away. I'm like, oh, my God. We hear these rumors on the Internet about 
some woman with tape drives in her garage and these tapes and all that. So I get on an airplane and I go to California and I meet Nancy who lives on a horse property. She'd become a holistic veterinarian after NASA and she had these tape drives. So we call up Pete Warden who's now up at NASA Ames as center director and says, can we bring it up there? So she said, yes. Dennis and some of his colleagues came to us and said, you know, there's some really cool data that we took in the 1960s. We can resurrect it with much improved uh, uh, quality that now we can use to really study the moon. And, and in some sense, it's a time machine. I remember getting the call from Keith Cowing, who's been a friend of mine for years. And he told me about this. And I thought, wow, isn't that cool? And I thought, you know, in the current NASA environment, how much chance of success does it have? But I thought, count me in. So Keith Cowing from NASA Watch puts up the money, and we rent two trucks. And we get there with our big trucks, and there were the tape drives with farm animals running around, and they'd just been sitting in a nice, dry you know, climate for 20 years. We'd gotten permission from NASA to get the tapes, got the tapes, threw them on a truck, drove up to NASA Ames, and eventually we got a, a place to work on these things. We were looking at a place to do this at NASA Ames, and one of the, uh, the ladies there said, well, you know, there's this McDonald's that just closed here, and they have these French fryers there that sucks the air out really rapidly, and since you're going to be soldering, wouldn't that be a good place to do it? And we're going, well, yeah, that makes sense, and nobody else wanted to be in the, the building. So we said, well, let's go move into the McDonald's. McDonald's had just cleared out, and so I made the suggestion, why don't we move into McDonald's? and it turned out that um, uh, that was the perfect place for them to be and it had just the right kind of accommodations for their early work. I remember eating here when I was in the Air Force, uh, when it was a military base and this was the McDonald's franchise. Uh, and I can't think of a better use of uh, old McDonald's than to be a, uh, a place that we study old data from the moon and uh, with new data. Uh, in fact, the place is called McMoons. Okay, uh, how about a quarter pounder with cheese and a medium coffee? Cream and sugar? Yes, sir, cream and sugar. I'm sorry, dude. Chicken, uh, she don't have to take pictures from the restaurant, please. Oh, uh, this, is, this is for a documentary. We own a McDonald's. Thank you. I used to come to this when it was not McDonald's. Oh, right. <laughs> not too often, I have to say, yeah. but, you know, for obvious reasons, right. but uh, yeah. There's something about McDonald's that's such an American cultural icon that people have just really loved it. And we've been able to do things like last year we crowdfunded almost $100,000 because we're in an abandoned McDonald's. 41 photo. Go. Roger, don't spoil it, change your tape. Stop your tape uh, when you give you the word and tele telephone 93 and restart prior to a wide angle 91. Uh, so that you have sufficient tape to terminate the readout. That's a good idea. Will do. Roger. Okay, glass, record a video. Okay, today we're recording a video using Google Glass and looking at our FR900 video tape recorder. And what we see right here is our head. And we're looking very closely at our FR900 head it's crucial to making the entire Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project work. We had, you know, uh, tape drives that hadn't operated in you know, 30, 40 years, tapes that we had no idea the condition thereof, but we apparently had the entire collection of all five Lunar Orbiter missions. I mean, it was abundantly, if you just look at the, the sheer number of these tapes, you do the math and we go, my God, we have the, it's like, having one wing of the Library of Alexandria suddenly dropped in your lap, and you just have to figure out the card catalog. That was the hard part. So here we go. Here we go, here's our image coming back. Takes a few seconds, so now we're looking at the high resolution image of the moon again. And you can see craters, you can see all kinds of stuff. Now think about this, I've been doing this for five and a half years, and I have literally I've recorded probably 95% of these tapes. 
And so I have seen probably every spot on the moon at least once. Again, this machine's 45 years old and not everything works correctly. There's brakes on these reels that will stop it, but this one's broken, so I actually have to physically grab the reel, and then when I hit stop, I use my hand to create enough friction to where the tape will stop. Now, we're starting again. We're looking at the moon, and I can tell you right here that what we're looking at, and I'm gonna turn this noise down here for right now, is a high resolution image. And a high resolution image on Lunar Orbiter 4 was about 40 to 100 meters. So these craters here, the very smallest craters that you can see in these images are about 40 to 50 meters across. It's, it's much less resolution than the other lunar orbiters, uh, Lunar Orbiter 1, 2, 3, and even 5, because what they did on Lunar Orbiter 4 is the first three missions, they accomplished their uh, photo reconnaissance mission. And when they accomplished the photo reconnaissance mission, they're going, what else can we do? We still have two spacecraft, or actually they had three. They never flew the last one. And so they, they put this one in a different orbit. They put it into a polar orbit at a higher altitude that allowed them to map a lot of the lunar surface. And so this is really cool from a science perspective because the moon was actually mapped from, uh, before the Earth was completely mapped from space. So it's like way, way, way cool. How do you restore something like that? You know, I mean, you have, you have tubes, you have old stuff in them that uh, technology is bypassed decades ago. The NASA people weren't very sure that there was even anything on the tapes after 40 years. And then we started to realize that there were things missing, like there was no demodulator in the tape drive. And as far as we could tell, the schematics were sort of classified. So we had to figure out how to reverse engineer this and eventually due to the fact that this program was heavily documented. And we had some retired engineers who were geniuses, a gentleman by the name of Al Sturm, who recreated the demodulator from uh, block diagrams and mathematical equations, which allowed us to read the rest of the tapes. But we needed somebody to run the tape drives, so we stumbled upon Ken Zinn, and again, another coincidence. So when they looked at the machine, they realized it wasn't like, you know, a VHS machine, throw the tape in there and push the button. There's a lot of connections, a lot of wires, pile of manuals, and didn't know where, where to even where to start at. It, it wouldn't get one tape off of any of this stuff. It wasn't for myself and yeah. to rebuild the machine and Al to build the demodulator and build a scan converter like that for us. But without that, you wouldn't have one damn picture. How we did this and how we brought the machine back to life, we had a bunch of students as young as 13, 14 years old, washing the electronics. They would actually bathe the power supplies in water and they're going, well, this will work. And Ken, who'd done this a lot, said, oh yeah, it'll work. So I also had three kids that were off for the summer. And uh, rather than have them stay home and play video games, I volunteered them to come over and to help wash the equipment. I think one of the memories I have that's most like fresh in my mind is they gave me this whole circuitry thing that would go into one of the machines and they took me to the back and they told me to just spray it just soak it down and that had just like roared with everything that I knew about circuitry and, and I was just freaking out the whole time it's like my face was probably like a permanent cringe the entire time it's going on but Ken's like no just throw it in the sink and spray it it's fine <laughs> and so now here we have Keith going to take and blast with water this 90 volt power supply so we can clean it up. This is all part of our refurbishing process. This is how the professionals do it. Yeah, we thought it was insane when we first heard about it, but it makes perfect sense. And we've already proven it works because our previously washed power supplies are all working just fine. We worked very hard and over a three month period, we got the tape drives back working. And we were very lucky to find an analog uh, tape that had already been demodulated and the very first image that came out was the most famous image of the 1960s. It's called Earthrise. The very first picture of the Earth ever taken from space. The signal is, is a television signal. 
uh, coming off the spacecraft. And what that means is that it's relayed line by line by line. And those lines are stacked sequentially to form one image. Uh, it's, it's a long, narrow strip. And these, uh, these long, narrow strips are then uh, assembled side by side to form the, uh, the complete uh, frame. So in a uh, high resolution frame, we'll have about 90 of those, uh, those small strips uh, called framelets. And in a medium resolution frame, we'll have about a third of that. So, uh, so far we've captured about 100,000 of these uh, strips of images. We now have finished the capturing of all of the images off the tapes, which is the most difficult part, because it's one thing to get a 40-year-old tape drive running. It's another thing to keep it running for five years. These are gonna be all on a public website so people can download our multi-gigabyte images. And people all over the world have been downloading them. And so this is part of what I wanted to do is public science, crowdfunded science. The American people spent the equivalent of today $120 billion going to the moon. And in that era, they didn't have access to this. They'd see it on the news and something like this. But today, with the Internet and all, we own these images. They're part of our heritage. And one of the interesting things about our project is we call ourselves techno-archaeologists, which is literally the archaeology of technology. And in that, we're going back and digging into our past, and we're showing this and preserving it for the future, and that has really struck a chord with people all over the world. Think about the lunar orbiters, and this is what I think about when I'm watching the images come by, and I watch them on the television screen every day. Before the lunar orbiters flew to the moon, mankind had never in all of its history seen the moon up close. And I'm seeing these images come down as the people saw them 40 something years ago. And I look at the craters and I look at the mountains and I'm going, I can imagine myself living there. I can imagine people going there and doing things. And to not go there and do things would just be terribly tragic. And, and to me, the importance of these images are beautiful. The moon is beautiful. It's all rounded. The earth is beautiful because it has crags and trees and all this scenery. But on the moon, everything is smooth. It's all gray. It's just, it's very peaceful. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And this is what we've been able to see. And we make, when we make these images and one comes out, we just go, oh, wow. We can imagine ourselves in lunar orbit as the, uh, the guy that was left in the Apollo when the two astronauts would go down to the surface. We can imagine what he saw going over the moon. And we see the, it's just, it's just to us, it's just beauty. It's beautiful. And that, to me, that's what life is about as much as it is engineering or anything else. It's just beautiful. Yeah. It, it does. Yeah. Uh huh. Congratulations.
Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous stuff. Thank yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, remember when yeah, we Ken. Awesome. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Mike Meacham at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and this is an episode of Crazy Engineering. Here at JPL, we have to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before, and sometimes the solutions can seem a little crazy. Today we're going to talk about this bad boy, an ion thruster. What's so special about an ion thruster? What makes it different, and how does it help us get through the solar system? Let's go talk to an expert. All right, guys, we found our expert. This is Mark Raymond. Hi, Mike. Mark, where are we? We're at a vacuum chamber here at JPL where we test ion engines like this one, and we have three just like it on the Dawn spacecraft that's out in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Can you explain what makes an ion thruster different than other types of thrusters? Sure. Well, first, let's remind ourselves how a regular rocket engine works. You take a gas and you heat it up or you put it under pressure and you push it out of the rocket nozzle and the action of the gas going out of the nozzle causes a reaction that pushes the spacecraft in the other direction. With ion engines, instead of heating the gas up or putting it under pressure, we give the gas xenon a little electric charge, and then they're called ions, and we use a big voltage to accelerate the xenon ions through this metal grid, and we shoot them out of the engine at up to 90,000 miles per hour, and they're going out so fast that each individual ion gives a relatively large push back on the spacecraft. So if I'm the spacecraft, could you, could you push me as hard as I'm going to feel from one of these thrusters? I can try. OK, I'm right. ready. I can take it. I barely felt that. That's right. The engine pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. In the zero gravity, frictionless environment of space, though, gradually the effect of this thrust builds up. At full throttle, it would take Dawn four days to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour. Wow, that is a slow car, isn't it? It is, but instead of thrusting for four days, if we thrust for a week or a year, or as Dawn already has for almost five years, you can build up fantastically high velocity. It's what I like to call acceleration with patience. Why is that a good thing? What's the trade-off? What can Dawn do that other spacecraft cannot do? The ion engine gives us the maneuverability to go into orbit, and after we've been there for a while, then to leave orbit and go on to another destination and do the same thing. In 57 years of space exploration, Dawn is the first mission targeted to orbit any two extraterrestrial destinations. It wouldn't be possible without ion propulsion. For two centuries, this had just been a little smudge of light against the stars. Dawn got to spend 14 months at Vesta and turned it into a whole new, complex, fascinating alien world. Mark, uh, where are we right now? This is the Dawn Mission Control Room at JPL. This is where we control the spacecraft from. We tell the spacecraft where to point the thruster, what throttle level to use, and that's how we guide the spacecraft through the solar system. And we're on to the next location, which is Ceres. That's right, a dwarf planet, in fact, the first one ever discovered. We're going to get into orbit very soon, and the pictures are going to be coming into this very room. Very cool. Stay tuned for those photos, and stay tuned for some more crazy engineering. It's going to be cool. Mike Meacham at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and this is an episode of Crazy Engineering. Here at JPL, we have to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before, and sometimes the solutions can seem a little crazy. Today we're going to talk about this bad boy, an ion thruster. What's so special about an ion thruster? What makes it different, and how does it help us get through the solar system? Let's go talk to an expert. All right, guys, we found our expert. This is Mark Raymond. Hi, Mike. Mark, where are we? We're at a vacuum chamber here at JPL where we test ion engines like this one, and we have three just like it on the Dawn spacecraft that's out in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Can you explain what makes an ion thruster different than other types of thrusters? Sure. Well, first, let's remind ourselves how a regular rocket engine works. You take a gas and you heat it up or you put it under pressure and you push it out of the rocket nozzle and the action of the gas going out of the nozzle causes a reaction that pushes the spacecraft in the other direction. With ion engines, instead of heating the gas up or putting it under pressure, we give the gas xenon a little electric charge, and then they're called ions, 
and we use a big voltage to accelerate the xenon ions through this metal grid and we shoot them out of the engine at up to 90,000 miles per hour. And they're going out so fast that each individual ion gives a relatively large push back on the spacecraft. So if I'm the spacecraft, could you, could you push me as hard as I'm going to feel from one of these thrusters? I can try. Okay, I'm ready. I can take it. I barely felt that. That's right. The engine pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. In the zero gravity, frictionless environment of space though, gradually the effect of this thrust builds up. At full throttle, it would take Dawn four days to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour. Wow, that is a slow car, isn't it? It is, but instead of thrusting for four days, if we thrust for a week or a year, or as Dawn already has for almost five years, you can build up fantastically high velocity. It's what I like to call acceleration with patience. Why is that a good thing? What's the trade-off? What can Dawn do that other spacecraft cannot do? The ion engine gives us the maneuverability to go into orbit, and after we've been there for a while, then to leave orbit and go on to another destination and do the same thing. In 57 years of space exploration, Dawn is the first mission targeted to orbit any two extraterrestrial destinations. It wouldn't be possible without ion propulsion. For two centuries, this had just been a little smudge of light against the stars. Dawn got to spend 14 months at Vesta and turned it into a whole new, complex, fascinating alien world. Mark, uh, where are we right now? This is the Dawn Mission Control Room at JPL. This is where we control the spacecraft from. We tell the spacecraft where to point the thruster, what throttle level to use, and that's how we guide the spacecraft through the solar system. And we're on to the next location, which is Ceres. That's right, a dwarf planet, in fact, the first one ever discovered. We're gonna get into orbit very soon, and the pictures are gonna be coming into this very room. Very cool, stay tuned for those photos, and stay tuned for some more crazy engineering. It's gonna be cool. Hey guys, we've all seen these RC helicopters before. They're everywhere, they're a ton of fun. But we were thinking here at JPL, could we fly one of these on Mars? We're gonna talk about that on this episode of Crazy Engineering. So why would you wanna put a helicopter on Mars? If I'm the rover right now, I can't really see over the terrain behind me. But if I had a helicopter with a camera on it, all of a sudden, I can see a whole lot more. If our rover was equipped with its very own helicopter that could see over the tall objects in front of us, it would allow us to make decisions much more efficiently on which way to command the rover. You might think it's actually easier to fly one of these helicopters on Mars because it's actually three-eighths the gravity we have here on Earth, but it's a hundred times less atmosphere. The way any of these helicopters work is the rotor blades spin up and they produce lift because of the density of the atmosphere. So once you lose that density, you've got to spin even faster or get bigger rotor blades or get lighter. How are we going to solve that problem if we go to Mars? Let's go talk to an expert and see if we can figure this out. All right, guys, I think we found our expert. This is Bob. Bob, could you tell us where we are right now? We're in one of our robotics labs here at JPL where we have a full-scale mock-up of one of the Mars helicopters we've been working on. What are the challenges that you have to overcome in order to produce lift on the surface? Right, so there's a challenge of the very low density of the atmosphere. There's the challenge of keeping the whole mass of the system small so that we don't overwhelm the lift capability of the system. It has to be autonomous in terms of being able to fly and maintain stable flight. And then this system has to repeatedly take off and land on natural rocky terrain like you see out here. And then the other one is that it has to survive the harsh environment of Mars. So we're early in the design stages of this thing. What kind of testing, what kind of results have you seen so far? So over the course of the last year, we've done a number of tests in our 25-foot vacuum chamber using scaled models where we pump down to Mars densities, demonstrating lift of these kinds of blades. So how fast do the blades have to spin to produce lift? They have to spin at about 2,400 RPM to provide lift. Could you tell us a little bit about this helicopter's capabilities when it's on Mars? Right, so the system is designed to fly for two to three minutes every day. There's a solar panel on the top, and that provides us enough energy for that short flight, as well as to keep us warm through the night. So in those two to three minutes, we expect to have daily flights of about a half a kilometer or so. What are the next steps? How do we get this thing ready for a future rover mission? Because this thing is gonna take off every day and land every day. We wanna make sure we have a bulletproof landing system and landing is the riskiest part of any mission. EDL had seven minutes of terror, we'll have seven seconds of terror every day. Bob, thanks a lot for teaching us about the helicopter. 
I hope you guys out there had as much fun as we did learning about this, and check back soon for some more crazy engineering. On June 28th, NASA's Low Density Supersonic Accelerator Project conducted the first shakeout flight of a new way of testing technologies that will one day be used to land heavier, more massive payloads on the surface of Mars. We used a large 34 million cubic foot scientific balloon to hoist a 7,000 pound test vehicle to an altitude of 120,000 feet. The test vehicle was then released from the balloon, spun up for stability, and a large solid rocket motor accelerated to over four times the speed of sound in an altitude of 180,000 feet, a condition very similar to the conditions it would see at Mars. Once we reached the correct speed and altitude, we despun the vehicle. And then we got a chance to test our new supersonic inflatable decelerator. The camera lens covers deploy, but we see that inflated very uniformly without disturbing the vehicle too much. And now we're seeing previously unreleased, high definition, high resolution, and high speed video taken during the test. We used the supersonic inflatable decelerator to slow us to something closer to two and a half times the speed of sound. We use a balut to help deploy the new supersonic parachute. The balut is shot out the back of the vehicle at over 200 feet per second, and then we cut the balut free and it begins to pull the parachute off the back of the vehicle. As the parachute begins to inflate, we see one of the surprising aspects of this test, which is the early onset of tears in the parachute. We see where those tears began, how they propagated, and otherwise how the parachute behaved as it began trying to inflate behind this very blunt object moving two and a half times the speed of sound, punching a hole in the atmosphere, and creating an extremely turbulent, chaotic environment for the parachute to exist in. We now have a data set that we will use to prepare for two more tests beginning in June of 2015. The Rosetta spacecraft was launched by the European Space Agency 10 years ago on its really long journey to catch up with the comet. Right now, the spacecraft is in the orbit of the comet, getting its lander ready for this historic event. It'll be the first time humanity has ever attempted a landing on the surface of a comet. Nobody knows <laughs> how easy or how hard it is to land on a comet because nobody has done it before. We don't know what to expect. This is not a friendly comet to land on. There are boulders, there's dust, there are jets, and the shape is just truly bizarre. You have to look at all of the landing sites. You have to find a smooth spot. The slopes can't be too steep. Can't be really large rocks there. The lander will be ejected from the mother spacecraft and fall to the surface of the comet. Since this is an unpowered landing, this spacecraft is just free falling to the surface. It's going to be responding to the gravity of the comet and to the uh, pressure of the gas pushing against the spacecraft. Both of these things we have no control over. Gravity on the comet is, is very low. That's why we have anchoring harpoons, which we will fire immediately at touchdown to keep the lander on the surface. Being able to touch down and to be able to scoop up some of that primordial material, this is going to open the doors to us. It's scientifically sexy. It's going to give us so much information, so much science. Finding out what's inside the comet will tell us what our solar system was like four and a half billion years ago. It's going to the unknown, and the whole world is watching. Is the landing going to be successful? We are already successful because we undertake missions like this, because we showed the human spirit of exploration, of not being afraid to fail. It's the challenge of being bold. That's why we take on tasks like this.
This was the pale blue dot. This was our willingness to see the Earth as a one pixel object in a far greater cosmos. It's that humility that science gives us that weans us from our childhood need to be the center of things. And Voyager gave us that image of the Earth that is so heart-tugging because it's, you can't look at that image and not think of how fragile, how fragile our world is, how much we have in common with everyone with whom we share it our relationship, our relatedness to everyone on this tiny pixel. Everything that you thought you knew about space is wrong. Side code, let's get this thing started. First of all, we're not bashing science fiction movies. We're using the scientific inaccuracy to create a teachable moment. There's no sound in space. Sound needs a medium to travel through, like air, water, or even steel, to name a few. That rhymed. Space is a vacuum, so sound can't travel through it. A spaceship fight in space would sound like... There's no such thing as zero gravity. Gravity is everywhere in space. The same force that binds us to the ground keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth and keeps the planets in orbit around the sun. Gravity never takes a break. So when astronauts look like they're floating, it's because they're falling at the same rate as the space station or in the spaceship that they're in. And this is known as microgravity. Asteroids are further apart than you think. Forget what you learned from the Asteroids video games or from watching Star Wars. The average distance between asteroids is one million miles, giving you plenty of room to parallel park a Millennium Falcon or an entire fleet. Space is huge. As a matter of fact, space is so big that even light takes a while to reach some destinations. Light can travel up to 300 million meters per second, but the sheer vastness of space makes light seem like a snail riding on the back of a turtle through the cosmos. At light speed, a trip from the sun to the earth would take you about eight minutes. While that seems fast, a trip to our closest neighbor star, Proxima Centauri, would take you about four years. And the trip to the Andromeda Galaxy would take you two and a half million years. So in order for us to travel from galaxy to galaxy in the same time frame in which we travel from state to state or country to country, would take technology far beyond what we have today. But as long as we continue to make advancements in science, we'll someday make that dream a reality. And I hope we make it a reality really, 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 really soon. Psycho. Thanks for watching this episode of Psycho. If we left out any misconceptions, or if you have questions or ideas for a future episode, leave it in the comments below. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more science. I'm Komen Nitti and I'll see you next time.
Okay, this one. That one's good. This one is good. Yeah, we're good now. That's this camera here. Okay, I'm just going to set, set the other one up and then I'll come and look at it. I'm waiting for him to turn the lights down so that I can white balance it.
back and get her. And, <laughs> so you can get there and hop on the train. So that's not hard. Yeah, last year, this whole morning dragged on, and everybody's like chomping at the bit to start hacking. Hey everybody, thank you all for coming. We're actually going to be uh, just starting in just a second. Let me just a ask you all to thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Caprio, uh, I'm with uh, Startup Bus. And my name is Alice, I'm with the New York Technology Council. And we'd like to welcome you to our fourth annual uh, Space Apps NYC Hackathon and inaugural conference and festival. So you all know we're, we're running a bit late, uh, so we're going to forego some of the uh, talk about us being the organizers and all that stuff. We're going to immediately go to Deborah Diaz and Ellen Stofan, the chief technology officer and chief scientist of NASA. Uh, unfortunately, Ellen has to leave, uh, so we're going to let them do their uh, kind of opening ribbon-cutting remarks first, and then we will continue from there. Back to you. I'm going to start with Ellen first, and then she's going to tell us the breakout stories. So I'm Ellen Stofan. I'm the chief scientist of NASA. I'm actually a planetary scientist. I study volcanoes around the solar system. But as chief scientist of NASA, I get to sort of dabble in all the cool science that we do at NASA, from uh, all the work that we do with our six astronauts every day up on the International Space Station, learning about the effects of microgravity on human health. It turns out a lot of the things that happen to you up there, bone density loss, muscle wasting, are things that happen to us as we age here on Earth. So that when we're developing uh, ways for the astronauts to mitigate those effects, we're actually learning things that can help us here on Earth. We have our own study of our favorite planet, the Earth. Um, obviously, the Earth is changing. Climate change is a huge concern for the future. So how can we take all that NASA data that we gather? We have 19 satellites right now in orbit around the Earth, measuring everything we can measure, trying to document what's happening on our changing planet. Huge amounts of data, all publicly available on the Internet. We're on a journey to Mars, that work we're doing on the International Space Station to get astronauts ready to go to Mars. Uh, we're developing a new rocket called the Space Launch System. We need all kinds of technology to figure out from how do we 3D print new parts for a mission to Mars, how do we get the robotic tools we need to go to Mars, all these things we're doing. Okay, all those things I just talked about, we're just NASA. We're working with all the space agencies of the world, but even that, frankly, I don't think is good enough. And that's why we're here this weekend, and that's why we're so excited to be here. We're so grateful for Microsoft hosting us here today, because we need to harness the power of everybody to help NASA. We need you all to become, for this weekend, our, our people, our, our citizen science, our crowdsource, to take our data and get it into the hands of everybody. Make our data more useful. Help us on the journey to Mars. Help us utilize uh, what the astronauts are doing to help people here on Earth. Help us figure out cool things, like how would we use lava tubes maybe to have astronauts live on Mars to protect them from the radiation that comes into the surface on Mars? How can we take our Earth science data and help do clean water mapping or help do crop alerts to make our data more useful for farmers? It's time to take that NASA data out of the hands of the scientific community, and I'm a scientist, so I'm saying this with all good intentions, out of the hands of the scientific community and put that data in the hands of everybody for the betterment of people here on Earth. So everything that you guys are doing here today, which we really call citizen science, how do we take everybody and get them involved in what they do and help us move together, not just as the US, but as we know from our 136 cities around the globe participating today, how do we harness the power of the whole globe to help move us forward? And you guys are a critical part of that. We're stronger together than we are individually, and we need everybody on board. And I'm so glad no offense, guys, but I'm so glad to see so many women here today because if we don't <laughs> harness, <laughs> if we don't harness the power of everybody, how are we going to get people down onto the surface of Mars? How are we going to solve climate change? How are we going to tackle these really tough problems that we have in front of us if only 50% of the population is helping? So anyway, I'm so glad to hear you all get, you see you guys here today. You're going to do great things this weekend, and we're going to come out of this with some amazing new apps. So thank you. And I'm 
sorry, I have to run. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. And now we're going to ask one of our astronauts, Katie Coleman. We're going to do a little swapping of places. So thank you so much. I'm thrilled and would like to welcome all of you to our International Space Apps Challenge 2015. Since 2012, Space Apps has become the world's largest hackathon, engaging thousands of citizens around the globe, working with NASA in designing innovative solutions into challenges across the globe to work using our open source data. We've grown from 25 locations in our first year to over 136 global locations. Woohoo! That's huge. <laughs> That's huge. And we have over 10,000 participants and another 1,000 virtual. So just imagine across the entire globe, this activity is going on for the next 76 hours. So during that period, uh, people will create new solutions to address a broad range of 35 challenges, such as designing wearable technologies for astronauts, building our own drones, turning many of NASA's breathtaking imagery into art, or mapping clean water. There's a wide variety of activities that you can work on. Over the, those 35 challenges are aligned along uh, NASA's mission, and those themes are Earth, outer space, humans, and robotics. The challenges will tap the creativity of people from around the world to solve problems together. NASA is thrilled to have global teams of technologists, scientists, designers, different genders, entrepreneurs, designers. It, everybody is welcome to participate. Um, in years past, we've had a number of families participate as well, a lot of youth activities at many of the locations. Um, uh, this year, we've actually created a women in data boot camp that happened yesterday. Uh, and that was to lower the barrier of entry to newcomers to the hackathon experience. And many of them are in the audience today. <coughs> After the Space Apps Weekend, we'll debut a new program to help support women in the data science field. It's going to be called Data Not Core. And I look forward to providing more information about this program over the next few weeks. We have some new products developed with the Hackathon community in mind. Uh, we've really tried to improve uh, what's been done in the, the prior three years. We've provided 16,000 new data sets and over 40 APIs. This helps developers avoid large downloads in varying API formats. The APIs increase the discoverability and the searchability. We heard you loud and clear last year that you needed a developer's toolkit and are now providing API management of developer keys, rate limiting, and caching. And it's now all available through data.nasa.gov. We have a number of very talented folks here in New York for questions, and we also have uh, expertise that we can develop through a Google Hangout or online. Uh, and we have our chief scientists, who you just heard from. Uh, we have our astronauts, who you'll hear from shortly. Uh, other technical staff, such as Jason Dooley, who did a lot of the work on the APIs. Uh, uh, Dan Hammer uh, is reachable as well. Beth Beck and Gladys Henderson. Uh, we also have uh, several other folks uh, working with us uh, with the press. Uh, most of all, what I do want to th thank is our hosts, the sponsors, and mostly all of you for volunteering over a weekend for this hackathon. I look forward to seeing what innovative solutions you're going to create. It's just been amazing the kind of work that's been done through citizen science, and I really am excited about this year. Thank you. I'll turn it over to our glorious astronaut, Katie Coleman. I don't know about glorious. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I'll pick it up from where Deborah left off, talking about all the amazing results that have already come from hackathons like this, from people saying, well, you know, I have this idea, and I may not be able to do everything myself, but joining together with a team and making something happen. And, and the value of looking at things from a different way. We had a uh, challenge to invent a new way to do spacesuit gloves where we needed a certain dexterity and, and the ones we have are really bulky. And I think that the person who actually won was a costume designer. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, there's, there's a lot of different viewpoints to bring. And 
you know, as an astronaut, I'm kind of down in the down in the trenches, and, you know, doing the work that a lot of other people are designing, and then other people are taking that data that we collect on our missions or satellites or telescopes that we enable to space. The other people are taking that data and doing something with it, and that is you. And what I'd like, so I like to emphasize what it's like to really be in the trenches and to be one of those people because that's what you are today. You know, you're on a team. Not yet, but you will be, right? Uh, you're on a mission. Certainly, you're on a mission. We have 35 challenges. They're challenging. And they're not there because we wanted to make stuff up. It's because we, as, as uh, Ellen was saying, we can't do this alone as NASA. And so I challenge you when you're picking your teams, when you're doing your projects, really try to let people surprise you. I mean, we don't get to pick our space flight teams. And actually, for my, uh, to, uh, something I'm really excited about today is Ron Guerin will be here today. I think he's been here before in New York. It's actually my first uh, Space Apps Challenge. But Ron and I flew in space together on uh, Expedition 27. And there's just something special about that that you can never take away. So we're always glad to see each other. And it'll be neat to have us here. Um, we'll try to work in a phone call with our Italian crewmate, Paolo. We'll see. <laughs> Anyways, um, but we don't get to pick those things. And you know, I, I don't know that Ron and I thought, you know, we're really going to be glad we spent a few months together in a small place. And so, but, it, but there's a bond that develops, but also, you know, basically you really can't know people and, and you have to let them surprise you. And people look at me and several people have stopped me and they want to take pictures and things like that because I have this uniform, I have this label, and it says to you, she has that job, she must be somebody. But realize that in this room, Everybody is somebody. There are lots of somebodies. Which one of you may be one of the ones to walk on Mars or to develop the software or the hardware that helps us have the environmental control system that would enable us to actually take an important step on the way to Mars? I mean, there's a reason we're not on Mars yet, and that's because we have a lot of work to do, and it's not done yet, and they're actually they're incremental steps that are logical. Um, a good environmental system that doesn't break all the time on the space station, ours breaks quite a bit. It's not because people were not talented designers. It's because we're learning about the microgravity environment. And we need to learn those things before we're ready to go further. I mean, there's Earth, there's low Earth orbit, there's the moon, asteroids, and then Mars is, you know, in the next building. It's really far away. So there's things that we need, things that we need to develop. And when you're looking around and you're choosing these teams, I'll just give you a, I'll give you a team choosing uh, experience from my own background, which is when I was a uh, freshman or sophomore in college at MIT. I was a chemistry major. Big lab course, 12 to 5, Monday through Thursday, Friday's optional. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and 12 of us, you knew you needed a really good lab partner. And there was this one woman in the group, and tall, blonde, beautiful, kind of California-like. And I just thought, nah, you know, <laughs> nah. And apparently she looked over at me and she thought, you know, nobody that cute could do chemistry. <laughs> so we were not lab partners with each other, although we basically gravitated towards each other very soon and worked together for the next three years. She's a MacArthur Fellow. She's a world-famous, amazing chemistry professor at the University of Wisconsin. And I have a pretty cool day job. And we, <laughs> we were wrong. You really, it's, I think it's actually one of the most important things you can do here today is you know, look for the people that don't, are, you know, are kind of standing there, but don't know how to say, I think maybe I should be on your team. They're, they're out there, they're here. It's gonna be a really exciting day. I think on the schedule, we had a thing that said there would be autographs um, at 11. And in, in past times, it's just turned out to be inconvenient for you to be standing in lines when you should be teaming and working and all those kinds of things. I am gonna be here all weekend until the prizes are given out. I am judging just so you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm here all weekend. I am gonna be going around to all the different groups. I will sign anything, I will take any pictures. So we're just gonna do it that way without having it be some formal kind of thing. And uh, there's lots of time to make it happen. I'm really excited about being here today. I'm gonna learn lots and lots of things. And I'm very excited about what you are bringing to NASA. And I thank you.
Well, yeah, thank you, Katie. We're so grateful to have you here. I'd like to now welcome our Microsoft, uh, represents our, our intergalactic sponsor, Microsoft, uh, Matt Thompson. Uh, come on up to the stage. And <laughs> Teresa, you come up too. I'd like to, I'd like to also introduce everybody to, to Teresa. Come on up. <laughs> Teresa has worked with us from the beginning uh, to get us here in the space, and she's done such a fantastic job, so I just want to say a thank you to her real quick. Um, so yeah, if you guys... Uh, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand. So I am an evangelist for Microsoft. I run the, the evangelism organization across the U.S. I'm only going to take a couple of minutes. But I can't sit. So scientists can sit and talk. Like, I have to walk and talk. Otherwise, I just it doesn't work. So the first thing I want to say is welcome. Welcome. Hey, good morning. So, yeah, so, so we, run, we run about 50 hackathons a year. Um, I was at UCLA last weekend, Poly Pavilion, 10 national banners hanging over my head, talking to students about why hack. And I can tell you the very first thing is you need energy. You guys know that. So I know you guys, this is the lull before the storm. You guys will be fully energized because uh, there's a lot of work left to do, right? Um, but so I'm just going to take one minute to talk about why we do this. I'm not talking about Microsoft. I'm talking about you. So the thing that's interesting is I have a background in computer science. I actually wrote the first C++ compiler for Sun Microsystems 20 years ago. One of the interesting things was that we had two builds a day, okay? We did a build during lunch. We did a build at night. You left for lunch, came back an hour and a half later, and the system might be built for you to test. And if somebody broke the build, then you spent part of your afternoon fixing it. Then we did a system build at night. That's how fast software moved 20 years ago. Like, you couldn't hold a hackathon if that was the case, right? And many, I talked to, I talked to students, I gave, gave this story to the, the students at UCLA, and they were like, uh, really? That's how the world worked? God, how did you survive, right? So the thing is that hackathons have emerged as a way of sharing, building on the shoulders of others, democratization of data, and a deep desire to make the world a better place. That's why you guys are all here. You guys know that. That's why we're here too. So we sponsor these things across the country, not just for NASA, but a lot of student ones. We did our first middle school hackathon earlier this year. Happened to be at my kid's school, so I am personally motivated to do that. Um, but having, you know, having 12-year-olds hack with real data was amazing, the kind of things they came up with, the views of the world that they, they came forward with. So we're here because we fundamentally believe in that hacker ethos. I hope it's why you're here as well. The fact that you guys have some amazing people to work with already is fantastic. I just want to point out anybody wearing the Space Cat shirt works on my team, and they're here to help as well. We brought some of our, our best technologists along here as well. So please, if you, have, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we've got a number of things here for you to help make this fun. So we have a space photo booth. Go try check that out. We also have a very interesting game that one of our evangelists built that is, is it's fun to play, but what we really want to do is show you what computer vision could be like. So it's using a Kinect to, to model things. So really would like you guys to go check that out. If you're interested in computer vision, it's a great thing to go check out. Um, in the hack space, we have a bunch of loaner devices. If you're interested in testing out on different devices, whether it be mobile devices, tablets, et cetera, come check that out as well. And then the last one, which I want to make sure I get right, we're tweeting today, and it's, it's what is it? Yep. That's right. And also, was it M Microsoft NY? Microsoft yeah. NY. Yeah, that's right. So the last thing I just wanted to say then, um, I, I live in Silicon Valley. I came out here yesterday just for this. I'm getting back on a plane going home tonight. Um, I actually get an opportunity to work with a lot of startups in, in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we got to do just, uh, just a couple weeks ago was give Elon Musk a, an award, not through my Microsoft work, but through a nonprofit that I work with. And one of the things that he did is he got up and spoke very eloquently for about 25 minutes on a bunch of different ideas. But I just want to leave you with a quote. And it was a very simple quote. It was, we have to get off the damn planet. It's literally how he finished his talk. <laughs> so even if you don't agree with the fact that he thinks we do have to get off the planet, what this is about is the ability for us to do so. And what NASA's come forward and said is that it's up to us as citizen scientists to be part of that solution. I hope you help solve some of those problems this weekend. Thank you guys very much. All right, I'll make this quick because I know that everyone's really dying to hack. Um, I'm told I have three minutes. I want to compress it to one. Um, by day, I lead what we do with startups in New York. 
um, which means I have the great privilege of finding the magic that everybody makes. It's the best job. And to be here, um, it's such an honor to see the magic that you make. Now, by night, undercover, I'm also a mom. And my kids are coming this afternoon. And I can't wait to have them see uh, what you're all doing. Um, right now, though, um, I have an, a call to action for all of you. And this is like the final uh, little bit of my minute. Um, the, the Skype in the classroom people actually asked me to come up. They were dying to get involved in space apps as well. Um, they are all about connecting people from across the planet so they can do things and think things and see things they otherwise couldn't. Um, it also means that they are very intent on helping to pay it forward. So um, they have a program that is um, launching in September um, called Uplift with Skype in the classroom. Sorry that I was supposed to, this slide's supposed to, nope, whatever, sorry, that's all of them. Um, I want to use my last 30 seconds for this call to action. What they're doing is organizing fabulous people like you to do Skype sessions with students to show, like, tell them what you do and help them understand um, the really, really important work that you do. So it's, it's actually a very crisp and clean kind of time commitment. It's like two a month for 20 minutes. Um, we were at TED a few weeks ago, and a whole bunch of TED speakers signed up. And we can't think of who better and who more inspirational than people in this room who are making amazing stuff. So the call to action is this. Pull out your phone. I know you have one. And text um, Skype ITC to 41411. Okay, so 41411. If you want to be a Skype guest speaker to sign up for the program, I'll say it again, 41411. And put in the words Skype ITC in the classroom. Skype in the classroom. And they'll shoot you over a form so you can sign up. But really think about doing it. What I understand is that it's certainly amazing for the students, but it's as amazing for you. It's really um, helps us remember why we do this. So that's it. Have an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And uh, by the way, I also want to mention um, Skype very graciously will be paying for dinner tonight. So there are dinner sponsors. So <laughs> please remember <laughs> when, you're, when you're having delicious, delicious uh, burger bar hamburgers tonight, you can thank Skype for that. Uh, so the next thing I would like to do is uh, actually welcome uh, the rest of our fantastic sponsors up to the, uh, up to the stage to just have a few words. Uh, we'll start with interstellar sponsor IBM. Uh, come right up to the stage. Uh, Bruce Weed from IBM will be giving a few remarks. Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you here today and thank you all for coming. We're excited to be here. This is what we're all about. I'm responsible for New York City business development for developers and entrepreneurs. So this is what I focus on, working with guys like you to take code and develop it and hopefully launch your own company. Very important today what we're trying to do, right? We're really trying to figure out how do we innovate. Innovation is the key to today's success. In order to help you innovate better, what we've done is we've provided some tools for you to be able to do that. One of the tools that you can leverage is a tool called Bluemix. Bluemix is our cloud platform for development. We offer many t different types of data services and things that you can access. As an example, just to put it in perspective, you could take some of our Internet of Things, work with that particular data service, and work to focus on the robotics and the sensors, collecting sensor data in and analyzing that. Now, to make it even easier for you, we have actually have a white paper that's available online. It's a PDF file. And it actually breaks down each of the NASA challenges and then focuses within those challenges what are the different types of services you could use to solve that challenge. So how do you get access to this information? You go to ibm.biz forward slash space apps 215. So if you have your cell phones, you can take them out, go to that website, and you will find that PDF file that you can access. In addition to that, we will be giving away top three prizes to the teams that really innovate using Bluemix. Those prizes will be awarded on April 15th. An easy day to remember, that's, that's tax day, right? All your taxes have to be in if you're earning income. 
but really i just want to encourage you guys you know look around if you need help we've got folks like frank in the back of the room he has a shirt on says commit deploy scale and repeat uh, we also have a guy that's walking around he looks like a mad scientist type of dude he's wearing a white lab coat with white glasses you've probably seen him if you haven't you will see him today and we also have the mission control room downstairs on the fifth floor please ask for help. One of the things I've noticed when working with entrepreneurs, sometimes they want to do it all themselves. They're like, well, you know, I'll figure it out. Ask for help, right? Don't be one of these, and I'll, I'll pick on guys for a minute, right? Guys will sit there, they'll be driving along, and they won't ask for directions, right? Women have no problem doing that. Ask for directions. If you don't know where you're going, you need help, yell. And that's really it. I just want you guys to have fun, encourage you, be creative, be thoughtful, and work together as teams. This is really a, a great event, and I thank NASA for taking the leadership and really driving this event and sponsoring it. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> and next, we have Interstellar sponsor, Socrata. Hello, everyone. My name, hi. My name is Christian Hugerhide. I'm with Socrata, and we have been working with NASA to relaunch data.nasa.gov, which is NASA's publicly available rowing catalog of APIs and data sets and visualizations, so I encourage everyone to use it this weekend. And I just want to say two quick things. Number one is there's a bunch of Socrata folks here, like myself, and a couple people up here and downstairs on the fifth floor. We're going to be walking around observing what you guys are doing and hopefully helping you with the site and assisting you on the APIs, but we are going to be awarding something called the Open Data Award tomorrow. The only requirement is that you have to use data from data.nasa.gov. So I encourage everyone to check out the site and to use it, and you'll be eligible for the award. The second thing is, um, many of us have been to a lot of hackathons before, and you know that this is true. It's very easy to get lost in your computer screen, and very easy to get lost in what you're building with your own team, and that's about it. But I just want to encourage everyone to look up from your computer screen and to say hi to the people around you, to make some new friends and make connections from everyone here because there's a lot of really cool people and you'll have a lot more fun. So thank you all and thanks to the NASA and Space Apps Challenge teams. That's all I have. Thank you, Christian. Next up, we have Supernova sponsor, Touch Lab, uh, CEO Kevin Galligan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I think my title changes periodically, president to CEO person. Uh, I got in late from speaking in Montreal last night, so I just wrote my notes. I'll be really fast. Uh, yeah, Touch Lab, we make Android apps. Um, I don't really have much to say other than uh, I think this is a great event. It's really inspiring to, um, I think, for new programmers to get into doing software development. For people who have been doing it for years, like myself, I've been programming since I was seven. Um, it's like a reminder of why we like to do it. So I think it's fantastic. Um, let's see. I think this is our third year, and we don't really have an API. We just sponsor to, like, you know, say, hey, this is great, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's really progressed a lot. I want to have everyone, like, clap for the team putting it together. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and just guess. Uh, there are a lot of hackathons out there. I mean, like, too many now, but this is one where you actually get to contribute something that's useful, potentially, so I think that's awesome. Uh, if you know anything mobile-related, I'll be wandering around periodically, so pull me aside, um, you know, especially Android. And if uh, you are or eventually become an Android developer, we're always hiring, so get in touch. That's it. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I'll pass off the mic. Next up, we have Supernova sponsor Twilio. Uh, evangelist Ricky Robinette. What's up, Space Apps? I'm going to plug in real quick. So, I don't know, Mike, you got some good banter? So, uh, I'm going to give Startup Bus a quick plug if, uh, if that's going to happen. So, uh, Kevin Galligan, Startup Bus member, Ricky Robinette, Startup Bus member, myself, Startup Bus member, Alice Ng, co organizer of Space Apps MIT, Startup Bus member. Uh, Startup Bus uh, is a wonderful organization. We are a 1,000 member alumni. Uh, group worldwide. Uh, we take a road trip from origin cities across uh, countries and in 72 hours create startups. Uh, so from start to finish, uh, a complete startup from scratch. Um, I probably should be on the actual camera. <laughs> Hello. 
Um, yes, and uh, we've been going now for five years. This year we'll actually be in Nashville. Uh, actually, Rick, you're, you're the national director of Startup Bus. My goodness. <laughs> How's that for banter? Um, so yeah, uh, Startup Bus has provided a lot of great support for this organization, uh, for the Space Apps NYC over the years. Uh, New York Tech Council has been a fantastic partner as well. Um, what else can I say? How are we doing? You're all good? Yeah, good. All right, yeah. we're good to go. Uh, Coolio. And thanks for the plug, Mike. Uh, one last Startup Bus thing before I go. Uh, this year, Startup Bus is invite only, so you have to get a member of the community to vouch for you to be able to ride. Uh, but we thought that everyone at Space Apps is obviously awesome, um, so you automatically get an invite to ride Startup Bus if you come find me. So uh, come find me. That's the end of my Startup Bus plug. Twilio, uh, I am Ricky Robinette from Twilio. Twilio makes it easy for developers to write code that sends and receives text messages and makes and receives phone calls. Uh, I'm just gonna show you how it works real quick. Uh, this is an audience participation uh, part of the show. So if you can all get out your cell phone and turn the ringer all the way up. I know this is not something you normally hear in a presentation. Uh, and, and please, at the end of this presentation, turn them all the way down. Uh, but for now, turn them all the way up. Once you've done that, send a text message with any content you want to 718-215-0843. That is 718-215-0843. Anything you want to 718-215-0843. Uh, and the code that is going to handle the response you get is this code right here. It is just a handful of lines. I am just giving you my contact info, and I am sending you the, uh, the NASA pick of the day uh, because that's pretty awesome. Uh, but not only can you respond to inbound messages in Twilio, uh, you can also do things outbound without people uh, triggering it. So what I'm gonna do now is call everyone in the room that texted in, uh, and I'm gonna play the Brooklyn Nets chant because if you can't tell, I live in Brooklyn. Oh, oh what's up, Brooklyn? Uh, so we should start hearing phones ring right now. Feel free to put them on speaker. Uh, this is what Twilio does. If you wanna see how I built this, there is an API demo going on uh, right after all this wraps up downstairs. Uh, we're gonna live code this entire app together in 10 minutes, so thanks a lot. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Okay, thank you, Ricky. Okay, uh, next supernova sponsor, Intel Mashery. Hey, hello, Space Apps. Uh, my name is Y Lun. And All right, we're back. Hi, so my name is Y Lun. I work for Intel. Um, I'm a technical evangelist. So uh, what I do is I go to a lot of hackathons like this one and you know work with students and people in the industry to build awesome projects that solves world problems. Um, what we've brought here this weekend is the Intel Edison. It's a little hardware platform that you guys can use to uh, build your projects with. Um, we also have a ton of sensors for temperature, light, we have servos, we have LCDs. So any sort of um, projects that you have in mind, uh, come to us and we'll help you build it. Um, so what can you do with the Intel Edison, right? You can build wearables, wearable technology, so space glove. Uh, robotics. Um, so this has a lot of PWM outputs, so you can control a set of motors, like this little rover here that uh, a project team has built. You can build chickens. Actually, that's a chicken farm. Um, so it monitors their temperature and optimizes um, the environment for chickens. And you can also make cheese with the Intel Edison. So like food is a, a problem, like feeding people is a good problem to solve. So think about that, and that might be a project you can build this weekend. There's also a uh, Best Use of Intel Technology Award. So um, if you build something awesome with our platform, then uh, you could win something. You can come talk to me about it. And thanks, so uh, if you want the hardware platform, um, come talk to me uh, during the workshop and I'll be giving those out during lunch.
Thank you. Next up, Supernova sponsored Double Dutch, Casper Jepson. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here from uh, Double Dutch. Um, we're a small startup out in California. We do event apps, and we did the app for this one. So I would love for everyone to uh, really get into the activity feed this weekend, post everything you're doing, post questions for other people. It's a great way to get in contact with the other people who are doing the hackathon. Um, like I said, we're a startup, so we basically do a full year hackathon. Every single day is a burnout hackathon. I try to not burn ourselves fully out, but it's about that, getting passionate about technology, and that's one of the reasons we're really excited to be here and really excited to meet all of you. And also, we have 12 also hiring, so anyone who wanna do Android or iOS apps or for web stack, come talk to us. Thanks. Next up, Supernova sponsor SparkPost with Benjamin Dean. Hi, I'm Benjamin Dean. I'm the principal developer advocate with Message Systems. Uh, actually, SparkPost is our product. So 15 years of experience, sending over 12 billion emails a day. That's what Message Systems has done for Twitter, LinkedIn, Groupon, all the rest of the big companies out there. Uh, next week, we're going to be launching GA version of SparkPost. So it's been in private beta. We're going to get it to all you guys. What it does is make, make it so easy to send email at any scale, either transactional or bulk, transactional or bulk email. Uh, and we want to be able to let you guys put that kind of power in your app because ultimately email is king. Uh, you, can't get, you can't get a Twitter handle without it. You can't get a Facebook account without an email. Twitter is, or, or email is still the way to go for any kind of communication forward. Uh, we've got a lot of use cases. If you guys want to take a peek at it, Adrian Howard's going to be. So, and we also hire a bunch of physicists. Uh, we now have a whole bunch of PhD uh, astrophysicists working at abat.com on media problems. Um, surprisingly, not as bizarre as you would expect. Um, but just to say, you know, meet people here, have a good time. We also know that a lot of people here are looking for particular skill sets. These are sort of good ways to get to know other people and just try new things, right? Try new skills you wouldn't normally try in your job. Try to learn new things and you'll find people who will teach you, help you, um, show you how to do things you've never seen before, uh, and then they might help you find an entirely new job in the city. This is a very special group of people, the kind of people who come out on the weekend to give up a weekend to hack on projects for NASA with no monetary prize at the end of the day. It's a very interesting group of people, so it is absolutely worth sitting down, looking around you, talking to the people around you, and getting to know them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, okay, so we only have a few more um, quick remarks that we're gonna do. Um, s Alice is just coming up to the stage behind me now. Um, one thing I do wanna say real quick is, uh, again, I'm gonna reiterate, our intergalactic sponsor, Microsoft, has some amazing stuff uh, here to check on the floor. After we wrap this up, we're gonna give you guys some free time just to kinda wander around the floor and check stuff out. So check out their photo booth, check out their um, space room display, Check out their device lab if there's something you might maybe get inspired to use one of their uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, and also they wanted us to mention that um, they are awarding best Microsoft hack. Um, if you recall, we sent out that notification in the API guide. Actually, all of our sponsors are listed on there. Um, so uh, they just wanted to let you all know that there will be something uh, added on to those that win the, uh, the best Microsoft hack. You know, we don't like to say prizes here because we're not about competition, you know, here at the app or, or here at the Space Apps Foundry. Um, you know, we're here to, to, to do social good and, and solve problems for, to improve life on Earth and in space. But there is something cool that you will get. 
Okay. Uh, so. So there are two things that you should know for this weekend. Um, one of them is that you should have received a pink wristband or a DOI cash badge. Um, you'll need to keep that on you for the entire weekend. It gives you access to both the hacking floor and the public floor. Um, it also gives you access to the overnight space, uh, which we will share with you a little bit later. Um, lunch will be served around 12.30. Um, so make sure you have your wristband. Probably closer to 1 p.m. right now. So, uh, so API demos are going to happen starting around noon. So you basically have them from now until 11.45. Um, you know, you get the exhibits all to yourself before we open up to the public. So check stuff out now. Um, you're uh, Like Alice said, you're able to move freely bef between the two floors, but we really, you know, you're here to, to do the hackathon. We're here to work with NASA. Um, so we, just, we just ask you to spend the majority of your time, you know, working on a hack, working on a challenge. But if there's a talk that you really, really want to see, it's okay to come up here to, to, to see it. Um, we don't want people using the live stream, so like, please don't use the live, like, don't view the live stream to use your bandwidth uh, here. If you're if you're here, <laughs> so you know, just come come on upstairs and check it out. Um, but you know, check your mobile app, check the schedule. If you see if you see a talk that you really want to see, you can mark it on there in Double Dutch. Um, and Mike and I will be here for the entire festival. If you need help, come find us. You should Red also shirt. know June Brooks. She's our amazing operations director. If you have any questions, please talk to her about the hackathon. Gene, Gene we love you. <laughs> Gene has done a, a fantastic amount of work for us, and we, we really appreciate it. Um, and also, I'm going to give a shout out to our live stream team. Uh, Sean Pertzvilla, <laughs> Nikki Brovold, Jolie McPhee. Jolie McPhee with the Internet Society of New York. Fantastic job. These guys did, they did a great job at the boot camp yesterday. If you guys didn't see that, check it out afterwards. Uh, amazing inspirational speakers all across the board all day yesterday for, for from Civic Hall. Um, okay, so so lunch lunch will be around one ish. Use that time uh, when when you're at lunch, like gra grabbing food and stuff. If you haven't met anyone yet, um, what we'll do is in the open hack area downstairs, we'll designate each of the corners as like a mingle corner. So if, if you don't have a challenge, if you don't have a team, um, we'll we'll just say go to the robotics corner and meet people that want to are interested in robotics. You know talk about what challenges you know you might want to to partake in uh, so we'll do that for you know one of the each of the corners of the room um, and you know just feel free everyone here is really great um, everyone's gonna be really friendly just introduce yourself say hi and like oh yeah I think robots are awesome and if you're feeling extra shy come find one of us and we'll find you a seat and we'll give you a hug and we'll give you a hug back <laughs> I think that's it thank you for coming and uh, we're excited to be to have you all here and let's get started we'll be uh, We'll be switching back for the folks watching at home on the live stream. We will be back on uh, about 12.15 uh, for the public festival portion uh, beginning. Thanks very much.